All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is September 21st, 2022, and the time is 9.31 a.m. Today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. There are a couple of different ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. And the phone number is 669-900-6833. The collaboration code is 814-8152-8029. And again, this information is posted on the planning department a public hearing uh, page. So during key points in today's meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link or of calling in by telephone by, re by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. And if at any time you have difficulty connecting to today's meeting via the, the link or by calling in, I will be checking my email periodically, which is Jocelyn, J-O-C-E-L-Y-N dot Drake at santacruzcounty.us. And I will pause the meeting to make sure we um, connect you if you email me. All right, it appears we're situated. I will now turn the meeting over to the Planning Commission Chair Tim Gordon. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Ms. Drake. Thank you so much for the intro. And uh, thanks for everyone for meeting us on this, at this kind of special time that uh, we didn't have um, as our typical uh, planning commission days. So we appreciate everyone being here. Um, let's go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. And Ms. Drake, can we please have a roll call? Sure. Uh, Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. Commissioner Shepard? Here. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. And Chair Gordon? Here. Thank you. Um, do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda today? Uh, no, not today. Okay. Um, moving on to item three, declaration of ex parte communications. Are there any commissioners that have anything to declare today? Okay, hearing none, we can move on from item three and on to agenda item number four, oral communications. This is the time of the hearing where members of the public have the opportunity to speak on things that are not on the agenda today. Um, Ms. Drake, can you please see if we have anyone that would like to speak at this time? Um, yes, and two minutes will be provided for any speakers who wish to provide comment on anything not on the agenda today, which is the sustainability update. Um, and again, to raise your hand, if you're calling in, it is star nine. And I see one hand raised by Deborah Still. Good morning, Deborah. Please restate your name for the record. You have two minutes. Start. Good morning. Hi. Hello, would you please state your name for the record? Yeah, Jerry Still. Okay. I'm Good on morning. my wife's login. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm I'm Jerry Still and I'm with I'm here as a representative of Safe Pleasure Point. Um Patty Brady isn't able to be here today. She is a great voice of our group. I may not match her eloquence, but I will strive for a brief, clear message. 
Mr. Still, if I could interrupt for one quick second, sure. a little bit of time back if, I'm, if I uh, made a mistake here. I just want to make sure that this is not about the sustainability plan. And if the remarks are about the sustainability plan, we will have that time in just a moment. Um, oh, I see. Okay. I'll yes. wait. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll get right back to you. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks. All right. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to... Uh, provide comment on any other topic other than the sustainability update? If so, please raise your hand now. I'm seeing a hand raised by caller 2915. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. And you need to unmute yourself. There you go. So there we are. Um, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Becky. Thank you. Good morning. And um, I'm I'm very grateful for these two meetings that are coming along um, today and next Wednesday. I wanted to bring to your commission's attention the action yesterday at the County Board of Supervisors meeting regarding the tiny homes ordinance. Um, I, I think it may be coming back to you, but um, they, they discussed your, their very thoughtful recommendations and I wanna thank you for that. Um, the, there are a number of changes, quite significant changes that were proposed. So I urge you to, to look into that if you've not already done so. And um, also the local coastal plan action with the Coastal Commission, uh, the amendments were, were discussed. And unfortunately that is at the 11th hour and will likely be denied. But I do believe that the board voted to send it, the amendments to the um, Coastal Commission anyway, even though the commission has said they will deny them. Um, I want to thank you for your public service. I really do. And um, I, I, wish, I appreciate that your thoughtful, thorough work and for giving the public this extra time to review this very significant document before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. All right. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? At this time, if so, please raise your hand by pressing star nine or raising your hand on the Zoom icon. And I am not seeing any chairs, so I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Then we can close the uh, public comment and oral communications uh, part of this hearing and move on. Um, the next item, is the consent agenda and we have AB 361 resolution again today. Um, would any commissioners like any discussion or, or a motion on this item? Um, I'll move approval. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. I'll second it, but since we second it for discussion, I don't believe we need to adopt this since it's, I believe we only have to do it every 30 days. So just for consideration for the next meeting, um, this break. Well, I think that we did it last time. Correct. You did. I can't remember. Yeah. So I'm just saying right. we, don't, we don't need it on every agenda. No. Uh, I, I obviously I second it, but it's for next meeting because we have one night next week. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Who um, made the motion on that one? Commissioner Dan. Thank you. Okay. So since we have it and we have a motion to second, let's go ahead and vote and it'll save us another 30 days. <laughs> Um, All right. Or Ms. can we please have a roll call vote? Uh, Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Gordon? Or I mean, Chair Gordon? Yes. Um, Commissioner Violante? Yes. Is that not loud and now? Commissioner? Yes. <laughs> and Commissioner Dan? Yes. All right. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you. With that, the consent agenda item passes, and we can move on to the uh, item number six, approval of minutes. And do we 
I believe that our minutes do say this is the approval of minutes from the August 24th Planning Commission, or our agenda, excuse me, but I just want to clarify that we are actually approving the agenda from the September 14th. I think you might, um, Chair, I think you might be one? looking at the September 14th agenda. Um, okay. If. But I can double check that afterwards and just clarify and make sure that it's for September 14th. Okay, great. Well, just to be clear, we are approving or looking at the, um, the minutes from September 14th hearing and um, would any commissioners like any motion or discussion on the item? Um, yeah, I just looked them up and it does say September 14th. I'm sorry, the delay. Um, so yeah, um, I did check them and read through them thoroughly. And so I will move approval. And I will second that, Lisa and me. Okay, thank you. I have a, a motion and a second. And any discussion prior to um, a vote? Okay, Ms. Street, can we please have a roll call vote? Okay. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dan? Yeah. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, that passes and we can move on. I just want to be clear that what I was looking at is today's agenda. That's, and maybe I have a not an updated agenda, but it does say August 24th on the agenda that I have. Mm -hmm. Right, so Jocelyn, uh, Jocelyn um, sent us all the minutes. I think that was Monday. I can't remember what day. Um, yesterday. In an attachment yesterday. And if you bring that up, um, it has a right. date and, and yeah. an action. Understood, yeah. Yeah, I'm on the online agenda, and it, it does say September 14th as well. So I... Hmm. Maybe I'm looking at something different. Okay, well. It says on mine too, but I was just going to double check that I printed <laughs> out what was correct online. I'm, I'm on the one that um, I was sent, but I haven't gone through the planning department agenda to get to there. So any case, we're all good, it sounds like. So no uh, worries. We got a lot of emails, so. But, yeah. And, 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 and it's keep them straight. And it's noticed um, properly, so that's important as well. So it is there. Correct. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay, so. On to the uh, item number seven, continue public hearing to consider the ordinances and resolutions to the sustainability policy. A um, few things I want to chat through here before we really dive in. Uh, just a little housekeeping thing. So uh, I think we're going to stick with our same break schedule that we had last week, um, if necessary. You know, I'm not sure exactly how long it'll go today, but we had breaks at 11, uh, lunch, 12, 30 minute lunch around 12.30, and then another break around 2.30. Um, so if you get into those that long of a day, we'll, we'll try to break at those times. Um, we are going to have uh, the process today. We'll, there will not be a presentation. Um, however, we'll, we can have another introduction with Ms. Hansen if, if that's possible. And then also uh, we will open for public comment um after that introduction and once we get to the public comment i want to talk a little bit about um how that'll go but, but i'd like to open up to you miss hansen to start uh thank you chair good morning uh commissioners stephanie hansen assistant director uh for the new cdi department maybe not so new now uh, -huh. uh but uh thank you for um having us back where we are um uh, as the chair said, we are not doing a um, staff presentation. We would refer people back to the August 24th meeting when the staff presentation was given, and um, as well as the packet material that is um, linked on the website um, for actually the last three meetings have those materials. There were some additional um, uh, correction pages that have been given to the planning commission. Um, <clears throat> there's also an overall um, motion that was crafted in the um, uh, August 24th um, meeting agenda. So <clears throat> I think um, 
after we hear additional amending motions um, from the commissioners, we'll probably circle back for an overall motion on anything that wasn't amended um, and uh, the recommendations to the Board of Supervisors um, to certify the CEQA document and um, uh, and the other uh, things that are included in that motion. So I just want to make sure that we do do that. Um, we appreciate all the hard work that the commissioners have been doing to review uh, these documents. We recognize it's a massive project for all of us. Um, and uh, the team is here to help uh, answer any questions that the commissioner may, commissioners may have, although I think we're uh, uh, moving on to the, to the motions, um, but we're uh, here to help. So um, thank you, Chair, and I will pass it back over to you if you um, want to open com public comment first or the commission discuss how you want to handle. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I think it would it be appropriate to um, get through the public comment and allow people the opportunity to, to, you know, bring up any items maybe that came from the last hearing or any new items. I just do want to make a note to everyone that is listening from the public that if you've written a letter, we've received it and, you know, read through it. And that um, is all information that we've, you know, likely received. And so um, if there's other comments that you'd like to bring up or new items, I think that would be most appropriate if it's a kind of maybe repeat from the last few hearings. Um, you know, we're happy to listen and hear, um, but I would state that, you know, we, we've heard. Um, and so with that, let's do, let's open the public comment at this time, and then we'll come back to the commission um, to ask any further questions and discussion. So. Chair Gordon. May yeah. I add just one one thing to that um, very introduction, and that is just to say for the public's um, benefit that this is not the last stop on this train, and that these are recommendations that will then go on to the Board of Supervisors. So any member of the public who is here listening should just know that um, the Planning Commission is making recommendations to the final decision makers on this project, and, and that is the Board of Supervisors. And then at the conclusion of today's meeting, um, maybe staff could um, talk about that timeline for the public's benefit. Happy to do that. Thank you for that addition. Yes, great addition. Thank you. All right. So I will move over and see who we've got from the public. So this time we'll have three minutes. Um, on the clock for each speaker. And I see a hand raised by Michael Matera. Good morning, Michael. Will you please restate your name for the record? Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Matera. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Uh, yes, so I grew up on 26th Avenue, and when I was a kid, my dad worked as a lab technician at UCSC, where he could afford to put my mom through college, raise two boys, and pay the mortgage. Um, that is not a dream that is available to people in this area anymore. And the reason is housing. The median house price is well over a million dollars in this neighborhood where I still live. If we don't, so I really support uh, the rezoning of Portola and the, the construction of higher density housing here. Because if we don't lower the price, or if, if we don't build affordable housing in this neighborhood, the median house price will go up and up, and this will become a soulless enclave of millionaires and billionaires. Who is going to buy a secondhand wetsuit from the Carters if you have to be a millionaire to live here? No one. None of the businesses that we cherish will survive if this is just a playground for the fabulously wealthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. All right, back to the hands raised. And I'll just remind everybody if you're calling in um, to press star nine on your telephone if you would like to remotely raise your hand. Uh, and I see um, the caller 2915, hand raised, I believe that's Becky. Good morning again, please restate your name for the record.
Good morning, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning again. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you for having this additional meeting today. I, um, I've i read through the proposed changes from your last meeting and I think they are all ex excellent. Um, because I am a member of the Lions Club, I have become acquainted with a number of uh, low vision and blind people and they have helped literally open my eyes to the access problems uh, they encounter as they try to navigate independently throughout our county. One of the biggest issues is the uh, non-standard placement and type of crosswalk signalization and much of it is not um, audible. So if you're blind, you don't know. You press the button, you don't know what the crosswalk signal is displaying. The county is doing a, a good job of, of trying to upgrade a lot of those intersections. But I see that you have some good comments here on the uh, general plan access and mo mobility portion. And I would like to have some language in there that um, all crosswalks are standardized in terms of location and type of equipment and that all of them are audio activated and at an appropriate audio level. When it is near a busy street and the audio is way down low, the people cannot hear it who need it most. So I would like to ask for that. My second point is uh, regarding the singling out the pleasure point area only for the ultra high density. It makes no sense. It should be moved to uh, areas in the along the rail corridor, in my opinion, so that future rail tr public transportation would be accessible and supported by the dense development that will have to come to accommodate the arena numbers, but um, would better serve the public. Pleasure Point has no, is not on a major corridor. And in fact, the four lanes that Portola Drive was is now reduced. And I feel that increasing density in those that area will not serve the public and will destroy the nature of that neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Okay. Going back to the list of callers and attendees. Uh, again, if you'd like to speak on the sustainability update, please raise your hand by pressing star nine or selecting the hand icon on the Zoom app. I see Mr. Still is with us. However, the hand is not raised. I'm wondering. There we go. <laughs> Good morning again, Mr. Still. Will you please restate your name for the record? Uh, Jerry Still. Jerry. Good morning. Hi. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm with uh, this. Say pleasure point group, and uh, and I agree with uh, Becky, the last caller. Um, the nine parcels proposed for rezoning along Portola, they're located between 32nd and 36th, which is only four blocks. And with a, the flex zoning, it could grow from 45 units per acre to 81 units which could be 373 units on 4.61 acres. And it's, yeah, it's only four blocks. So this is, this is not sustainable. Uh, please reconsider the zoning for Portola Drive and save the high density flex zoning for multimodal and active corridor streets, not Main Street. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. All right. 
Okay, last call for public comment on the sustainability update for this meeting. Um, all right, I see a hand raised by David Faulkner. Good morning, David. You have three minutes. Will you please restate your name for the record? Yeah, my name is David Faulkner. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just chimed in and uh, I'm not sure what's happened so far in the meeting, but I just wanted to address the smaller community community areas. Um, I live in the neighborhood of Zianti in Lompico, and <clears throat> historically we've had a downtown area, which includes the Zianti market, but the general plan <clears throat> has uh, the area zoned as residential. So it's currently it's operating on a use permit from the 1970s, and it's been a community center and a corner store since the 1940s. I was hoping the general plan could recognize this area as a commercial zone and change the zoning to commercial and uh, also um, designated as a RSL, Rural Service Line, um, for two properties, one that includes the Zianti Market and one that is across the street that used to house the uh, Club Zianti which was also a commercial operation since 1929 up until 1983. Um, I think the general plan kind of <clears throat> ruined the area by forcing everybody to drive five to six miles down to a uh, downtown Safeway. And uh, I've been really struggling, I'm the property owner, and I've been really struggling with um, expanding the market with extra seating and more retail space because the general plan doesn't want to store in the on the parcel so i'm hoping that this general plan could recognize this area as a viable commercial um, area that serves um, very highly densely populated uh, zianti and lopico so i have a minute left but i'm going to sign off here great thank you david thank you All right, are there any additional members of the public who wish to speak on this item, the sustainability update? And Chair, I am not seeing any, so I will turn it back up. Ah, hand just went up. <laughs> uh, participant by the name of Oliver, Good morning. Please state your full name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Oliver Carter. I am the owner of Blown Out uh, Wetsuit Repair and Surf Shack on Portola. Um, I just wanted to chime in. Um, I appreciate what the uh, what the committee's doing. Um, you know, I all in all, I'm, I'm for housing in Santa Cruz. It's a it's a it's a very impacted area, and I understand that a lot of people who grew up here, um, including my wife, I've been here 30 years, um, you know, we're always seeking housing. Um, but to be honest with you, um, the rezoning of, of my parcel is what I have to focus on, and I just want the commission to think about that. I know ultimately it's up to the, uh, to the property owner, um, but the rezoning of this parcel, you know, will greatly impact my business and, and um, in concerns to Mr. Matera's uh, comment, um, being able to buy a, you know, a, a secondhand wetsuit from us might not be an option for anybody um, if, if this location uh, disappears after 27 years of being um, a business that, that gives back to the community and gave back to the community. Um, I hope that the committee takes that into account when making the recommendations. Uh, we, we've been in contact with, with Manu and uh, a number of people on his his staff concerning this. Uh, I just want to uh, let it be known that um, you know we're 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 fighting for our survival. We feel to an extent. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. All right. Are there any other members of the public who wish to provide comment at this time? So please raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or the hand icon on the Zoom link. Okay, I'm 
seeing no further hands raised, Chair, so I will turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. And thank you to all the callers that spoke up. We really appreciate it. And you know, for everyone that's chimed in along the way and given us your feedback, um, we can't thank you enough for being here. At this time, we can close the public comment portion and bring it back to the commission. And I just wanted to start off with talking about a little bit of recap where we ended last time and where we're headed this time. Um, so we've you know, kind of officially got through questions and discussion and have been on to motions. Um, last time, correct me if I'm missing something, but we had motions on the built environment under the general plan section, under the built environment, access and mobility, agriculture, natural resource and conservation, parks and rec, and public facilities. And I think that that's all we went through last time. So I just wanted to start off by. Well, first off, I'd want to see if anyone had any additional questions before we went into motions, just to make sure, you know, that if anything came up from the last week that commissioners had time. And then I was just going to go through the sections one at a time um, to just verify that we didn't miss any sections that maybe people had a motion on that we that we maybe skipped over, just to be really clear there. So I'll just go through them one at a time, and then we can say yes, no to comments or motions, and then move on. Um, Excuse me, what, what, I'm sorry, I'm unclear what you're proposing to do right now, because my understanding was we concluded our action on the general plan. So from my perspective, the, that action uh, is in the minutes. We just adopted the minutes, and that's now been moved on to the Board of Supervisors. We'll move on to staff to um, do what they need to do to incorporate those and then to write their comments and their staff report. and. That's headed to the Board of Supervisors for final determination. And so my understanding of what's in front of us now is the remainder of the package, which is the zoning code. Uh, that, that is correct. To some extent, we didn't, I don't remember if we went over the intro or made a motion on the intro to the general plan. And then we do need to, you know, I just wanted to make sure that if we went through all of the sections just in order to make sure, not anything we've already discussed, but the ones we haven't discussed to make sure if anyone had comments so we didn't miss them. So Which that would be the general plan ones, of businesses. Can you, thank you. Just for my, so for my clarity, can you identify which sections you feel we did not go over? Yes. The, the items that we need to cover today are the general plan introduction. I believe we didn't make a motion on that, so that will need to be included today. The general plan appendices are part of the packet. The design guidelines and then code sections five, essentially all the code sections. Then we have map amendments. Right. And then finally, if there's any thing anybody missed or stuff like that. So that's so kind let of me, okay. That's fine. If you want to discuss yeah. the general plan or introduction, that, that's fine. My understanding was we covered that last time, but that's fine. Um, so yes, the zoning code and the appendices we do need to cover. And that's what I had said. My understanding was where we are today. Yeah, I just we're saying the my same. intention I'm just trying is to... not to reopen anything that we've already adopted and is in the minutes. And so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, I'm not I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we need to go in order of all the things we haven't discussed. Uh commission uh sorry, yeah. Chair Gordon. Yes. I need to ask a question of Stephanie at this point. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Let's. If not, it's, not a substan it's not a substantive question. It's okay, about the your pro organization you're proposing. Um, Stephanie, what part of the code are the issues that I discussed with you in? Because I'm now on a fairly <clears throat> old laptop without much ability to search anything. Could, so when Tim announces those, I can speak up. Yes, sure. Um, uh, Commissioner Shepard, you're. Uh, interest has been in code sections, and we haven't started that work yet. So I, I believe what Chair Gordon is asking for is um, anything else on the uh, general plan in the introduction. Um, and we do need a motion on the introduction, the glossary, and the appendices to also forward those along um, to when, when the get, board. When we but get the, to the code sections, would you help me? 
by identifying the code sessions that I have talked to you about, because I don't have much access to anything. Certainly. Okay. Okay, that sounds great. And just trust me on this. Let me get started and it'll come together. Okay, so. Chair Gordon, first, you had said if we had questions, I, I do have some outstanding questions that never got answered by staff. If now would be the appropriate time to ask them, I would like to follow up. Yes, let's do that. So there were two questions that I asked last time that staff said they were going to get back to me on, and I was just hoping that perhaps they had a chance to look into it, um, since they and they are, they do have to do with the section the code section that we're going to discuss today. So that'd be just helpful to know for our, our making since we are going to discuss that. So there's just two. I promise that you said you guys are going to get back to me on. Um, uh, so if now would be the appropriate time. Um, one was in the. Um, the residential use chart. No, sorry, it was in the commercial use chart. It had to do with the the greenhouses. No, the, it was it's the residential use chart having to do with the greenhouses. It had a reference to a section, and Daisy was going to get back to me, I think, on whether or not that code section. Although it's greenhouses, it's not Annie. We discovered um, because Daisy said that it was going to be her that got back to me um, on whether or not that section was the appropriate reference. Um, I don't know if someone had a chance to look into that or not. We did. I think Annie is here to help us with that question. Perfect. That'd yes. be great. Yes, thank you. I did I did look at that. And the reference should be, it currently reads 1310-323B. Correct. And it should be 1310-323C, which references the site and structural dimensions chart, which is essentially the you know, setbacks, height limits, lot coverage, all the all the development standards that apply to residential zone districts. Well, can you explain to me how that determines the ability to have a greenhouse? Because if I recall, 1310323 had to do with like a lot size, it had to do with determining lot size, like so the ability to create a lot. And I'm going to have to go back and look. I apologize. It's been a week since we talked about it, and it's been even longer since I read it. But can you, since I'm happy to go look at 323C while you start your explanation, but it would be helpful for me if you could explain how that makes sense, just because I want to. I want to understand when we're allowing these greenhouses of a thousand feet or more on a parcel, because um, that's a big greenhouse on a residential parcel. I'm trying to understand when we would be allowing that. Um, yes. So the the 1310.32b section that was incorrectly referenced does talk about determining lot size, but 1310.32c is the residential use charts section. So that provides the um, development standards for both. There's a chart for single family um, zoning as well for multifamily zoning. So it provides um, setbacks and lot coverage. So for example, the greenhouses would need to comply with, with setback limits for residential properties and height limits. So, so in other words, they would be subject to all of the um, site standards that apply to the district. If I recall the reference to this though, wasn't it didn't say that they were subject to that. It said if, and I, I apologize, I have to get to the section of the thing. So you're saying that if they had their subject to those setbacks, that's what that reference is, is saying there. Um, yes, let me um, pull that up and I can read. Um, I know I have to get there too. I apologize. I just okay, no, that's that's fine. Uh, let's see, agriculture, animal, agriculture. Okay, um, so greenhouse, um, a thousand, there's two lines. One greenhouse is a thousand square feet, and then the second line is greenhouse is larger than a thousand mm -hmm. square feet. Um, and then it says subject to development standards in 1310.323b, and it should be changed to subject to development standards in 1310.323c, which which there's you know that section includes the two uses, the two development site standards charts, one for the single family zoning and one for multifamily zoning. Okay, and so that's what they're, in general, sorry, I just got that myself. So it, that's what it's saying that um, it's these, it's these setbacks that are now, okay. That's helpful. Right. It, it, okay. Um, so thank you, I, I appreciate that. I, I I just think it's important when we're talking about putting these really large structures on, on residential parcels that I yes. understand what, what we're doing. Okay, so so obviously that, that would, uh, and I don't, I don't know that we're gonna need a direction, but that would need to be changed. Okay, and then my other question, Thank you, Annie. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, my other question had to do with the uh, 
um, it's in 13.10.343-1. It was the industrial site and structural dimension chart. It had to do with the height of structures. Um, we it, it, when, it, when we looked over it, it didn't look like there was any height limit when not on R or A districts. Is this is for ringing bells for people. Yes, this rings a, a bell. We did have a look at that um, in, in the past couple of days. Um, we think we think there's an error. There are just some leftover text. Um, and so in the M2 zone for the maximum building height, it should read the same as the M1 and M3. So just three stories with 40 feet and then delete if within 200 feet of an R or a district. So they're all the same. Um, that way the 40 feet applies across the board. Um, and we will, we're intending to make this correction as it goes to, to the uh, board. So we've, we've caught that. Thank you very much for that. Okay, perfect. I just, like I said, I think it's important when we're talking about um, uh, <laughs> these types of things. So I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the follow-up. I, I, I think, and thank you, Commission, for indulging me on these two issues. Of course, thank you, Commissioner Violante. And and um, any other questions from commissioners at this time to before we move on to each section? No, I just want to thank staff for answering my questions that I had um, during the week and the work that you put into providing some really helpful responses. Thank you. Well, I had one. Um, yeah, Commissioner Shepard. Uh, one of the questions I asked, and I did hear from back from Stephanie in a very timely fashion, but I wanted to make sure the other board members know. I asked how much it costs, how much she estimates it costs to appeal a zoning administrator appeal approval or denial to the planning commission. And it's basically, and Stephanie, correct me if I don't get this right, because I don't have it in front of me. It's basically timed on at an hourly rate, which is uh, $199 an hour she and her email estimated a ballpark figure of 10 hours minimum. So that's costing someone who wants to appeal a ZA decision at least $2,000. So we all know what we're talking about here. And up from there, in other words, at least 10 hours, and it could easily be 15 or 20. So it's really significantly expensive to do so. Thank you. I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Thank you. That's helpful. Commissioner Lazenby, did you have anything? I just wanted to make sure that um, you had the opportunity. Thank you, Chair. Not at this time. Okay. Thanks. And Commissioner Dan, good? Okay. And I am also good to go. No further questions. Um, Great. So then we can just march through the list of items that we didn't talk about so that I know and we're all on the same page as to um, what would be kind of like a batch motion at the end. So I'm just going to go through all those sections really quickly. Uh, general plan introduction. Did anyone have any um, changes or plans for changes to a motion on that? No, but since we're talking about it, I will just say that I really appreciate the introduction and I think it gives a great overview of the county. So um, good job. All right. Okay, then the next one is we that would then cover all the general plan. Then we have general plan appendices. There's a number of them. Um, were there any adjustments that commissioners were going to want to see on the appendices? Yes, Chair. I, th I think that there are two different spots where I, I'd like to have a discussion about the appendices, okay. um, both in Appendix J and then Appendix I. I don't know if you want to take them as one motion. They're, um, one is just kind of a general comment, actually, that I, I want. I think it's that we can discuss now or later. Um, uh, but I think Appendix I is the it's the TDM plans, and I it, I think it's worth discussing that one first, actually. Um, but I don't know if other commissioners have things, and we could take them together. If we want to take them one at a time. If um, yeah, go ahead. I was just I make a suggestion because uh, Commissioner Violante and I worked on this together, and we I think 
I think it'd be helpful to discuss them and have questions now, but the way we batched um, the suggested modification for that one in particular is is in a is in a motion with some other items. So it would make it easier for us if we could then just discuss that. Um, well, I mean, we'll propose those changes in a motion. So um, I would prefer not to take them separately right now, but we have them embedded in another document um, where we can see those reflected. But if you want to have a discussion about it now, that that doesn't mess up my plan. Yeah, <laughs> my, my, uh, my process, I should say. Yeah. Just to make sure this is all super you know, clear and we've gone through this uh, and haven't missed anything. I do want to make sure that um, if this is anticipated to be in a motion separately, that we're really clear about that. And then I, I think it would be helpful to have discussion on this item um, if it's in a separate motion so we can just march down the list. Uh, that'll That's help my brain keep organized. So, yeah, no, I totally understand. Everybody's brain is organized in a different way. And so yeah. I, I totally get that. Um, and then I'll just add that, you know, anything that is a, like a remainder dangling out there at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, Stephanie brought up a, a, and a really important one that we have to uh, make a determination on the CEQA document, that that could be also in a separate motion. So I'm going to rely on staff to um, kind of make sure that we're not leaving anything we're not leaving anything out and that at the end of you know whatever commissioner violante and i propose that if we've missed some things that you would let us know so that we can make the appropriate motions to um, follow the letter of the law and carry out our duty thank you we're happy to help with that great uh commissioner violante do you want to jump in on those yeah, so in particular in Appendix I with the TDM plans, I, I think it was, this isn't new to the commission that I have concerns and, and, and Commissioner Dan and I discussed them, so I suppose I think I should use the we, but um, that about using the reduction of parking spaces as a TDM uh, strategy and um, to be one of the things I would like to discuss is, although being comfortable with the unbundling of parking spaces as a strategy um, that we only do it in for larger developments than is currently um, being proposed. So not not for 10, but for, for possibly 25 or more and when they are offering um, bus passes. So those, those are the kinds of things I would like to see considered by the commission as alternatives to what's currently being proposed. Um, and so those are the types of things that we would, I would like to discuss as we move forward. And when we get to the point where you see exactly what it is that's being proposed, I think that, you know, we can kind of get into more detail about what it is and why we came up with the proposal that we did. You're muted, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Um, which section do you plan on discussing that with? Because that might. So, that's yeah, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> yeah. So, so we have a, a section on the zoning code that has a number of items in it. And then we, as going through the documents, we realized there are all these other kind of like random issues. And so we made a general document. And the general document has the items that Commissioner Violante just articulated. And then it also has some, you know, maybe a handful of modifications to chapter 1810, um, which is the procedures. Um, so what I was thinking maybe we could do um, once we're, you know, done with the general plan and then any questions or discussion that you want to have um, on in general, then we can put up what our proposed modifications are to the zoning code go through those in detail um, and then take action on that. And then we can put up the general directions that cover the appendices and chapter 1810. Okay, so- And then after yeah. that, whatever anybody else, you know, wants to do, obviously we should consider that as well. 
Right. Okay. So let's do that. Let's. So we'll push the. Unless other commissioners had specific discussions on the appendices, we'll push it to Title 18 and or kind of general all over things that are kind of hard to qualify and to put a certain section. It was like the like document we created for like, I don't know where this should go. Yeah, <laughs> it's also intertwined. I feel like, you know, some of them are hard to even pin into a single category. It might be multiple, so. Um, exactly. Okay, well, that sounds great. Um, did uh, Commissioner Lazen, B or Shepard have any other comments on that? Are we okay moving with that direction? Yes, I'm I'm okay with that. It, that makes more sense, I think. Great. Okay, so then just marching down the list, we had design guidelines as kind of the next thing. And um, were there any adjustments that commissioners had planned on, on making for this section? Sounds like no. Okay, great. So that will include in kind of the batch at the end. And then um, next section is Title V, uh, onto the county code portion. Title V is the first one. Any adjustments or discussion there? Okay, um, why don't you na name the code sections as you go through? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I can do that. Uh, oh, excuse me. I misspoke there. It's title 5 through 12 are kind of included. Um, and then just, again, following the layout that's on the website. And so there's title 5 through 12, which is trip reduction, building regulations, and solar access protection in those sections. Uh, I don't trust this laptop to go back and forth between the internet. So I'm using my printed out, believe it or not, copy of the code. So you have to give me a little time. I do see uh, mostly for those sections, just a bunch of cross outs were made, but I don't have anything specific. Okay. Um. Yeah, and then, you know, Commissioner Shepard, I, I think, you know, if there's stuff that we move past, obviously, and want to come back to it at the end, there's, we'll have this kind of like catch all motion. So I definitely want to make sure we're all on the same page with that. Um, Do you all have the, the codes up on your computers then while we're doing this? I do. I also have the printed code in front of me. I have both. I'm, I'm with Tim. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I have the code sections that mm -hmm. are relevant. <laughs> and I'm glad that I just wanted to make, it looks like commissioners are using the printed code. So thank you so much, staff, for doing that. That was that was a heavy lift. So, so this thank is... You. Really <laughs> we are going then to the tabs on the printed code that are Title Five and Title Twelve. Correct. Uh, and this chapter is uh, trip reduction 5.52, uh -huh. building regulations, which is 12.01, okay. and solar access protection, which is 12.28. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, Let's move, if there's not a lot, any discussion on those, we can move on and then Commissioner Shepard, if you find something or need to jump back, let's do that. We're not closing it out. I'm just trying to go in order. So I'll make a note that I might want to follow up with you on that one. No, I haven't got anything. Okay, you're good. Okay. That was five through 12. Good. Okay, on to the, the, probably the bulkiest one here, Title 13 and Chapter 1310. So, um, Commissioner Shepard, this is, you know, there's a lot of things that I, I mean, there's probably 20 sections in this, but um, it's generally, you know, zoning regulations, uh, ordinance and permit administration, uh, the districts and the uses. Um, so I, I 
Yeah. Commissioner Violanti and I do have some proposed changes and if it works to use the same process we did last time, which I realize is not ideal because we're not in person. But um, so if I could share my screen and then Commissioner Violanti could send the document to Ms. Drake and she could send it to commissioners so commissioners could also have it. Um, that's, that's what I'll do if that's agreeable to everyone. Does that work? Okay. That yes. Let's me. not change it now. We got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, here we go. Okay, can everybody see what I see? Yes. On my screen? Okay, thank you. And then I'll wait a second to make sure that that can get sent to everyone. So um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll make the motion to uh, for the staff recommended changes in chapter 1310 with the following additions. So that's a motion. Wait, wait what's the motion? The motion is to uh, adopt the staff recommended changes for chapter 1310 with the uh, with the added additions that are uh, presented in this document that's now being shared on my screen and that will be emailed to you right now. And then if I get a second, I will go through each section and explain the context and the intent um, like we did last week. I'll second that. Well, um, I probably, you know, I, I was, as you know, from earlier sessions, I wanted to change the language in a very specific section animal regulations. And could I do that then separately? Well, why don't we do this? So I, I actually, um, yeah, I understand you know, you probably are the most equipped to, uh, let me just start over. Um, we can do it a number of ways. Um, we can take that separately, or if you have some specific language additions, you can um, make a friendly amendment, and we can, you know, either accept that or not accept that. Um, so, however it works for you. I would be uh, glad to make a friendly amendment. Stephanie, where is the part about the Planning Commission responsibilities in this section? When we go through it, Renee, we'll get to the section that deals with animals later. No, I, there's when, animals when we, and then there's what goes to the planning commission that I want to address specifically. Right. We um, we have that in here okay. as well. And All right. um, but if you we you no. know when we get to that section, we can discuss. All right, just as long as I know what's going on. <laughs> Definitely. And I've now noted you have um, you want to make some changes to the, the animal keeping regs. And um, so we will make sure to, to discuss that and, and entertain any amendments you might and, want to and, make on this. And the other point was about um, mitigations being recommended or necessary. I, 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 well, let's just go through it. Go ahead. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, let me minimize my screen here. Okay. Um, so we are trying to go in order well, um, of 1310, but I apologize if things are a tiny bit out of order. We really tried to put all the code sections in, in order. Um, so the first recommended change is um, about intensification of use and for non-residential uses. And so the original language here um, had kind of a one, either one or the other. Or, I'm sorry, excuse me. It had a <laughs> that um, that it's you had to achieve a metric of both a 10% increase and uh, 110 daily vehicle trips. And we um, are saying um, that it could be one or the other that um, changes the <clears throat> definition of intensification of use. And so we reworded this um, section to reflect that. Would you scroll down so I can see the rest of this? Yes, this this the what I just okay. explained is is just here thirteen ten two six zero b one intensification right. of use. Why, why are you suggesting that, Commissioner? Well, 
and Commissioner Violante should feel free to weigh in as well. But so this was basically when you change a use. So basically what the code is doing, and this is a section where the code is actually going from what exists now and making a, a substantial change um, to make it easier for businesses to change their use without um, having to go through a cumbersome um, public hearing process. And I support that. Um, but I so but I think that we need to still be mindful that some uses do have a lot of impact. So say, for instance, if you're going from an office to a dance studio, um, you know, that could have a lot of uh, parking and traffic impacts and that those should have an opportunity to be mitigated. I don't know if Commissioner Violante wants to add anything else. Yeah, that's exactly right. So last time, Tim, we discussed this, um, that the standard through which if you have a, one of the things we did in the, the general plan is we said that if you have a use permit, it's a ministerial process in order to change the what it, the business in there, as long as they're consistent with the use, the zoning, and but as long as it's not an intensification of use. And so we think the standard under which you should have that lower <coughs> level of review just needs to be, um, we want to ensure that it, it's appropriate, like Rachel said, we want to make sure businesses can change hands, but we want, we think that the standard under which intensification of use, it needs to be appropriate so that um, if there is a intensification of use, uh, people are just notified. It changes when they're notified of a change of the business. So it's consistent with the action we took last time, essentially. And the, just to, you know, be transparent, the um, <coughs> significant change here is we crossed out both. Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. And then, so moving on, this is um, on page two of 1310.311B on agricultural districts. And the direction here is to retain the original language. I don't know if Commissioner Violansky wants to talk about this one. Yeah, so historically, there's been kind of this distinction between commercial agricultural properties and agricultural properties. And we felt that the striking of some of this language uh, got rid of the distinction between commercial agricultural properties that were um, commercial in nature and agricultural properties that are supposed to be primarily, they're supposed to have the agricultural not uh, in kind of the same scale. And so we just restored uh, some of the language here, um, that it's on small amounts um, and that it's, um, so that's, that's what we did, is kind of keep to maintain that distinction. We felt like some of the choices to strike were just um, we wanted to keep that distinction between A and C in parcel. Are there any questions on this one? Okay, I'll move on. And then this second one is also staying with ag districts. And this is regarding agritourism. And so the code is um, doing a lot of great things to promote agritourism, um, which definitely think is a good idea. Um, so this added language uh, has to do with events on a zone parcels that um, want to have events. And one of the things that um, I've learned on this commission is that events uh, in rural areas are highly controversial. And of all of the issues that have probably come before us, I'd say probably the most difficult and controversial have been having events in, in rural areas that um, are adjacent to residential districts. So this is really just to kind of like put up a guardrail here. Um, so for if you have an A district and you um, wanna have some events um, that if, but if you are in 200 feet of a neighboring residence or adjacent to an R zone with a residence, that then you'd have to go out and get a, a public a CUP, which would be a public hearing um, at the ZA. And that, and the distinction here is that is for events exceeding 12 per year. So if you're an A zone and you wanna have 12 events per year with no amplified music, no problem, you don't need a CUP. But with the change here that um, we're recommending is that if you wanna exceed 12 events per year, which is substantial, that you should you need to go out and get a public hearing or of any size 
that's using amplified music. And the amplified music is because in my experience, that's the kicker for the neighbors is that. Um, and so what I found is that public hearings can actually be really helpful in mitigating um, some of those impacts while still allowing um, the events um, in the rural areas. I would just like to add that in my experience, I totally agree with Rachel. In it's my experience, when you have a public hearing, I've seen I've seen things work out so that the event goes on with the neighborhood going for it once they know what's going on and make some suggestions. So it, it ends up making much better resolution. Yeah, thank you for that addition. That's I agree with that. Are there any questions on that one? Okay, moving on. So these are some, okay, so this is now moving on to residential districts. We're on 1310, 322, the residential use chart. And so this came up um, when we were talking about the general plan too, or maybe this was a question I had um, last week about bed and breakfast um, um, with 12 or fewer rooms, um, having an, an AUP which means public noticing, but no public hearing. And so we're suggesting to, to replace AUP with CUP to make it consistent with the requirements for vacation rentals. So it just didn't make sense to me that you could have a bed and breakfast with up to 24 guests with an AUP when you know if you're a vac you have a vacation rental application that has five bedrooms with that would be fewer guests than the B&B, you would have to get a public hearing. So um, I just am suggesting this change to make that consistent. And so, are there any questions on that one? Okay, um, speak up because I actually minimized my, my um, screen so I can't see anybody right now. So if you do have a question, I'm relying on people just to speak up. That's good, thank you. Okay. Commissioner, just to, um point of clarification for us so we make sure we have sure. it right you're talking across the board in all zones is that correct we're in the residential use in chart. the residential use chart we're currently in the residential use chart you can see that the, in, in the motion we're in the residential use chart right uh, yes yeah. well, oh, sorry. well Here, I can only see up. what's on there but um, <laughs> sorry, for please. all zoning districts that are included in that chart you're requesting the shift yeah. I would. I, I just want to say, I, I I agree for the same reason before. Usually, if there's people are interested, go to a hearing. They can often work things out very conveniently, and it saves a whole lot of neighborhood misery when it just happens. And I, th I think actually this saves time rather than doing it ministerially. I actually agree with that comment that Renee Shepard made. Um, and so, yeah, and you, you know, and, and like I said, I, I believe if like you have a, a five bedroom vacation rental on, doesn't matter the zone district that, you know, you would have to get a public hearing. Um, so, so it's, it is just to, out of fairness, really, <laughs> um, to the vacation rentals. Okay, so the next one is, um, uh, recreation events and community facilities of page nine of that code section. Uh, if uh, Commissioner Violante wants to address this one. So it's restoring language that was in the original code. Um, and it's, it, to us, it doesn't make sense that you would allow com like commercial, we're not really sure why this language was struck. We wouldn't want to allow commercial um, or public spaces that seems like a larger impact than we would want um, in residential zone facilities and we would in residential parcels, we wouldn't want them to be commercial use. So we restored language that was struck from the previous code, just re restoring the language of private and non-commercial. We're fine obviously with open spaces being used uh, on residential parcels, but we don't believe that they should be commercial in nature. So we're just restoring language that had been struck. Okay. And then moving on, on the next page covers wineries. Um, and we are, um, well, I'll let uh, Commissioner Violante speak to this one. That's what's up on our, that's what's our screen now, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. wineries. And so we'll get to wineries a lot more later in the code um, because this is just the use chart. There's later, obviously, big discussion about events and things like that. But um, the we we felt that these wineries and the impact they can have because they can have these um, wine tastings, they can have these events. They're um, much they're essentially commercial uses on residential parcels is something that we as a community should be have a higher level of scrutiny. We want to preserve uh, residential uses, uh, especially in our rural areas. Um, we, in our general plan, decided that parcels outside the urban and rural services line will no longer have R1 zoning. So we think it's important that we preserve the residential nature of these communities. I mean, we had a, um, we don't want to see them turned into um, high trafficked um, commercial areas. And so we think that although we're, we believe that they should be able to exist, uh, similar to things like um, Mr. Dan was talking about um, these events with um, amplified music, they should just have a higher level of public hearing before they proceed. And so that's why we suggested these changes for these wineries. And, and I want to say at the higher level, we usually have been able to work out something that most parties reluctantly agree to, but nonetheless, so that often what the wineries want, what the neighbors want can be adjudicated at a hearing. Otherwise, uh, there's an awful lot of work for the sheriff that doesn't need to happen. Thank you. And just to make sure um, for the public as well, CUP stands mm -hmm. for conditional use permit. And if it's not noted as such, it, staff has indicated that would be a, a zoning administrator hearing. And we're suggesting wineries in the medium level um, be a, a planning commission hearing. And I think that partly of what Commissioner Shepard said, um, that is re is reflected in this um, recommendation um, because it, it will just save time in the end and, and frankly, permit and uh, appeal fees as well, which can be substantial. Well, I just had one more comment. I know sure. staff feels that a lot of the simplification uh, that they're looking for and having lesser levels of hearings is because they, part of the goal of this is if it's allowed in the code, then there's not as much need to uh, look very carefully at it or, or that doesn't need a high level of scrutiny. I do not myself share that opinion because, the, and this is a good example, it's allowed, but it needs conditions for the neighborhoods it's in to make it work successfully and I think the, sometimes the almost always the higher level of hearing airs all the issues and the parties we the, the either the zoning administrator or the planning commission can come up with some conditions that while everybody not might not like they can live with and the project actually can proceed whereas if you just permit it and then all hell breaks loose you really have a whole lot more staff time and actually you know sheriff time to, to contend with. So, because people don't know what's happening and they feel like uh, it, it just happened and they were not consulted. Well, when in fact, if there's a hearing, you can, then issues can be adjudicated and resolved. So I, I think the higher level hearing actually results in simplification, curiously enough, rather than not requiring hearings on, or conditional use permits on, on, a, on a whole lot of areas in this document. Uh, I don't agree with making things at a lower level on that. And that's why. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Okay. Um, but unless there's any other questions on, on that, we'll move on to the next item, which is page 27, 1310-323-2 multifamily residential standards and um, concerning maximum building height. And this addition is asking to restore the 28 foot maximum building height outside of the urban services line, the USL, for um, the zone districts um, reflected on the page RM 1.5 to RM 2.5, RM 3 and RM 4. I believe actually, you know, I, I think that's a typo, it should say RM 3 to RM dash, I think that's a mistake on my part there. Okay. I should say RM3 to RM dash four right there. I'm just looking at the chart. Apologize. 
No, that's okay. Um, I, can, I can fix it. Yeah, okay. Thank I you. just want to be clear for the commission and the public, so I'll correct it. So are there any questions on that? Nope. Um, so the next item, um, I'll scroll down and Commissioner Violante, you can make that change. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, the next one is um, regarding open space requirements for RM and RF, and RF is the new residential flex zone district, which is a new zone district that is going to provide um, a higher density by at least 40 units per acre. Um, the RM district is a district we currently have. And so this was an area where staff was um, proposing to make what I saw was a significant change to the open space requirements for these two zone districts. Um, I feel very strongly that requiring some open space, private open space for high density development is is very desirable and makes for um, better designs in the end as well. So this is kind of a hybrid. Um, I The RM um, requirement for open space was um, reduced. And so I'm not restoring, I'm not suggesting that we restore that, but instead take what the new proposal for RM is, which is quite a bit smaller amount of open space and then applying that for RM, and then applying that also to RF so that they um, have the same open space requirements. And I just think as we build higher densities that it becomes even more um, important to make sure that we provide um, a little bit of open space for the folks um, that are going to be living in them. So are there any questions about that? I just want to comment that I've seen good designers over and over again able to accommodate open space in just this way. So I certainly support this. I don't think the open space should be the uh, corridors inside the buildings. And I was actually told by um, a developer that um, actually this is what the market demands anyway. And so, uh, so for market rate development, basically the point was for market rate development, you're going to get private um, open space anyway, because that's what the renters or the buyers of the condo um, desire. So a lot of this also is for um, the, um, the affordable housing projects as well. And, and then I was pleased to see that when staff interviewed MidPen that they didn't have any issues with um, the current um, standards, which are greater than what I'm even proposing here. So, yeah, question. go ahead, sure, Tim. Uh, just, um, so are you, I'm not clear on the language that you're proposing here. Are you saying that you need 60 feet of private open space per unit plus common open space? Yeah, so that's the requirement for the RM district. And so, yeah, I, so yeah, we're suggesting that um, that, that, requirement be for both RM and RF. So practically, just like understanding how that gets applied, you're stating that you want like private balconies on apartment complexes for every unit. Right. So like, for example, you know, are you familiar with the Nanda downtown Santa Cruz? That's the apartment complex that is on the corner of Pacific and Water. Okay. A single one of those units has a private balcony. Plus they have some common space inside. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, I just was, you know, thinking about the application of this and it, it's definitely possible, but when you get to like lot line to lot line, it, I just do want to comment that when you have required private open space, essentially in the form of a patio or a deck, that I've seen a lot of challenges with neighbors because they don't want people in a four-story building looking down into their parcel and that would be unavoidable in a high density area like this. So sometimes there's options yeah. around private open space that is in other areas and doesn't necessarily need to be patios attached to units. And I just wanted to comment that 
I understand the intent, but I've also seen it become problematic with neighbors for um, view sheds and private private views, essentially. So, well, I actually think you bring up an excellent point, and I could see that that happening for sure. And it's so it's like it's a delicate balance. Um, so, but if if it was private, the other thing, if I'm understanding you correctly, you said the other ways it could be achieved what I thought I heard you articulate wouldn't be private open space though that would be open space that's not private but it would be common open space yeah I guess that's yeah yeah sometimes yeah essentially there's I would say that I understand probably the intent of why this is mostly common open space and sorry I probably missed that that um I think it used to be that it was a certain amount required per unit, but that it could be common or open or private. And I, I don't have the, the code open right now, but, um, and I thought that that helped solve it, but maybe there's a way to incorporate private open space where feasible as, you know, not to, um, you know, um, intrude on neighbor neighboring properties or something, you know? Um, well, yeah, that, I, I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm so, so two things. One, I think that, um, one, it's just desirable that if we're going to build high density housing, that we build quality units that provide a small modicum of private open space, which makes a massive difference for the people that live there. And then, two, my my hope, and I believe is the intent of, of um, the CDI department, is that where these high density developments would occur would mostly be in, a, in places um, where um, it's appropriate to build these high density housing. Um, so like some of the opportunity sites in Live Oak that probably are gonna be ripe for redevelopment in the next you know, 10 years, like East Cliff Village and places like that. So not to say that they don't have neighbors, they do. I know that like the 831 water project had has neighbors, you know, to the back of it that are impacted. And so it is like, like I get it, like <laughs> there's gonna be impacts on the neighbors. So this is one of those things where it's like a balancing act of this commission. Yes, do we, um, we need the housing. So I support the high density uh, housing and the changes that were, we're making, but yeah, I agree, Tim, that is gonna have an impact to the houses if they're single family houses adjacent to the high density housing. Yeah, it's it's going to um it's going to impact those neighbors for sure. Um but I don't feel that I wanna um you know take away an amenity that the folks living in those buildings should also have. So, but I, so I guess like the, does, you know, but I do believe that we have really smart designers and very talented designers who can, um, you know, make magic with their designs. That's my hope. Uh, Chair Gordon. Uh, yes, Ms. Murphy. Uh, um, can I ask a, a clarification question on the, on the amendment? Um, so currently for ResFlex, um, yeah, the standard is minimum, and we increased it from 10 to 15 percent in response to earlier comments to, you know, try and wait, provide. Wait, can you wait? What do you? The residential flex is a new zone district. So, what do you mean the current? Oh, so so previously we had, we had proposed 10 percent, and then we did increase it to 15 after our discussions, and we did additional analysis. Um, right. Okay. But my question is, um, currently it reads minimum 50 percent of gross site area common and or private. So. Right now, the 15% is intended to provide flexibility of either, you know, the, the choice depending on the property, whether it would be common or private or a combination. So, so in your proposed change, is the intention to keep that flexibility and then also require a minimum of 60 um, square foot per unit private open space? If I'm understanding you correctly, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, moving on. This next section, um, page, now we're on 1310-323-F2 on page 36. Um, this is 
just a, a clarifying addition that I believe that the intention of this section is, is for 100% affordable housing units, but um, we just added that just for clarity's sake. And then here is where I think there'll be a lot of interest potentially. Um, page 38 of this section, I believe we're still in this section. Um, and this is about noticing in this, uh, oh, so excuse me, I'm sorry, I got confused. We are now on 1310-323-F6A. Um, Commissioner Violante, do you wanna speak to this one? Yeah, so we're just simply restoring um, the notification when heights are, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm checking to make sure I have the right section, that we're simply restoring the fact that there's notification when heights um, go above certain levels. So, um, and Mr. Dan, please tell me if I'm incorrect about this, but I, we're just saying that when additional heights are allowed, that they're, they're subject to this notification if they go above certain height limits. So. That's what this section is doing. It's simply restoring the language that was struck by staff so that there is notification for their neighbors if they go above the allowed height. Questions on that one? Um, just one question. Um, so an AUP means an administrative use permit, um, discretionary permit with public notice. What, what is the public notice? And the MUP means no public notice. So in case anyone's following this, but what is the notice on an administrator, an AUP? Well, currently, and um, stay tuned, but um, currently it's, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, 300 feet of the proposed um, project. Staff, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but we are later, um, in our next document, we're going to be making some suggested changes to noticing as well. Okay, but just just so I know, um, put it in my brain for the rest of this, an AUP, an administrative use permit is a discretionary permit with public notice. What is the public notice? I guess that's a staff question. Is it people within 300 feet, 500 feet? Is it mailed? How, do, how are, at present, there's no, that's what I was asking. At present, they mail and staff, this is confirmed that Rachel and Commissioner Dan and I are correct, they mail uh, residents within 300 feet according to the current code. That, is it, that, um, that's correct. It, and if you don't hit a certain minimum number of parcels, you actually expand it to, to hit that minimum number of parcels. So they are they are mailed notices. Is it also posted on, um, you know, on a lamppost or I mean, the way often notices of development are physically posted. Jocelyn, can you just correct me if I'm wrong? I'm not looking at chapter 1810, but I believe they are posted on site and hearings are published in the newspaper. Um, yes, for it, I'm not sure with the with the code amendments how um, the levels are are reorganized, but yes, for an administrative permit um, level four, currently we post a notice on the site and do the mailed noticing. Um, for the zoning administrator level hearings and above, we do a big um, on-site sign. Um, no, I, wasn't, I wasn't asking about the higher levels. I was asking specifically about AUP. So is an AUP, um, Stephanie and Annie, a level three or a level four administrative? It's four. It's a four? Okay, so for a four, it would be the mailed noticing and the yellow placard that is posted on site. And then we also post on our website. Okay, so we are changing. Everyone knows what a level three, four, five, six, seven mean. We are adopting this new terminology and is eventually there won't will there not be published level three four five will they only say mup or aup with and will it have a statement of what that means someplace it's just yeah. hard to make this transition or or is that an internal mup is that for internal use 
No, it's it's it would be in the code and um, Title 18 speaks to procedures. Well, I'd like to suggest that every table um, in the header of every table, you you have enough room. You uh, once again define any acronyms more frequently. They're, if, they're typically defined. Okay, so good. We they are. You are just going yeah, into. So. Okay. Yeah, I even think um, that in Chapter 18, even under the amended section, it says AUP, formerly level four. I think I'm making I mean, that a, up. <laughs> there's a there's a crosswalk table. That's correct. Great. Right. Yes, I understand. Um, can you refer me to that page? Because saying AUP, <clears throat> formerly level four, for someone who has no idea what either mean, that does not very helpful. Sure. So actually, if um, we actually are going to, we have a, th those are actually some sections where we're going to get into the weeds on in our second part two of this. So, I, just, um, I, just like, I just like to once again remind staff, internal use, you understand these changes immediately and you use them fluently. But as a planning commissioner, I'm always referring people to sections of the code or suggesting they go down and People don't know what three, four, five, six means is, and now we're changing again. So just saying AUP equals level four is not helpful to anyone who's not part of the planning department. Uh, you got to say you, you got to say what it means. That's all. Often, part of the purpose of this is to align our permit structure with how other communities do it. So it'll be a little bit actually easier for people to understand a conditional use permit. Um, rather than a level six or seven um, that has, you know, that is a little mysterious. So the in, the intent is the the opposite. I don't and it mean, should be clearer to people. I don't mean that using initials or letters instead of numbers isn't fine if you feel, and that's a good rationale. But don't assume that if someone moves here from Wisconsin or Santa Clara for that the AUP is a transparent term. It's still planning jargon, and it doesn't hurt to say what it means often. Commissioner Shepard, just to answer your question, page nine, since you have the physical printout of, of Title 18, there is the uh, crosswalk of what level four and the AUP and the SUP um, has, so you can just have it in front of you. We'll continue to try to explain it when we use it, but just. Well, I um, have printed out a page from table 13.2.4-1 where it has a key. It says that P, C, Z, M, E, P, A, U, P, C, U, P, A, and N, are mean. So I've got that taped to my desk, so I'm using that. Is that what you're referring to? No, it has a, I, I think, I, uh, I did both work. From it, it, it has the tape. It has the level one, level four, level, et cetera, and then what that means in terms of the AUP, CUP, is okay, it ministerial? I'm, I'm, Is it discretionary? I won't waste their time. I wasn't, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to point out that you really, you know, making this successful for the average citizen is important. That's all. And, and it, letters or numbers aren't helpful. So having, yeah, right, I'm repeating myself. Go on. Thank you. No, I think you're making some good points to the average citizen trying to figure out what's going on across the street. You're making really good points. I think that um, Stephanie is correct that for the development community, this will make more sense for them. So I think both, both are true in this instance. And so moving on to the next part. Commissioner Lazenby has her oh, hand up. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Commissioner Lazenby. Yes, I was, um, I, I'm a little confused about the height when it goes over 28 feet up to 35 feet, it's MUP. Then when it goes over 35 feet, it goes back to AUP. Is there a typographical error or am I just not understanding that? No, that's a good catch. Go ahead, Allison, sorry. No, so the MUP is a lower level of review than an AUP. So when you're on a larger parcel, it starts at an MUP because the parcel is so large. Okay. Um, and then it goes to an AUP versus on a smaller parcel, it, it starts at a higher level of review because the parcel is smaller. 
if you're right, we could we we could have a smaller level of review on smaller parcels. But no, the idea is that you don't need that higher level of review. Um, you you start higher for the smaller parcels versus we, we in that tinier window from 28 to okay. 25 because the parcel is larger the review is smaller. It's because thank because you the so big. Okay. I had another question on this one. So, um, you know, these, I believe that these height limits were probably based on the old height limits, but those have changed. So if this, I'm just confused to where this would apply because, um, and if it would need to say, or instead of the specific height listed, what the planning department said was, um, uh, it, any increase over the permitted building height because building heights vary from zone to zone in the residential district. Um, so this could require an AUP for a standard project technically as written, even if it meets the height limit. That's a good catch, Tim, because you're right. The narrative does say um, over the permitted height, but then you're right. So um, there are certain districts, you are correct. Um, where we where we have now increased it to higher, so I because I, it does say because if you read six just standard six, it just says structures exceeding zoning district height. So yeah, I suppose it's um, um, I, I think that is you're you're right. I have to look at the 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 res use chart to figure out. Could it say? I mean, it seems like the intent was projects two and a half on just working our way from the top down projects to under two and a half acres would be anything over the permitted height and then the two and a half and larger would be anything permitted height plus five feet and then anything or excuse me seven feet simple math not my forte um and then anything seven like permitted height seven plus seven feet or greater would be the third category for the AUP. Yeah, that's, I think you're correct. Thank you for catching that. We were, like I said, we just restored, we were restoring the language yeah, sure. in order to, to do it, but you're correct that we should amend our a motion to language there. So um, to include, instead of saying over 28 feet, it should say over um, zoning district height limit. And then, so we should, we should make that change. Rachel, if you're okay with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, do you want to? Yeah, I can go in and do, do are we is that a technical friendly amendment? Is that what we do we need to rephrase how we offer that change or are we okay on it? Yeah, I mean I think we we both had, I think that yeah. was a good catch. Thank you. Okay. So we can just like I guess this is one benefit of doing this remotely. We can yeah. <laughs> modify the document in real time. <laughs> Okay. Uh, that's up to seven. Feet. Yeah, up to yeah. Seven additional, I think maybe. Eight, maybe good way of saying that. Yeah. I don't want to, seven feet. I wanted to suggest they were saying they can be seven feet tall. <laughs> you can have a seven foot tall building. <laughs> or you need an MUP. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Seven feet. Yeah, there. I think that's that looked good to everybody. Zoning just right plus and right because it's over that. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Could you retain the feet in the last bottom category? Thank you. Great. Um, I had one other request for an addition at this section, something that I've talked about and asked about, but, um, you know, I haven't got, we haven't all discussed it as a group really yet. And it's the idea that um, within the urban services line in particular, 
where we have RM high density RM zones, especially which occurs along the corridors that we could allow the FAR exemption for parking underneath a structure as is currently in the RF, but uh, um, adding it to the RM densities that are the high densities inside the urban services line, which again is like at corridors. And that's typically, our, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, RM1 uh, or one and a half, whatever our lowest one is through RM4. And so anyway, that's a long yeah. way to say, would you guys accept an amendment to include the FAR um, uh, adjust or um, not variance? I think you got my point and I can read it <laughs> word for word here better <laughs> in a but, second. Um, Tim, can you yeah. tell me? Yeah. Go ahead, Austin. Is it, Tim, can you tell me where in the code you want to insert this so I can yeah. have some context for my head right it, it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure which part of, uh, code section 310, 1310, 323, because it doesn't really have a space. There was in the RF district, there was like an added um, uh, section for it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it would be an addition in the, you know, in a place that is appropriate. Does that make sense? It does. And I vaguely, I vaguely recall what you're talking about. I have no recollection where. That is, but basically what you're saying is there's some, you would like what is being proposed for RF to apply to RM? Correct, at least the yeah. high density RM, which I think is technically the RM 1.5 through four, which right. again, yeah, occurs on on the- um, Yeah, like in concept, four. that's, I'm, I think that's a good idea. Uh, if, but if we could, find exactly where that is so we can so um, you, make, go ahead. So, that I, so that I can understand him, I think maybe what you're talking about is maybe in the multifamily residential site and structure dimensions chart, which is that 1310-323-2. You're talking about this FA, the the FAR, the max FAR in RF um, yes. is 1.1 when it's less than 30 um or, something I'm trying to look at the um, amended language and then and it's 1.5 when it's greater and then versus in RMs it varies from 0.5 to 0.7 and, and are you wanting to amend that am I understanding you correctly I just want to make sure um, I'm trying to understand yeah no problem so I think technically we don't need to amend those I mean if, I don't think we have to amend those FARs I would just add at the side on, this, on the chart and I'm looking at the new packet here to see exactly where that is but um Chair, if I might, on page 39, there's a FAR parking exemption highlighted in yellow, um, which incorporates 75% of spaces in underground garages and podium parking um, are not subject to the maximum FAR. So this applies to the residential flux, and we could add in those uh, zone districts there that you specified. Thank you. Yeah, so that, if, unlike the packet that we have, it's the last page of the first packet, page 160. <clears throat> um, the highlighted section is the code section. And I guess we could just, as you're saying, Stephanie, adjust that code section to say FAR parking exemption, residential flex, and high density um, multifamily zones. Um, yeah, well, we'll... I think we're, we're we're better off kind of specifying the particular zones as you mentioned before, just to right. be consistent. Yes. So this is code section thirteen ten three two three. I'm sorry, there's so many it's cross outs. <laughs> I'm having a hard time keeping track of which one's where. Three two three. Yeah, it's hard. You guys. Um. Yes. F eight. F eight. Thank you. Okay. So let me. Let me see if I can summarize this. So we're trying to say that if they incorporate at least, because Stephanie, you're talking about the part that says residential flex projects that incorporate at least 75% of parking spaces for underground garages. Will be, that's what we're talking about. Yes. There. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I know that we're all looking at the same page 39. <laughs> and Stephanie, am I correct in the, in the assumption that we kind of consider high density multifamily as kind of up to the RM4? 
Um, is Daisy available or Annie? I can't remember exactly how they're broken up. I had noticed that in some material somewhere in all of this, um, and that as a, it had been noted that way in another section, and so that was my assumption, and so that's kind of what I was going with. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'm just taking a look through the um, residential development standards to see if that is defined. Um, I can just also like I would list. yeah I think it's better to probably list the exact zone districts yeah um, we do in the in the development standards chart group our group group the those RM standards together uh, for those districts um, RM one point five to RM two point five and RM three to RM four um, but it doesn't state in the in the dimensions chart that those are particularly you know where the where the uh, break is for high density. Okay, that makes sense. So for process-wise, that change seems good to me, and I'm okay with it if uh, Commissioner Violante is. Can you just tell me again what it means? So you want to exempt FA, you want to allow them not to have maximum FAR when what happened? Just so I understand, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, no problem. And to um, it's essentially when you have this, when this code applies here, when you do these things, um, incorporate at least 75% of parking spaces with underground garages, multi-story above ground garages, or podium parking located on or off site, and those are not subject to maximum FAR. This is in the uh, adjustments that were provided to us last time in code section 1310.323F8 on page 160 of our handout. So I, so, and we want to do this for RM zone parcels? Correct. I, I, that, that seems okay. Um, Not all RM, the highest, the two highest groupings of RM. So right. 1.5 RM. to 2.5 and then 3 to 4. In the U, within the USL. Within the USL. Correct. Okay. The only part that makes me a little hesitant is this the offset site parking because when we do RF, we're talking about having some commercial on site where they may have like shuttle parking or something at an alternative site. When we're talking strictly residential, I can't envision. I don't. I don't know what off site parking would look like. Um, maybe there's nothing creative enough. Um, and I don't. That's fair. Yeah. So what if we said like added, uh, you know, this would be an addition then say code section uh, F9 and it could say FAR parking exemption for um, RM 1.5 through RM 4 and then it would say everything and, and then leave out the or offsite part of it. So I could, I could read that as a whole for everyone. Is that it's staff? Is that is there a? Am I just being not creative enough? I mean, please tell me. I I, I want to I want to know <laughs> what that might look like. I'm happy to. We can leave it in too if it's if it's something reasonable that we think that may come. I I just don't want to. I want to ensure that there's enough parking and we're not creating unintended um, excess car trips by mm -hmm. allowing this offsite parking. I don't know what that looks like. I can just chime in. I do know of one project which is still sort of being worked through, but the um, the former lumber side on Portola Drive there, they they purchased a lot across the street to provide additional parking for their um, multifamily project, their mixed use project. See, and that's my concern is that's mixed use and not strictly residential. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk right. about them, it would be strictly residential. Um, but again, I don't want to be close-minded to this idea that I'm just not, uh, obviously if it's just across the street, that would work. Mm -hmm. There, You know, there are, if you're going to locate your parking off site, you kind of need to prove that it that it works and study it. Um, uh, so there, you know, there are going to be times when when um, multifamily developments may need to be as creative as mixed use developments. Maybe there's a church next door, for instance, where they could locate parking that, um, you know, that where peak hours are different from um, the the use that's on that site. So 
provides a little bit of flexib flexibility um, okay. and and the requirements are in the uh, chapter 13, 16 for shared parking agreements. Okay, I, that's great. I really appreciate it when, when staff can help me think of things that I just didn't immediately. I just, like I said, I don't want to create additional car trips. But so if we think that it's possible to have that kind of shared parking, then, then I'm, I'm completely comfortable. We can leave it in um, as long as staff thinks um, there'll be enough scrutiny. Uh, on those types of shared parking agreement. So then, yeah, we can just, we can do the easy easy fix and just add uh, it into eight there. So procedurally, I would like to embed that in this document since um, staff is um, um, posting them to make them available. So it would be helpful, I think, if we could add language. Yeah, thank you, Allison, there you go. <laughs> So do you want me to try to, to sum it up here and yes. you can type it or do you have yeah. it? Um, yeah, we, let's, we can watch her type. So when she gets oh, to yeah, the point where she's ready. You can copy and paste it, right? I mean, can, can staff tell me it was 13? I think it was F8. H F8. F8. I want to make sure I got the numbers right. Mm -hmm. Do F8. And then here is the code section. Um, and so, you, oops, type the eight twice. Um, residential flex projects. And oh. R R M. I get the number right. Yep. Back to the use chart. Okay, so we want yeah. one. We don't have anything less than a one point five, right? No. Yeah. To R M two point five. And I'll fix the spacing here in a minute. R M dash three to R M dash four within the USL. Staff, tell me if this works though, because I want to make sure. I need to make sure that this part is within the USL. How can I help staff make sure that that part work is only in the USL? Typically, RM is something would be in the USL or uh, maybe the RSL. They're it's not a rural that, density. There are definitely parcels that meet this definition inside the RSL within, mm -hmm. I know, within our district, the second district. So how can I ensure that it's only within the USL for, for these zonings in terms of the language we put in here? Is You don't want it in the RSL as well to have that flexibility? I didn't know, you know, if the other commissioners would want that or not. Um, and so that's why I started there. But if it applied everywhere, it would make sense to me because the location of these are in mostly in the corridors and high density areas. And so that's, you know, how, how I leave it to Commissioner Dan and Violante. To... I mean, I guess in the third district, the only RSL we have is in Davenport, and so I, I, you know, and the only area where I could ever see this as being applicable would be if the cement plant was ever redeveloped, um, which could happen in our lifetime. It would probably benefit from this also. So it could, you're right, if it was, but I'm not sure that it would be appropriate in Newtown or Old Town. <laughs> um, it, it, I agree, though, if the cement plant was redeveloped, it possibly could be very appropriate for the for an eventual project there. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a tough one. I, I, so in our district, we have parcels in the RSL that meet this definition in areas that I don't know that this would be appropriate. Um, smaller communities like La Selva Beach that are on, on septic, um, that are um, traditionally kind of single family homes. And while obviously if they got redeveloped, the high density would be appropriate. I don't know that um, having these. Well, I can say it's not particularly appropriate for the rural area of San Lorenzo Valley because we don't have any sewer systems and we have a very limited water capacity. So I think we might want to just stick with the USL. Um, we Yes, I'm I fine with that. We, I, I think we should totally stick with the 
urban services area because we would be a big step to make a change that has so many implications about infrastructure that we that change from one part of the unincorporated area from the other. So I don't think it's appropriate and I wouldn't vote for it. Okay, I, that's fine. The, um, I was, and, and I'm fine, I, I can go with, with that. Um, the one thing I'm going to suggest is we could say within the RSL where there is sewer and water service. Well, that's, and that's that, would, that, that is extremely ambiguous. Well, so that would cover uh, the CMEX reuse plant because they have sewer and water. And why don't you just, why don't you just, but I'm fine. Well, USL is fine. And I was just trying to think of ways we could yeah. rate other areas. Uh, I think a project the size of something for CMEX would involve probably a general plan change or considerable rezoning anyway and could be addressed site specific. I wouldn't support that general change. So I think it's you're right. Point. You're right, Commissioner Shepard, that would have to occur. So you're right. I, I also want to just comment that this doesn't change. I mean, not that I'm trying to change anyone's minor opinion, but it just as a general note, um, this doesn't change densities by any means or anything like that. It's really just like how you park your building mostly than anything. And so, um, but I appreciate that. I appreciate the additions. Um, okay. So you are changing it to be re, re, for urban services, right? Yeah. Right. That, yeah. Good. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Violanti, for adding that in there. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, ahead, before we move on, unless you had other stuff on that one. I just see um, Annie Murphy's and Daisy Allen's hand up, and they might want to potentially add something, although we might have decided. So I just want to give that opportunity since they both have their hands raised. Um, I, yeah, I just, uh, had a suggestion, um, that would, for the wording of this sentence, you could start the sentence by saying within the USL, um, so that it would read within the USL, comma, residential flex, and then on to the RM districts. And that would be very clear that it would only apply within the USL overall. Would but that the way, the way you've written it, I think would, um, technically work also. Daisy, I was going to do that, but I would the residential flex. But I guess we only have residential flex inside the USL, so yeah. it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, I, don't, I see your point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chair Gordon, I just had a yeah. was thinking a little more about high density. The, the RM four is eleven units per acre. So, just as an idea, maybe consider RM one point five to RM three, just because when you, you know, if you have that exemption for units that already are, you know, 4,000 square foot lots, it can just sort of, in some sense, encourage larger units with, with garages. So, so it might sort of promote larger, sort of more luxury type units potentially. So that was just a thought I just wanted to share. Uh, appreciate that. Um, totally understand. I think that for me, the reason I wanted to include the RM4 is because I think that there's a lot of along the corridor, especially like on SoCal Drive, and that, which is RM4, and that's like the densest it gets on the corridors. And some of those lots are really small. And, you know, I've done a lot of case studies and have projects there where it becomes tr really tricky to fit it all without the ability to park under the building. And so I appreciate that um, insight. I have also just you know like to leave it if possible if that works still for the other commissioners thank you thank you annie do i just i want to understand your concern that you're concerned that by leaving rm in that we're going to end up with luxury units well i mean i think chair gord makes a good point about a smaller lot where it may be very constrained i was thinking more in terms of maybe a larger new development where it's rm4 and so you know it's already a fairly generous you know, um, size area per unit. So it could potentially allow for, you know, 2000 square foot unit with a, with a parking garage. So, um, so that was sort of my point, but I do understand Chair Gordon's point about smaller, more constrained sites where it may be challenging to park those. So. Yeah, I think a lot of those two on the, um, Along those quarters, is, I don't know if you 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 know when you kind of look at the zoning map, a lot of those larger parcels are actually split, so they have a dual overlay zone of like an RM4 and an RM6, and so you know as it kind of like steps back away. So my thought was that 
if we're not including RM6 and those have that dual overlay where it could be, you know, a little bit, it will be a little bit less dense. It wouldn't apply there because they have both zones. Does that make sense? So this really only applies to like lots that are really like on those corridors, um, smaller lots on those corridors. That was my intent and kind of thought process of why this would work. That makes sense to me. And I mean, I think that, you know, when this project is concluded, staff is going to be embarking on the next massive project, which would be um, to rezone um, parcels to satisfy our um, arena allocation. So um, <laughs> I think we'll all have to stay tuned. So it's, go ahead. Sorry. Did somebody start to talk? No. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, are we done with this section? I think so. Um, I hate to, we're on a roll, but I know we kind of had an 11 yes. break and I could use a quick break. 100%. Okay, and then come back to the 1310-331 right after. Um, sure. I'm just wondering before we do that, how long the 1310 331 might be, just because we're getting really close to the lunch break time. Okay. I'm wondering if we should break for lunch now or if that's going to be a short section. Um, I think that we're probably halfway through this document. Okay. So maybe we should uh, break for lunch early. I don't. Uh, I'm for that. I don't, whatever everybody wants to do, fine with me. This is a good stopping time. I would be for breaking for lunch early. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I want to uh, be conscious of CTV and the schedules that we need to keep. So we're we're in the right time right frame for lunch for them and everything also. Is that correct? I'd say mm -hmm. we're, yeah. we're halfway through the document. The Jocelyn, your question of how long 1310331 is, that's not a particularly long portion of the document. So we could okay. try to get it's, oh, it's up to you if you think like we could. I'm well. If we, it's up to it's up to you guys if you think we could get through it in like a half an hour. I mean, if we take a break now and come back and do that in a half an hour, we could take a a lunch break after. Rachel, you also have the sec just that section in front of you. I'm, just looking yeah, for it. I'm I'm fine. <laughs> taking lunch now. Taking a break now. Tim indicates, you know, we should all take, we should take a break. We haven't taken a break yet. So, okay, right. I use a quick matter bio break, just to be honest. So, okay. Um, I, could I think five we could minutes probably... and then we could come back and do lunch later or just hit lunch right now and be done and then truck on through. Let's take a break. Then okay. we can contemplate other actions. We all need a break. So, sounds good. We'll break. take a 10 minute break. How does or how about eleven minutes, um, Tim, and come back at eleven uh, forty-five? Perfect. Okay. Thank Sounds you so much. Me. Great. So looks like we have all of the commission back with us, Chair. Great. Thank you so much. Um, then let's uh, resume. We were going through okay. motion for thirteen ten. Yeah, let me share my screen again. And um, again, I, um, in order to be able to see, I have to completely minimize everything. So I, I can't see anybody. So it's kind of a bizarre way of communicating to communicate to a <laughs> So, um, so <laughs> yeah. I apologize if I if talk over somebody unintentionally. Um, it's just because I can't see anything. Okay, where am I? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so we can move on. Okay. So this next section um, um, is on commercial districts. So we're on chapter 1310 336 and Article 3 commercial districts. So there was a, well, it's up here, a, a um, part of the code that um, eliminated um, a section about energy, efficient energy use. And 
in commercial districts. And so we're just suggesting that that be retained. I, so are there any questions on that one? Pretty uncontroversial, so I'll just move along. Um, so the next section is about um, change of use. And Commissioner Violante, do you wanna talk about this one? Yeah, so this is something we talked about at our last uh, hearing uh, last week. <laughs> and it has to do with the idea that if, uh, we, and I talked about actually a little bit this morning, which is when there's a change of use, it allows staff to approve it with the ministerial um, approval, which is good because it streamlines that process. But we wanted to ensure that they, that if, because some of those means that, that it would have been required a public hearing or a public notification that that was only allowed um that that ministerial approval that was in place. sorry it's got really loud in my ear um but that doesn't usurp kind of the process of, of public hearings and, and public notification so they're only allowed to do this ministerial approval had the original the new use um not required that a higher level of of public hearing or public notification than the existing use so it's kind of closing what we see as a loophole to the ministerial process we don't want someone that uh, used to have have required a permit a hearing not not go through it because of a previous permit well i i think that sounds good commissioner violante but i i wanted to explore this one a little bit so i had a question when <clears throat> the kmart then was converted to a Home Depot, truly not a change of use. But it brought up, because the Home Depot was obviously going to be very popular, we did have a general a, a planning commission hearing to discuss uh, the traffic. And as a result of that hearing, um, there was a lot of community involvement. And as you know, there are, are <clears throat> turn, new turn lanes and new traffic signals that everyone there really wasn't much argument about it from anybody, but I wonder if under this system that would even happen because the zoning use didn't change. It was, you know, Kmart, Home Depot. There wasn't that much of a difference. They didn't remodel it greatly, but clearly they were going to have, because of what they do and who they are, a lot more traffic. So a lot of people came to the hearing, and I think the traffic improvements that we did were what we could do, but I thought a planning commission hearing was very useful. Now, is it my understanding that this would say that wouldn't involve any hearing? So a building, uh, a commercial use could become anything else it wanted to, or maybe I'm not understanding it. Could staff give me some feedback? Or would that have counted as an, in, in, an intensification of use and let's use that as an example how would you have judged whether home depot was going to be an intensification of use from kmart and what hearing would that have mandated if you decide it was or wasn't uh thank you chair gordon i, I wasn't around for that particular item um well it's a while ago now but it's a good yeah example. yeah um Gosh, I think I think actually I'm gonna ask if Daisy is around for this for this one and and Annie and what there is in the code that would have suggested anything beyond kind of the zoning clearance for such an action. And my question is, why did it come before the planning commission? During the current code, was that yeah. the director thought it should, or was it in the code that it had to? I don't quite understand the extent of this change, but I want to be pretty careful about it. For example, okay, yes. Okay, yeah. So the um, the existing commercial change of use requirements are more strict. So um, what we're proposing here is. Uh, uh, would would allow for some commercial changes of use uh, with just a zoning clearance. Um, uh, in the case of the project that you're bringing up, where it's a similar use type and there's no major, you know, site development permit needed, 
uh, I think the factor would be whether or not there was an intensification of use um, that would determine whether or not uh, that, cha that change of use could be allowed with just a zoning clearance or whether a use permit would be required. If there was a use permit required, it would be a conditional use permit, right? Uh, yes, I'm just opening up that code section to make sure I get it right. And under the proposed changes, that would only go to the zoning administrator. Right, correct. Well, I just don't, I just um, don't. Uh, Commissioner Shepard, if I might, I think that you have, you have some motions that you were considering that might address Yes, I, I am this. going to uh, okay. later suggest that we not change those hearing levels, but I didn't know how it would apply to this part of the code. Um, I, that was a good example, so I'm picking it out, but an intensification of use is a subjective thing. There was really no way you, you, the other commissioners seeing what I'm saying, is this really a good idea? I mean, that was a, that was a legal change and really no one was opposing it. And we're just going to say, what changes is this going to make that we should consider for the, this being a, you know, 41st Avenue already being a very complicated intersection with a lot of traffic. The city of Capitola was invited at the hearing. We came up with the traffic mitigations that were actually uh, built. Um, and I don't know under this legis the way we are changing the code if any of that would have happened and it would have been pretty much a nightmare. Can I, can I um, say something? Please. I think that, um, so first of all, the, uh, there, there is an objective standard for the definition of intensification of use and actually in this document, Commissioner Violanti and I are proposing to strengthen that. So I think it's possible that given the change that we're proposing to make in this document, that the Kmart to the Home Depot, if it was determined that it would have increased, um, that it's possible that it would have met that definition or even the current one that's in the, the code right now. So it's possible that that's why it came before us. Um, and I had completely forgotten about that project and now I remember it. Um, so thank you for jogging my memory. So. I, I think that it probably, like if it happened today, and if this change is accepted um, in what we're proposing, that it's possible that it would come before, a, or at least a, a, get a public hearing. I, Commissioner Shepard, I would just say that we share your concerns about exactly that type of project, but something which is we're, what the, the changes that Commissioner Dan and I are proposing strengthen the likelihood of things like that coming before the public and before um, administrative bodies, and <clears throat> pardon me, um, administrative bodies instead of just being a ministerial decision. Um, because, and so we did strengthen uh, the, the definition of intensification of use because what the staff was proposing said that as long as the use was the same and there was an existing use permit, it would not. Um, require, be required to come before the zoning administrator would not come before the planning commissioner. And by inserting the language here, we are increasing the likelihood that that happens, both if it's a change of use that um, needed a, a higher level public hearing, in addition to the fact that previously in this document, as Commissioner Dan said, we strengthened the intensification of use, meaning that if there were a higher number of car trips or the 10% increase, um, uh, so that both, both of those standards could trigger a higher level of review versus staff's proposed language had said and. So I, we, we agree with your concerns, um, but we, so we, if there are things you, we're, we're hoping to, to not allow things like that to, to go okay. through. Um, thank you for that. I will just be patient as we go through this, but I think the part that I continue to have issues with and wanted will suggest language a little later on is I think I do not think a lot of these involve, should be ZA. I think they should be continue to be planning commission for conditional use permits. And I'm not exactly sure when I'll make that suggestion, but it's, it involves, this is an example of why I think that. And it's based on my experience of seeing projects come across over and over again. And I where I don't think just a ZA hearing 
is is sufficient or comes up with the best results because I see them always appeal because they get appealed to the planning commission but now that's going to be two to four thousand dollars and I think they should stay at the same level they were but I'll wait to make that um, suggestion a little later um if I may, I just wanted to clarify uh, regarding the change of use in the proposed um, code section. So if a, if a project, uh, if a proposed change of use did not meet these criteria, then it wouldn't automatically get a conditional use permit. It would go to whatever the permit level that is reflected in the commercial uses chart, which may, may be anything ranging from uh, a minor use permit up to a conditional use permit. Uh, say that again. I really didn't understand you. Sure. Um, so you asked earlier whether um, if some, if a project did not meet these uh, criteria for a, a zoning clearance, whether they would automatically get a conditional use permit. Wait a minute. I, Stop there. The first part of what you said, if a project did not meet the criteria that are on the screen regarding change of use in an existing legal structure in a commercial zone district? In other words, if it would result in an intensification of use. Yeah, or, you know, met one of the other criteria here, for instance, if there's not currently a use permit on the site, um, or um, the, the use would have required a higher level of public notice for instance, than the existing use. And if you know any one of those criteria were not met, then the use permit level that would be required would be indicated in the use chart, the commercial use chart. And what page is that on? Um, that is section 1310.332, um, immediately following the change of the change of use uh, text. Can you tell I'm sorry, I can't. I can't hear you. It's on page eleven. Is the beginning of the commercial use? Well, ten technically, because but really the the use is on page eleven of the. It's the commercial use chart. So that shows the level of review for each zone district. Looking at that use permit issued by Renee, we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Looking. Can you hear me now? Yes. So looking at that chart on page 11 um, for use permit required by zone, th there is nothing on it that would involve planning commission hearings at all. They're all either um, discretionary permit with public notice, which is an administrative use permit, which means there's public notice but that's all, and a CUP being um, a ZA hearing. So the project that I was talking about would not have had a planning commission hearing, agree? Well, I guess. Um, I'm just, yeah, just to clarify, uh, there are um, CUP, Planning Commission level reviews uh, in the commercial districts um, for certain use types. I do see one. Um, um, the, so the various cannabis uses, um, automobile sales or rental in C2, for instance. So there, there's various uh, various ones, but I uh, there is not a CUPPC for uh, retail. Okay, well, that's the... Answer I was getting. Let me give you, mm -hmm. let me ask you another one. It, this did not happen since Target found a better space that everyone is very pleased with, but they a few years ago were proposing to build, I think it was a 90,000 square foot, 60 or 90,000 big uh, store next to the hotel um, in Scotts Valley that's just off the freeway. It's, I think it is zone commercial. It's been vacant for a long, it's never had anything on it, but I think it is on commercial. Would that have had, a, and that was going to be a huge change for that whole community because aside from the hotel, it's all residential and would have meant obviously huge changes to circulation and traffic and a whole lot of other stuff. So would that have had a planning commission? Would that have had a planning commission hearing? 
It certainly was an intensification of use. So the idea that that big a project with that much community impact to go ahead without any public input is difficult for me to imagine. So what if you, I unfortunately don't know what the zoning is, but I'm pretty sure it's, let's assume it's commercial on, I'm pretty sure it is actually. It sounds, Renee, like you, sorry, Commissioner Shepard, that you, when we were, the next section we're going to discuss is this zone chart. It sounds like you would like to see, since you, you, it sounds like you particularly have interest when it's going to be a retail community, um, page 16, if you're in the print version, um, I'm it's, uh, it sounds like, it sounds like you have a, you, you might want to see some increased level of res review, um, for these retail community, it's it's called retail dash community, which is department slash big box stores, home, garden, nursery, auto supplies, office, and technology products. Is it is it specific to that that you would like to see an increased level of review? Because I think we, with the commission, could discuss um, that being incorporated into the motion, or is it in general overall for all commercial um, uses that you would like to see? Uh, increased level of planning commission or zoning administrator uh, hearings, just so I understand. Um, um, I came at this by basically going by the years I've sat on the planning commission of what kinds of intensification of use in commercial zones have had beneficial public meetings or a lot or a tremendous amount of community involvement or effects. So yes, that was one, I've given you two examples. I note on page 15, there's um, an MUP level for um, a no public notice for research and development laboratories. This goes back a ways, but we were, we were once the home of a very big uh, blood plasma laboratory that involved on the North Coast, large herds of goats, and they took the plasma from their blood and turned it into something else. And that was a hugely controversial one because they wanted to expand hugely. And there was a lot of public involvement. If that happened today, um, they would sail through. And so, yes, I'm, there, are, there are many examples here in the code, which I think in my experience have, have always involved the community. And I do not think the outcomes were poor through having a, a public hearing in the end. There's, you try to reach a consensus of what will really work, but there are always lots of concerns of the large surrounding, surrounding community. And I think that by having a higher level of public hearing, you're actually avoiding lawsuits or stalling the project sometime because you can work things out. So yes, on this use chart, I would say that I uh, want to make a motion that the current levels of review where the planning commission has been involved not be changed. I don't see downgrading them. I fundamentally disagree that if it's allowed in the code, it should automatically uh, get an MUP with no public notice or, or even an AUP. I think zoning administrator hearings and planning commission hearings have, have on the whole been very successful in meeting neighborhood and community more, I don't even wanna say neighborhood, but community concerns on non-residential projects of any size. Can I just add something to this conversation? Um, in addition to the um, uses chart for new um, site development, you would also need to look at the site development permit chart in, in chapter 1311. So um, in that chart, any new construction, non-residential new construction larger than 5,000 square feet requires a conditional site development permit, which means um, public hearing before the zoning administrator. So so for for essentially any construction that's commercial larger than 5,000 square feet, it would receive a public hearing with public notice. And then, that doesn't, oh, go ahead, that doesn't contravene what I just said, so. Um, I, I, so if, um, we are going to touch these issues that um, you're discussing and I, don't think, I mean, everybody sees what we're proposing now. Um, I don't know that if it will go as far as you want, but why don't we get into that discussion? Um, 
um, further once we've gotten through this, if that's all right. That's fine. That okay? I, I can I can come up with an example of logic for each of what I what I am proposing based on my actual experience of what hearings have been used for and and move th move projects along rather than slowing them down. And while I understand staff's intention and the need to simplify things, I think this is a mistake and there'll be more lawsuits and other and people will not be informed and issues will not be looked at. Plain and simple because the community brings up the issues that staff may or may not be aware of or see. Um, if I could interject real quick, Commissioner Lazenby's had her hand up for a few minutes. I want to give her an opportunity. Right. I'm, I'm through and I am content to go through it once by one, but the ability to go through every single use chart in this whole thing, I, my, my proposal is just going to be not to change what comes to the planning, what has in the past come to the planning commission. If we need to go through every single use, that's going to be complicated. But I think big projects need scrutiny by the community at large. And I think that it's just wrong to make it only on appeal, which has cost thousands of dollars and actually obviates against anybody who doesn't have the means, which I don't think any of us want to, uh, you know, contemplate. And I don't, but I think that's essentially what we're doing. I'm saying you, you can have a voice as long as you have plenty of money to spend. Commissioner Shepard, if if I may, I believe that um, you have a list of the types of projects that the, you're particularly interested in going to the Planning Commission. So maybe um, at the end, when Commissioners um, Dan and Violante get through their document, then you can bring those up and we can circle back um, if that would be amenable. Yes, that, that, that's fine, but I, I, I think that... Right. Because we, we work to get a specific list here. I think they're going to address some of this. Let's see, let's go on. And I don't need to pull it over. I'm sure that Judy says something so I want to know. <laughs> Renee, we can't hear you. I think she's deferring to, to Commissioner Lazenby, if oh, I'm okay. not mistaken. Thank you. Thank you. I, I too was concerned about the wording of this, of a lower level of public uh, notice, but then I read again that uh, number A or letter A, a change of use in existing legal structure may be approved with a, with a zoning clearance if all of the following criteria are met. So we don't just take one by one, is this correct that it's supposed to rely on our having all having met all of the criteria? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Wonderful. It seems like, it seems like the other criteria would be kind of a guardrail. Well, I would suggest that the new use have the require have required an equal, not lower level of public notice. I don't. It says both. It says equal or lower level of notice. So you have to meet the standard that that, that the the use the use cannot have required a higher level of approval and and not have it. So if it if it required higher level of review, it must go back for that higher level of review if required. So that's. Is, is, that what you, is that what you mean here? That is what it says there. That's correct. That's what will happen. Unless staff, it, is it not worded that way? It's, it's intended that way. It, it says a, a sort of a negative statement for you're saying the new use would have required an equal or lower level of public notice or hearing than the existing use. Correct. So what you're saying that means is it needs to be heard at the same level as the existing use was heard. It, it, it cannot be approved through this process that staff is proposing unless that's true, is, is what this says. Well, why not say what you just told me instead of what it says? Because it, it does. So it says, so because you have to read A, what A is saying, it must meet these standards. So I through four, the one through four is saying you have to meet these standards in order for A to happen. 
And we added a standard. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm not gonna hold things up. I'm not clear, but I trust you, so, okay. I said, go ahead. I don't, oh. I think you had, if you have to explain what your sentence mean, I'd rather you stated the sentence in a clear way, but if it's clear to everybody but me, then let's go on. Uh, commit, uh, Chair Gordon, are, are there any other hands up? Mm, I don't think so. And I, uh, I think we should be good to move on. Okay. Um, the next item is page 13, um, use permit required by zone chart. This was just a change to for restaurants um, greater than 12 seats to um, require an AUP for all commercial districts. And this was um, just to provide at least some noticing um, when a restaurant is going in, restaurants um, tend to have a lot of neighborhood impacts. And um, so it's just uh, making that small change. Uh, the next items are, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. What does make NA mean? I'm sorry. Oh, so that's the next section. So if, um, I thought if there are no questions on the restaurants. We can we'll move on to the next table. Well, are you on are you on what I'm seeing for restaurants greater than 12 seats and AUP is required for all commercial districts? That's a proposed addition. Oh well, okay. I certainly agree with that. That's what you just said. Yes. Okay, so if there are no questions on that modification, then we can move on to table 1310332, the commercial uses chart. And this is to make consistent with um, what we did in the general plan last week, which is um, removing uh, bars, nightclubs, tasting rooms from the PA district. This is table 131032. Yes, and let me scroll down as much as I can to, there we go. So Commissioner Shepard, NA means that it's not allowed in that district. I don't know if that's specifically what the NA literally means, but yeah, not allowed okay, in so that district. So you, when, you know. Right, so you're right now it says bar nightclub removed from PA, make not allowed. So you want it to say not, what do you mean? So we, right now, according to the staff's proposed use chart, if you look in the either printed or online version, um, it, it's they're allowing it in the zone district when ancillary um, and we're proposing that they just not be allowed in that zone district. So we don't feel that bars and nightclubs are ever appropriate in the professional administrative zone district. Um, we, 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 when we, when I asked staff last week to give, to give examples of when they thought a nightclub would be appropriate in a PA district, I felt that they struggled a little bit to answer the question and I didn't feel that it that it met what we're really trying to achieve, even though we are trying to create um, yeah. walkable um, administrative and professional communities where people can perhaps shop where they work. I don't know that a bar and nightclub is really what we're looking for in a professional administrative zone district. Um, and so bars and nightclubs, um, we feel that there's not, it's similar to the fact that we don't allow um, I'm looking at the use chart here. We don't allow, it looks like dance studios and visitor serving accommodations. If you look at the use chart, it has NA for that as well. So there, there are, it's not uncommon that we have some uses that are just not allowed in certain zones. So we just wouldn't be allowing bars and nightclubs in the professional and administrative zones, nor would we be allowing liquor stores and tasting rooms. Well, but on uh, as far as tasting rooms, there are tasting rooms in the whole area around Swift Street. Is it, that's commercial. I don't see that that's. So that's, that, that's commercial. That's not professional administrative. So professional administrative is designed to be offices, um, often Do like legal. Doctor's offices. Uh, yeah, so uh, realtors, lawyers, um, things like that are often in the professional administrative zone district. Um, so you can have a coffee shop. In other words, you don't want anywhere that alcohol is served. 
that that isn't the intent. It, 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 that's not the. It's more that I don't see a way. That I don't see how a tasting room or a nightclub is appropriate in a professional zoned district. But could you have a coffee shop? I can look to see the if, zoning um, for that. I, I can look. Staff, do you know the answer? I I have that page open. Um, so for eating and drinking, um, there is a separate entry for dining establishment indoor. Um, and it let's see, um, it would be allowed in PA. There you go. So if you have a big office complex, you can have a Starbucks. Or a restaurant. Well, correct. You can also, you can also have like neighborhood retail. Um, you can have lots of things according to this use chart, um, just maybe not nightclubs. I, I certainly agree with you about, I wonder what J Judy and um, Tim think. I, I can't see a bar or nightclub, but I don't see why you couldn't have a place to get a beer or a glass of wine. What do the others think? Commissioner Lazenby, did you want to chime in first? Well, I was, um, I was thinking about the ancillary um, businesses that we had said would be okay in agricultural areas. And I think one of the things that was allowed was a bar, or was it a liquor store? It, well, it is, seems. What, is, what does that have to do with professional offices? Agriculture is a farm. Well, but one of the ancillary um, allowed was a, a medical facility or a sales store of some kind. And then it it added a, another business could be a bar or a liquor store. I can't remember which. And therefore, in agriculture, Commissioner Lazenby. Well, but the the fact that they had a semi professional um, establishment that was allowed, and then also a bar or a liquor store. So I, it's so, somewhat similar to this. I, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to find that that we allowed bars and liquor stores. I know we allowed wineries and breweries in um, agriculture, but uh, Annie, do we um, allow bars on agriculture? No, no, that's correct. We would allow uh, wineries and breweries, but not bars or liquor stores on agriculture zone parcel. I, I I don't know. I don't know if I would agree, and I. Maybe we don't need to spend too much time in this, but I'd like to hear from Tim. If you're in a big, you know, area where there's hospitals and offices and so on, I don't see anything wrong with a place to get a beer or, or a glass of wine. So I don't, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't see why you, that's NA. Maybe not a bar or nightclub, but a tasting room or a brewery tasting room. I think that's fine. So we have. So it seems like there's a, so there's a separate use category for bar or nightclub. And that's a suggesting to be eliminated. Then there's another use category that include, includes brewery, brew pub, winery, and distillery. And, and we're not saying that that would be eliminated, but what a subsection to that is tasting room. And that's what you would want taken away. And that one in particular, I also don't feel like, I understand the intent. Tasting rooms are, in my you know, opinion, fairly, um, Modest, they're not as much, it's not like going to a nightclub, right? It's a little bit more uh, user friendly, a little more appropriate for that kind of, for like a mixed use area. Um, so I think breweries still being allowed, brew pub, winery, distilleries, great. And, you know, I'm fine with the removal of a technical bar. I understand the intent, like, you know, I have an office and if there's a bar next to me, it, which I've had before, it becomes a little challenging at certain times, but it's also one of those things where the hours are different. You know, you're not typically in the office when the bar is really going strong, but you never know. Uh, I work a lot of late hours, so maybe it's just me that noticed it more than others. But um, so anyway, I would be, I'm kind of impartial. I would say, if anything, adding the tasting room back in would could be beneficial for the community, the bar nightclub. Um, yeah, I understand that intent. And I, and since there's still an allowance for brewery and brew pub and winery and distillery, 
I feel like that would kind of solve those things. Is that, that a pretty clear as mud answer, Commissioner Shepard? I guess what I'm asking is would the makers of the motion consider leaving the tasting room option? And I'm definitely I agree of the bar nightclub, but I in the you know in the SoCal area where it's all going to be offices and professional, I, I could see a tasting room. We could put the, I mean like I'm talking with Rachel and Commissioner Dan, I don't know how you feel. We could we could and be open to putting the tasting room back in. My my concern yeah. is it said it had to be ancillary, and I they didn't. I don't know how it could be ancillary to um, since there's not allowed to be that thing. But I, we can put it back in. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm 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 fine with that. Okay. I'll, yeah, just, so right just, I'll just I'll just strike this. Just piece strike there. it. Yeah. It's on. <clears throat> um, okay. Well, um, on this page in the C1 zone, changed to AUP for a big box store, there was my target example. So we're going to, and here it is. Which one are you on, Commissioner Shepard? I'm, I'm on, the, on page 15, retail, is on this, what's on our screen. There, Rachel and Allison are suggesting that in C1 zones, change for a big box store and depart or, or department store, such as they are anymore, would change um, to AUP, which is an it's administrative permit with public notice. Uh, I think a big box store is also is always a big community issue. And there's my target example and my Home Depot examples were directed to that. I don't I think there ought to be public hearings when you've got a something that's above a certain square footage. How does anybody else feel? I mean, I think that there's other triggers in the code that can always bump things up to a different level of review. If I'm not mistaken, staff should weigh in. So, I mean, this is why this is so complicated because, um, you know, I agree with you, um, Commissioner Shepard, um, you know, with your general comments about how helpful uh, public hearings and planning commission hearings can be to both uh, come to resolutions, provide mitigations, and then also, frankly, to save time in the long run for a lot of projects. Um, so, it, you know, I do overarchingly agree with everything you're saying about that. What makes this complicated is that there's so many other factors that are involved in determining what level of review something gets. Um, so I don't know if maybe staff wants to talk about that or tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> Well, I'm specifically talking in this on page 15 retail use chart. I think I'm going to, I don't think we're going to get any more department stores in our lifetimes, but big box stores for sure. I'm not worried about home and gardens, nursery, auto supplies, or office and technology products, but I think big box stores are always big and always have community impacts and need a higher level review. So I would have, I, I don't know, not as good as you or Rachel and Allison. I don't, I I think that ought to stay at a higher level. That, so, got, yeah. that that's that one does should not just have an administrative uh, hearing because it affects the whole community, not people with 300 feet. If I could help maybe Commissioner Shepard sum that up. So you, the AUP is, is being proposed as discretionary permit with public notice. And it sounds like what you're trying to, what you would prefer to see is a CUP, which is discretionary permit with public notice and public hearing. Right. Okay. Specifically for big box stores and department stores, if there ever is one. If, if, if I might, I think um, Commissioner Shepard uh, wanted to see a CUP dash PC, so it went to the Planning Commission um, and uh, was suggesting a 
square footage amount. So might be retail stores over 50,000 square feet, for instance, have a CUP at the PC. Is that correct? Well, you know, we're picking in, yes, I'm not sure what the minimum square footage is because I don't really know how big Home Depot is or the proposed target would be, so. Um, Targets are also, also um, they tend to be 60,000 to 130,000. All right, then 50,000 square feet. Yes, and I think they have big impacts and deserve the full on public. That doesn't mean that people don't want them and they'll pass, but it needs to be looked at carefully. And I gave you my examples of why I think so. And so, yes, I would propose that department and big box stores over 50,000 square feet be subject in which I guess are covered in this particular chart would have um, a, what do you call dash PC hearing level. Commissioner Violante, it is 50,000. Oh, it's five zero. Thank you. I was, yeah. I, I was going to ask for clarification. I was just trying to type, so I caught it in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so I, I think they're really small. <laughs> yeah. I think I that, have, I'm fine with. Go ahead, Judy. I'm sorry. I have a question about when you use the term big box store, do you have a certain square footage that that relates to when yes. you call it a big box store? This we are is, calling it projects over 50,000 square feet. And well, but, store, you know, that is, there is no definition of a big box store except such as. Okay. Yeah, this is why I think Commissioner Shepard thought a, a numerical quantifiable threshold was appropriate. Well, I just thought maybe somewhere there was a list of things, you know, if you say a funeral home and that would be a, an average would be that and then big box store would be something else. But I guess I'm, I guess there is nothing like that. So well, I'm by using this language, you're kind of creating that distinction by, by saying these larger projects have this higher level overview. Okay, thank you. I'm fine with this change. Okay, it, 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 can we consider that a friendly amendment and then then I can accept? Okay. Absolutely. Oh. Okay, um, moving down the list, are there any other um, comments, questions, suggestions? Well, um, this page, unfortunately, in my code book, it's shifted. It's, it's not in there. So page 17, conference facility auditorium event hall needs to be ancillary in the VA and CT zone districts, meaning? Commissioner Shepard, the page numbers may just not match. When I did this, the printed numbers and the online numbers for page numbers don't line up because of the edits. So you might just have to be a little bit off on the page numbers. I apologize. Um, so you should be able to find at least, if, I, well, I hope you have the page somewhere, but, the, but I just want you to know the numbers. The, number, the numbers might just not match for you. Just, this is page 18 of the printed. Yeah, I, know, I, I had to go through them mm -hmm. and, um, and change them. So I apologize. But it, it, yeah, oh, that's fine. I'm just saying for Commissioner Shepard, if you have the printed big binder of the code, it's page 18. Yeah, it, it skips from 13.10, 341 to 346. And then it skips to. Um, it's the same use chart we were just looking at. It's just like the next page. So we're in 1310331-336 at the top of the page is what it says. And that's that we're in the teens of that chart. Okay, well, I don't want to hold everybody up, but could you just explain what um, uh, what means needs to be ancillary? What does ancillary mean again? And what's the V? Can you just say what that means? Needs to be ancillary in VA and CT zone districts. So you can't just put up a conference and auditorium hall in the visitor serving um, zone districts. It would have to be ancillary to a visitor serving or some other use. So it's just, it's just, a, it's a minor change. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's not, it's just that I don't, 
I don't work in planning and I don't always understand what seems so obvious to you. I think you've just explained it. In other words, you were saying it needs to be ancillary, which means it in addition to, I mean, what do you mean? In other words, you can't, can't be alone. You can't develop it just on its own. Like if you have a, a parcel right. owned for visitor serving, like a hotel or something, you can't just put an auditorium there or like a dance hall there without the visitor serving. Okay, so you have to be a visitor serving uh, zoning in order to build an auditorium or event hall. In those two zone districts. Okay, well, what about if you have a restaurant and you want to add an auditorium and have concerts? Or you want to provide a music space? Is that what we're addressing here or not? Like, for example, in Felton, we have a restaurant that is next door. It's a Felton Music Hall that has a big public space where they have musicians. They wouldn't fall under these two categories of zoning. Mm -hmm. They're not visitors, so I doubt, I don't. No, they are. I don't know the zoning of that parcel, but I would, I would, I would wager that they, it is. Not, I know it, I, it, it's not visitor serving accommodation. Com okay, I can't speak yeah. anymore. Or CT. Um, okay, so they would not fall under this category. And then on page twenty, that's the change that we talked about at our last hearing, right? Yeah, that's right. So okay. the change here is just an bring into conformance that we change 75 to 80%. And then not to skip over funeral and burial services, that's a change to increase the level of review. Sorry to have a lot of questions in this section, but what about a company that wants to bury people um, in um, simple shrouds in the forest? Are they included here? No, because the well, zoning isn't in this chart. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this section? Just keep going. No. Okay, that's it. Should I move on? Yes. Yep. Okay. Was that a yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, the next um Okay, so this section is um, about residential and commercial areas, and it's um, adding um, some private open space requirements um, to those uh, residential developments in commercial areas, and it's a little bit different than what we had discussed previously. So if you want to take a, a look at it and we can discuss. I don't have any questions. Should I move on? Okay. Okay. That's the end of that section. Since it's the end 12, of that section. That's, so it's twelve thirty. You might want to. Yeah. Should we check in about? Taking a break yeah. now, or? Well, I think that's a good time. It's right in line with what our goals were. So um, let's make that happen. Maybe we come back. Uh, so usually we're about 30 minutes, six, maybe we make it 110. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Thank you, though. Sounds good. Okay, see you at 110. Thank you. All right. Okay. So I see Commissioner Violante, Commissioner Dan, Commissioner Lazenby. I heard Commissioner Shepard, I think. And I see Chair Gordon. Here. All right. I think we can reconvene. Do we have, I'm guessing policy staff is also with us. <laughs> Chair Gordon, could I ask Stephanie a question? I think so. I think she's here. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think she's back with us yet. Okay. <laughs> we hold off just a few minutes here. Yeah. Until she comes back. Hold on just a moment. I'll I'll try to grab her. Okay. <laughs> We 
Did you know my hard drive failed today? Hmm. That's a bummer. Of course. My car, my car cranked out last week. You know, it's that time of year. Oh no. Well, they say everything goes in threes, so maybe you're in for another one. Oh. Uh, but almost <laughs> done. My, my, yeah. Hi, everybody. Sorry, juggling a little bit. <clears throat> no problem. Um, Stephanie, I asked Chair Gordon if I could ask you a question, which is, uh, when do you think it would be appropriate for me to bring forth the motion that you help me compose, should I continue? Do you think it'd be more useful to go through section by section, wait till the end or? It feels a little bit to me like we should let commissioners Dan and Violante get through their amendments and, and then do it. Um, there is a little bit of overlap, I think on some of these things, but um, in the interest of trying to kind of get th through these proposals, that would be my, my suggestion. Us to do it after. I will take you up on it. And yes, they are already addressing a lot. Because they'll address some of the things. That's right. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. But Cheryl, oh, yeah, let me know when everybody's ready. I, it seems like it, Ms. Hansen, and is everyone on your team ready to go? Okay. We're ready. Thank you. Great. Let's do it. We need to like officially take say we're back on the record and oh yeah good things or anything do we just go into it i think miss drake said we're reconvening but officially we're reconvening and continuing the hearing um for the sustainability plan update we are now continuing through a motion that was started for section uh code section chapter 1310 and um we're hoping to get through that now and when the end is in sight i promise <laughs> <laughs> So the, this next section is regarding um, community events and the level of uh, review for those community events. And this can be found on page 10 and we're in chapter 1310-611. So here, what we're doing is changing the level of review from MUP to CUP. Um, as noted and underlined. So let me scroll down so we can, and these are for community events and fundraisers on private residential or ag property. And so here's the, the meat of that. And so it's really all, it did, all we did here was every time it said uh, MUP, we changed that to a CUP. And um, the reasoning is for a lot of the reasons that Commissioner Shepard has been articulating that a lot of times these things can be worked out pretty well at a public hearing. I agree. Once the neighbors know something's going on, you can get a lot settled. Uh, I agree. I think this is a good change and I support it. Are there um, any other questions on this one? I think we're okay. Okay, I'll move on then. Okay, this is about noticing um, for the same section, and this is just making consistent. I think we discussed this last week about noticing in the rural areas. And so um, this was just saying that the added language, excuse me, is in the event that there are fewer than 10 properties within the 500 feet um, of the boundaries of the subject property, that that distance should be extended in increments of 50 feet until the owners of at least 10 properties have been notified. I think the language that we changed originally said 300 feet. And so we're changing that to 500 feet. To, to, clar to clarify, sorry, Commissioner Dan. No, no, please. So this is actually in order to create consistency with the neighborhood notice, which is above, this is ensuring that those same neighbors are provided the contact uh, person's contact information. Uh, so uh, okay. it's 500 feet for noticing the neighbors that, in, that, 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 that a permit is being 
requested and that the events are happening and in A of the section, but in B of the section, there was no, um, the, the, same, the same language didn't exist that if, that if 10 people weren't reached that they needed to extend that bounds. And so that's, that's what this language does is just creates consistency between A and B. Um, so that those same neighbors have the contact information, hopefully to prevent conflict, so that they have the ability to contact the property owner should they're, you know, have problems with, with noise or barking or something along those lines. So hopefully, hopefully it's just to decrease conflict by any, any consistency in the code. Thank you, Allison. Well, am, am I right in thinking the way you've changed the language before that would involve no A? We can't hear you, Renee. Are you stepping away from your microphone? No, I'm just using a laptop I'm not familiar with. Let's see, just a second, let no. me move the noise level up. Is that better? That's better. Mm -hmm. You kind of cut in and out sometimes. Yeah, I'll just stay four square in front of this ancient, <laughs> this ancient creature. Um, so um, the, if there is, in fact, as you have, uh oh, a public notice, and that will. You mean so the ten people? Sorry, till there are ten properties have been notified by mail, and that would mean that they know about the admin the project and the administrative and the administrative hearing that's going to be held on it. Correct. So no, so so B, so A in the section does what you're talking about, which is it lets them know about the event. Um, but B, but B, the section here says that um, that part of the permit is that they that each property shall have a contact person for that event. Okay. And, and okay. so what we're saying is that the the neighbors should know who that contact person is as part of the permit conditions. Um, and so we're, we're just saying that they not only should they contact 500 feet out, but because some of these rural parcels you might not reach. A large number of people, but sound travels really loudly in some of these rural areas. That you should ensure that if you don't hit 10 separate parcels within 500 feet, you just keep going out until you hit at least 10, 10 parcels. This is actually pretty standard in the county code that it says. I, for I, am, I am not disagreeing with that. I just want to make sure I understand it. I strongly support this. And then the next section is just an added language to um, um, to make it clear that there should be sufficient parking to serve the guests um, for the events. Um, okay, any questions on this one before we move on? I would say that that is the point that it often gets really argued about. So. I think putting it in is very appropriate. Okay. Tim, any questions yep, that you yep, see? Good to go. Thank okay. you. Yep. Um, okay. Commissioner Dan, do you mind if I ask a question? Oh, please. Um, uh, let's see. Since it would require a CUP, then that would sort of imply that it would be subject to the noticing in 1810 for CUPs. Yes. yes. Um, so I, I, I believe that the requirements here are slightly, I guess the idea would be to. Um, I've made the changes in 1810 too to make it consistent. Oh, okay. All right. You already looked at that. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I did, okay. but that's, um, yeah, the next step. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Thank Episode you. Two. <clears throat> um, okay. But thank you for catching that. Can I would like to ask this next section does not apply to cannabis, right? That's its own separate ordinance or code. Cannabis okay. does have its own section of the code for, are you talking for cultivation? Yes. There are there's standards for cultivation. Well, I'm, I meant this next session coming up, 6, 631 through 644 on agricultural processing and so on. Yeah, let's take these each paragraph one at a time because they're about different things. So this, um, Commissioner Violante, do you want to discuss the first, first two? Yes, give me a second. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take your time. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yes. So what we did is we just we 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 struck the code so it because it, it says new agricultural possibility shall be cited to minimize the impacts to offsite residential uses. We just struck the part that said um, shall be that residential uses that shall be located within 200 feet. We think generally that they should just minimize the impacts to offsite residential uses. Um, that that should be um, the objective. So not just those that are closest to the the property. Um, so that was the first change on page uh, 22. And then let me get to page 32 so I can be within that one. Um, page 32. Uh, so 32 is a bigger, are there any questions on page 22 because page 32 is um, more complicated? Not for me. So page 32, do you mind just scrolling down a little bit, Rachel? Yeah. So on page 30, it starts on page 32, it actually keeps going through the next a couple pages, um, has to do with uh, wine, what we talked about earlier, which is wineries, breweries, and distilleries. And there, there is a bit of um, inconsistency on whether or not they were using a standard of within 500 feet or within 200 feet of parcels with residential use. And so... Uh, I would like, we are proposing that they create consistency of using the standard of facilities located on RARR zone parcels or within 500 feet of a property line of a parcel within the residential use when bifurcating the hours of operation, the tasting rooms, indoor events, and small outdoor marketing events. Because in all of those categories right now, they have kind of the, the categories of RA, RR, and then this A distance, it actually differs in each one of those. And then there's another category, which is all other sites. Um, so we'd like them to use that standard for those categories just consistently. Um, and then in the indoor events category, um, we would like them to say that just, it's, a, it's kind of an, an oddity that for some reason they have, it have 9 p.m. for all of their zones there, which is longer than any other indoor event for tasting rooms and things like that. And so we'd like it to be 8 p.m., which is the same as tasting rooms. Um, are there any questions on that? Because I, then we can move on to the next piece, just because that bifurcation piece is a, can be a little confusing. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I, I want... Commissioner Shepard, you went back on mute, so I didn't catch what you said. Um, what does bifurcate mean? Uh, they split. So there's two different standards. So there's a standard for those that are RA, RR, and parcels within 500 feet, and then there's standards for all other. So they have two different standards. So you, you want to change the hours for indoor events from nine to eight. Or sorry, from yes, from nine to eight. Correct. I mean, we're, we're proposing the change for indoor events to not be 9 p.m. as an end oh. time, but 8 p.m. be the time is the end time. That's correct. But um, why? I don't. They're indoors, so because it's consistent with the rest of staff's proposal, because um, the rest of staff's proposal includes things ending at eight p.m. Yeah, but that mostly relates to outdoor events. No, no. So they they have um, the tasting room ends at eight p.m. Um, and in for all other sites, and so we were making it consistent. Uh, I don't care, but seems like. I think what Renee is, so I, I see what, what we were doing was trying to make sense out of what was being proposed. I think Renee is suggesting that for indoor events, we could let them go later. What we were doing is just trying to make them like consistent. <clears throat> but yeah. Is that what you were suggesting, Renee? I don't see why an indoor event couldn't go until nine o'clock. Until nine o'clock. Yeah. I'm okay with that. We could we could do that. It just like I said, the goal was just to make consistency. But we 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 could have we could do that. Um, we can make this not take nine. Oops, not zero. Nine. <laughs> uh, we could make that nine o'clock. Um, and then for when you get down to a large outdoor marketing events, <clears throat> fifty or more guests. And sorry, was there any other questions other than that one? Well, I question about that. Um, what about there's several wedding venues uh, up here where they hold people's weddings, and 
um, but I don't know if they have a commercial use permit. So are wedding venues uh, included here? You said inclusive of weddings. If that's their business, um, I don't understand why they need to be limited to how many they have if that's how they make their living. So, in for and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe for these events, for when we get to the section on events, because we get there in a minute, mm -hmm. that they have to be the primary use for these, because what we're talking about right now is the primary use of wineries and breweries. Um, Not their, their primary source of income has to be right. the, the brewery and the winery. Right. If they are doing weddings and other celebrations, it refers you back to that other section of code. So this is for wineries and breweries that are also hosting weddings. Well, or like a party or a, a release party, maybe, or large marketing like events, it says in the code. Um, well, so. for, for example, well, very close to Highlands Park is a facility that's been there for 30 years. It's owned privately, and they hold weddings and birthday parties and so on. It's outdoors. And they have a barn for indoor affairs, but that's their business. So, are so, we, so that that would so that's not part of, that, that's not part of this code. This is specific to wineries and breweries. Okay, thank you. So, so we're talking about wineries and breweries that have that we're allowing them to have events, kind of ancillary to their their brewery and winery income generating component. Then how the does then why are we restricting small ones to ten? Are we penalizing them because they're not big? I don't. Because they're allowed on our, so small ones are allowed on RA and RR zone parcels, which are residential in nature. And we don't think that they should be having these large events. Well, wait a minute. Up in the Santa Cruz mountains, there's a good handful of small wineries that are open by appointment. <clears throat> so we're not worried about that. Um, they don't usually, but they do open for the wine passport, but that's not an event. People come and go. So when would this apply? So this is consistent. The 10 for small wineries and breweries, we did not propose changes for. That's that's okay. consistent with staff's recommendation. Well, the what was it, was it before staff's recommendation? How has it been for the last X years? I believe, and staff can tell me, Stephanie, you can answer this better than me, but I believe that there weren't regulations around these large events, which is part of why we're doing this this code modernization that is now part of the sustainability update is because there were not regulations. That's the right. A lot of these types of uses were not regulated. There were a lot of complaints. So we kind of retracted, you know, uh, kind of what? stepped back to look at how we were regulating them. And that's what you're seeing before you now. So this is for um, small wineries and breweries. If they have more than 50 guests, then they're limited to 10? If if it's a brewery and a winery, they would be limited, again, through staff's proposal that, and, and we're concurring for small wineries and breweries. Again, this is on residentially zoned parcels. So uh, that, 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 that for them. But, but so, it says large outdoor marketing events of more than 50 guests. So what if you were having 10 people? Then they would not fall under this category. Okay. So large events, for... they're, they're allowed to have smaller events and indoor events that doesn't fall in. This is, we're not making any changes to staff's proposal for small outdoor events. We're These are in. for large events, more than 50 guests, guests outdoors. Um, so, and then also a lot of these, if they're outdoors, they're going to happen between the months of May and October. And so that you can't think of it as where you can't, you, it's not helpful to think of it 365 days a year. It's more like during the warmer months. So if you think about 10 outdoor events of 50 more guests, um, that's why I, I think 10 is uh, a good number. Well, <clears throat> I live not too far from Hallcrest Vineyards. They in the summer like to have music and invite people to come and taste or just come to hear the music. This would apply to them. Um, and they might have 50 for an hour and then it'll go to 10 and then it will get big. I don't know, would this apply to them? Or is there gonna be some, they, they just know that they have to cut off if more than 50 people show off. Are they considered small or large? It's just, I don't know. Me neither. So what about a winery that is open to the public 
and has a musical event? Yeah, maybe better able to answer because if it's a tasting event, they may fall under the tasting staff. Uh, they may be able to speak to that. Yes. So, um, so for there is a music is addressed uh, separately in the in the in the chart just because we know that can impact neighbors. So, um, acoustic music is permitted during outdoor events. If you have amplified music, then we would look at that and sort of look at any site specific conditions, including proximity to noise sensitive uses and we may require an acoustic study or other information to make sure it complies with the noise standards in the code. I, I do understand that. I think their music has been acoustic, but they're already open and people are invited like they had a, if they had a fundraiser as they did a few, last month for Ukraine, they would get more than 50 guests. The music is acoustical. Are they and how do you know if you're a large? In other words, it's one thing to have an event where you invite people and a lot of people show up. But what if you are a winery or a brewery and you did people come and go all day? That wouldn't be an event then, right? I mean, what cons I'm I'm sorry to split hairs, but if you announce here's the schedule of acoustic acoustical musicians groups that we're going to have this summer every Sunday from 11 till three, uh, please join us and enjoy a glass of wine, which is what's going on. That's that's still permitted, is it not? Or does it fall under this? Murphy? Yeah, I guess I'm looking to staff to <clears throat> see what they think. I understand. I am too. <laughs> I'm yes, hoping I mean, Annie can help with this. <laughs> so we the code does does also specify the maximum number of guests at events. I mean, I would think that if they had music and they sent a notice like, please come join us for music, and there were guests there, that would be considered an event. Well, and we did just... Oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna say, we did um, spend a lot of time with local winery and brewery owners developing these standards. So they were comfortable with the way they were crafted in terms of being supportive of their needs for marketing. And so, so. Um, All right, well, if you yeah. feel like you have met with the wineries and breweries and they're good with it, then I am far be it for me to question if you really feel that this is a, this regulation has the cons had a lot of input from small wineries locally of which we have a great many and it's a thriving, growing business. And I wouldn't want to, but, but if you're feeling, if you feel confident that this had a had a good look at by the industry involved, wineries and breweries, I'm okay with. Yes, I think we probably met at least five times with wineries and then we had a series of community meetings as well where we took them out to the community in different parts of the county, sort of pre uh, Zoom meeting days <laughs> to get feedback from the community as well. All right. Well, then I'm not going to stick on it if you feel like this was something that is supported by them. So let's go on. Well, can I can I ask really quick just to be clear on that point? The proposed part here has not been coordinated with any wineries or breweries. This Correct. is a change to what was proposed. Correct. Yeah, I have. I this is the first time I've seen these proposed changes. Okay. And so the proposed, or excuse me, the current changes are hours of eleven to nine. And that's changing from 11 to 8. And then the number is changing, right? Um, um, 10 is the same on small wineries and breweries. Medium was 16 and large allowed 20 events. And so we're reducing the number of events and the number of hours. Is, am I capturing all those things correctly? Yes, <clears throat> we were doing it. Too. Yes, that's correct. For large, so large events is the main change. Large is going from 20 events per year to 15. <clears throat> Can I ask a question regarding that? Um, we do have provisions for the large outdoor marketing events currently in the chart, which I think the wineries felt were important. Um, additional large marketing events may be considered with a conditional use permit. So there's currently provision that you know, says if, if there's a need for additional, you know, 
That's right. That's beyond the number specified. You can go for it. That's right. Thank you, Annie. That's important. That what you're proposing would stay. Yes. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Right, Allison? Yeah. Yes, we can be more explicit yeah. about that. We can add that language in to be more explicit. If, yeah, ask? that's helpful. I, I think that because I do think that's important that, that you they there is another there's another path <laughs> that they mm -hmm. want to have right. more events. Okay. This is the path. <laughs> And you're making, sorry, just to really clarify this yeah, now. Sure. So large events are, are are 15, medium would remain at 16, and small would remain at 10. Yeah, I, I don't believe we're proposing any changes to, to the small and medium. Yeah, okay. But And then what's the reasoning behind the, like, I mean, it sounded like for consistency, but you know, for the hours going till 9 p.m. seems, especially in the summer months when it's, you know, light till really late, like almost 10, what, you know, I I would say that that feels a little bit, possibly a little restrictive for some wineries and places that maybe would want and expected to have this stay open till nine. Um, um, I can um, see that. I think that the thinking was these in part of, um, where I think I, I was coming from and Commissioner Vialanti is that again these are the <clears throat> these are the issues that generate probably the most voluminous um, complaints from neighborhoods are events from commercial um, activities and in the mountain areas a lot of the commercial activity are wineries um, so I mean I, I guess I I'm I hear what you're saying though and I'm flexible. Um, with that to a certain extent, um, but that's that's where it was generated from is basically because, and I think Annie mentioned this too, we get a lot of complaints. I think as long as we are carefully stating what's going to be permitted, and this is more specific, I would agree. I think we should allow the events to go to nine in the summer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't almost get dark till then. I would be in favor of nine o'clock if you are both amenable to it um, also. But. Especially if that's what the wine owners and brewery owners were given uh, to expect um, at this. Anyway, I support nine. Allison, what do you think about that? I mean, I agree with you. We were doing it to, to reduce conflict, um, but I, I see Commissioner uh, Chair Gordon's point that it does stay a light rather late into the evening, especially since most of these events do happen in the summer months. So I could, I could be open to the idea of changing it to nine o'clock if, if you are. I mean, yeah, I am. Let's, okay. yeah, let's make that change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't have any other questions on that, on that section. Okay. Let me just accept you. Um, are there any other questions about the winery and brewery section of, of our changes? No, you just answered all of mine. Okay. The next section uh, that we have some proposed changes are in has to do, we're skipping ahead to 1310-640, um, which has to do with um, some of the code changes that were made around agriculture and uh, we're very in favor of the idea of allowing um, modernized sense of agricultural uses, but we were concerned about the size of some of the proposed uh, new pieces of the code. So in temporary produce areas, uh, the proposal was that it should be 1,600 square feet, and we just felt that this was a rather large, I think that's bigger than a lot of the homes from Santa Cruz County. Uh, and so we were proposing this smaller 800 square feet seems big enough for these temporary produce areas. Um, and then produce markets, similarly, we felt that 1,800 square feet seemed big enough to have these produce markets that, to both support the agricultural community and their, their needs and desires to have um, these uh, produce stands and be able to sell the wonderful agricultural products and produce that comes out of our area. Uh, but they just seemed, I mean, again, 3,600 square feet is quite large. It's larger than a lot of well, does like, this mean you mean like a roadside stand? Is that that it's that would be a temporary produce area, and a produce market would be a permanent 
market, right? So a produce market is designed defined back in, in we'll get in, in 1310-700 is a structure for ancillary sales area cumulative. Um, and we change this later um, to, to define the produce area that we define here as 1800 square feet. Uh, accessory to an on-site agricultural production used to sell unprocessed fruits, vegetables, nuts, and other agricultural commodities produced on the site, along with limited processed foods and non-food items. And then it references actually back to this section of code. Um, temporary sales produce areas are structures of areas up to, and again, we're proposing this change of a smaller um, square footage, um, including any outside display area up to 90 days a year consecutively um, <clears throat> or longer if they get an AUP that is accessory uh, to an on-site agricultural operations and is used to sell only raw, unproduced, um, processed fruits, vegetables, nuts, cut flowers, and other unprocessed agricultural commodities grown on site. Um, and then actually, I think similarly, we, we probably need to change produce stands to be um, down to 800 square feet. I think I missed making that correction as well. Um, um, uh, where did staff get its get the bigger sizes? and? What's what is the issue here? Um, um, temporary produce areas, just so I'm clear, is when someone has a roadside mm -hmm. stand where they're selling their produce because they have a lot of it, like like the strawberry place. What's the difference between a temporary produce sales area is just 90 days a year, and a produce market is permanent? They also have the ability to sell different things and Annie I'm sure can talk to this, but they, so they can only sell, and we talked about this last um, planning commission meeting last week about the fact that um, the, the smaller markets are only able to sell things that were grown on site and were unprocessed. And then markets are able to sell uh, processed things. And Annie is gonna have to help me because um, there was an inconsistency last time and I didn't actually fix this document to make sure that I assume any you're just going to make that change when it goes to the board since I didn't I didn't put it in here um yes so so let's see um there are three types of produce sales uh areas that we're discussing one is the um temporary produce sales area um the second is a produce stand which you know can be there year round and the third is a produce market which is a building, so produce markets would only be allowed on on A, not C A. Um, and the let's see, the produce um, uh, sales area would be able to um, include um, products that are produced on the farm, such as jams or dried fruit, that sort of thing. So that would be um, allowed, which is, I believe that's in 1310700 um, already. I, I did have a question, which is um, the, the produce stands and produce um, sales area do require parking. Um, so the size areas that you're proposing, would that be not, because I, I believe that if it included parking, it may be difficult to accommodate both the parking required as well as the sales areas. So would those areas be not include the parking required? I don't believe the definition includes the parking area, does it? I mean, um, I, I read the definition, I, I didn't. Yeah, that, that could be, I, I yeah. When, when um, I read the definition and that nothing in it, but to the tell, you know, correct. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that it was intended to be exclusive, exclusive of the parking requirements. So, so this is only that's in how I read it. Okay. If you're asking, I mean, yeah, I didn't think that we were including parking. Okay. Okay. And we're only talking about in ag ag zones here. What zones does this apply to? I lost my it, case. It applies to commercial agriculture and agricultural. So yes, just the commercial, I mean, the agricultural zone district, C, A, and A. Do we actually have any of these in Santa Cruz? Produce stamps? We have lots of um, unpermitted ones. <laughs> so you mean, let's say, you know, you see where people set up on the side of the road and they sell some fruit and or flowers or whatever. So this would govern them uh, obviously, they don't have a permit, and they come and go. And I doubt we'd be able to regulate them any more than we do. So you don't mean those people because they don't have any permits. 
and and you on a produce market that if they're if they're in the agricultural zone, this applies to them. If they have a year-round market, like we have a few that are just sell produce, this is not what we're talking about. Correct. This is only. Um, so the produce, so so the idea here is not necessarily to require a permit but to clarify what the standards are. So um, produce sales areas and produce stands are permitted by right as an ancillary use to the um, to the farming operation. So so these provide standards, but a permit isn't necessarily required. It just clarifies what the standards are for these uses. Okay. So this is a new requirement that we're adding to just regulate more. And yes, we're we're you know we heard a lot from the farming community, a lot, especially like smaller organic farms that they really need to have these um, be able to market the produce on site in order to be successful and remain viable. So the idea is to um, you know support these ancillary uses and um, to support our local small farms while having standards that protect ag land and, and you know, uh, address any impacts to adjacent properties, and that sort of thing. Annie, when I look at 1310, um, 640E, which is the produce stand section, I don't see anything in here that defines the square footage for the produce stands. I see it in the definitions, but unlike produce markets and temporary produce sales area, I don't see anything in 640 that actually defines the square footage. If you find it, can you tell me? Because I will add it to this document to correct it, but I, I don't see square footage actually in 640. I only see it in 700 in the definition. That could be. I don't. Um, I'd have to look and see whether it's also included in these in this section. We could certainly add it to it um, if it's not there. Because I just want to make sure our motion includes amending that square footage as well, and I realize it's not there. I'm just jumping around between sections. Let me get back to that. Okay. And you were asking about the produce stand, the square footage for produce stands, correct? Right? Is this just so I understand the process has happened? Has this been something that planning has discussed with farmers as well and um, kind of sold the 1600 and 3600? Yes, we did. Um, I don't remember exactly how that specific square footage was arrived at, but we met multiple times with the um, um, Farm Bureau, with APAC, with the farming community, and um, tried to develop standards that were supportive of you know farming needs. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't Go ahead, that. Commissioner Dan. And let me say, I think that if you were thinking that the 1600 and 3600 would be inclusive of parking that would make a difference, but that's not how I saw it. So um, my, so the intent here is that I did not think that 800 feet would be inclusive of parking that would be required for this use. Yeah, thank you. I didn't, I didn't read that either. Um, I just, you know, to be honest, my only thought is like, I'm not a farmer. I don't know what I need or what these people need. And there's been a lot of research and it sounds like conversation going into those square footages. And so I don't, I don't feel like I have the grounds to change them or argue with them because I'm not as informed, but maybe you both are and you have a reason to make them lower. But I, I don't know if we've sold this to the all these groups and that's been the discussion. It just feels like if that's what they need, I, I personally can, you know, I, I couldn't make findings to reduce it. That's all. Yes, and I, I honestly don't have enough sense of what the needs are myself to, um, you know, weigh in on whether that seems like it would meet the needs of the farmers. I, I do know that, you know, that we did work on these standards with the farming community. But. It does seem like floor area is specific to the market area because parking is addressed further down in the section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Mm -hmm. I think part of the reason to reduce the size is, again, to ensure that the CA and A zones don't become something other than farming. Um, so it's it's kind of speaks to ag protection. Um, 
the only time I can think of, though, or this might be a problem, and just let me run it by you. What if someone has a pumpkin field? Are they going to be limited by this when they need to spread out, sell all their pumpkins? I don't think that this would apply to that. Okay. Staff can correct me. I mean, I would think that the pumpkins would be part of the growing area rather than a than a brick and mortar sales area. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So just to now that we're in it, let's finish digging in a little bit. So this is the applies to one of these per site is I think how it's described. Is that correct? And what is that defined as? I mean, if someone has, you know, a thousand acres, I could see them needing 3,600 square feet or more, but does this mean that they need 1,800 square feet on multiple parcels now, as opposed to one bigger one on a single parcel? And then the flip side is if you only have one acre, you know, and you're taking 3,600 square feet, which you probably wouldn't need, um, you know, is that is that considered too much? You know, that's almost 10% of a site, of an acre site. Um, so I don't know, you know, just some food for thought and like, how is this going to actually be applied? Well, to the second situation, I mean, there is language that says at least 75% of the gross site area is devoted to agricultural production. So, well, I mean, one, there are, I don't know that we have any, well, it's not sure we do have some small one acre parcels, but most, I mean, CA zone parcels have to be a minimum of, Annie, is it 20 or 10? I'm sorry? The minimum size for CA zone parcels, is it 20 or 10? Um, let's see, it depends on the type ag soil. For type one, it's 10, and for type type one and three, it's 10, I believe, and for type two, it's 20. So, I mean, the, for the CA zone parcels, they're predominantly larger. There are some small parcels that got like, when we did rezoning, but there is a requirement that at least 75% of it is dedicated to agricultural production. Um, so the 3,600 square feet in particular is less than 1% of that project already. Well, you know, we could always do something like stop this and say, if, you know, larger, like we did on the other one, that if you want larger square feet, then you can uh, maybe permitted with, you know, a review or something, since we don't obviously are on feeling totally solid that we know what we're looking at. Why don't we leave that option open on a case by case basis? Someone has to come in and say, I need a thousand square feet instead of 800. And here's why. And then they could get permission. If they have a good reason. I'd be in favor of that. I believe that the code um, provides a path for that. Am I correct? If not, I think we could see any. Does it have an option if they want um, to go bigger? Okay, let's see here. <laughs> I mean, we just did it in the section we finished about wineries. If you want to have more events, then you have to, you know, it's possible, but you have to get whatever we said. I, I can't see the screen anymore. I'm just navigating to that part in the chart here. Yeah, it just says P, ancillary for produce stands. It says CUPA for produce markets. Um, I think it could be an administrative permit if they need more space, but I think we ought to leave them an avenue toward asking for it. Just as and I, I think it should go in the regulation and say that because otherwise people think this is the rule and they're screwed. And then that refers you back to the code. Well, we could just add some language right now indicating that, and then if it's redundant, if it exists already in the code, then you know, no. Uh, oh, yeah. So I'm sorry. I am at the code. It's um, it doesn't have a provision for larger. It just um, the code reads, produce sales are temporary and produce stands, um, limit of 1,600 square feet, and it's provided in the chart. So we could add a line, if if you're proposing 800 square feet, it could say something like larger than 800 square feet, a MUP. Um, 
possibly. Yes, since they're all yes, that would be appropriate. Annie, since they're all principally permitted uses on the zone, could we say if larger than principally permitted size, something along, like, could that be our direction? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Since since these uses are all principally permitted in these zones, as long as they're ancillary, could mm -hmm. our direction be something along the lines if, like, if larger than principally permitted, then, ex, you know, AUP, I mean, could we, could that be our direction? Would that be appropriate? Yes. I'm trying yes, to figure out language, just, I, I'm trying to figure out language to put in the document. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was just thinking if um, the, the um, we might want to have a separate line for produce sales area and produce stands if the size limits are different. One for produce sales area. And I believe that's where you're proposing 800 square feet. So it could be, you know, up to 800 square feet, principally permitted, larger than 800 would be an MUP. And then the produce stand. Um, I don't remember the size limits. Oh, it's right here. Produce. 1800. Okay. Yeah, that sounds yeah. good. Okay. And, and an MUP, I think, is appropriate. Okay. Like that, all of them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we'll let you change the chart later. Okay. Yes, I can do that. That that, um, that makes sense to you, Annie. Yes. Okay. So if you okay. look at it tomorrow, you'll know. Yes, I'm, I'm taking notes too. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you for helping us work that through. You're welcome. Are there any other questions on, on this section? Okay, we'll move on. Okay. Um, the next item is um, regarding bed and breakfast and farm stays, and it's just adding in A zones to this language. And um, otherwise, the language is unchanged. Questions on my end. Yeah, I no, have you, said, you said no questions or questions. No questions. No questions. Commissioner Dan, have. it's at thirteen ten six four one. I think we're missing a one. Uh oh. Okay. Sorry. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I apologize. <laughs> All the little. Oops. Oh, <laughs> we both did it. We know, we know how hard it is. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, I think I, I cut Commissioner Lazenby off. Sorry. Oh, I have no other questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then um, this next section is um, adding a definition. Wait a minute. If you don't mind, you are going over. Uh, the animal regulations. Oh, okay, we can stop now and talk about animals. Sure. Okay, now I am no longer in a position to show the current state of the animal regulations. Is there any way you can show it? The chart? Me? Um, okay, I'll have to stop. Sure. For someone else. Why doesn't, why don't I? So procedurally here, do you want us to just, because if I stop sharing, we'll have to come back to this. Okay. Let me see how I can do without doing anything, without interrupting your flow. So Stephanie, if I am correct, uh, for large animals, we made the changes that I recommended or made a motion about, they're incorporated now for large animals, correct? Right, we incorporated the changes previously done. The new changes are related to small animals and table. Yes, I, I had, yes, this is table 10 point, oh, sorry, 13.10, source 645 1, which requirements for small animals. I, this is a very minor change, so you don't need to, I can read it. The maximum density of noisy, noisy small birds, roosters, peacocks, guinea fowl, tom turkey, or similar noisy fowl. I, I want to suggest it be changed from four per acre to four per parcel. I should have said that in the first place. And the reason is that people keep those, keep those animals together. 
So if you have five acres, you're gonna gonna put four here and four in your second acre and four in your third, you're gonna have an enclosure for them. So I meant originally, and I still mean four roosters is plenty. So and I'm suggesting that under on RA specifically and PF, which is this applies to, uh, it be changed to four per parcel. They are currently and will remain un, not allowed on our R or R1. That's roosters. And I'll just say the proposed one acre minimum parcel size is also still in there. So you have to have an acre to do to do these noisy fowl. And in, in, um in and then you can have four per for per parcel. And I think four is very generous, frankly. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Right. I can't imagine <clears throat> having four roosters, four peacocks. What were the other ones? <laughs> Tom turkeys, guinea fowl. Guinea fowl, that's right. Great. So, okay. No, yeah, we want it to be four per parcel. I'm working on it. <laughs> because it's about. <laughs> and Commissioner Violante, um, also minor, a little change that goes with it. Instead of maximum density, we just put maximum number. I'm literally pulling from the online code. I, I literally copied and pasted from what you have online. Right. Yeah. This change would go along with it to say maximum number as opposed to density. Okay. I think it's a lot clearer if it says number, then everybody knows exactly where they are. No density bonuses for roosters. <laughs> In your dream. <laughs> mm hmm. And in RRR1, it's not allowed. So if that's a friendly amendment, I would accept that. I would, I'd accept that. Okay, that, that's it. Because the other changes I recommended are already part of the language for large animals, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, anything else on animals, Commissioner Shepard? No, fortunately, we took care of that earlier, um, and there's been some clarification with what we changed, so uh, I, I'm good with it. Okay. Anybody else have other questions? No, thank you. All right, I'll move on then to the end of this. Um, so the next item is adding a definition for hoop house. Any questions on that? Commissioner Dan, I feel like there was a definition for hoop house. There's not. You guys have it. You say in, within embedded within the definition of greenhouses, you make reference to hoop houses, but okay. there's not a definition for hoop houses. This is pulled straight from another place in county code where you literally define hoop houses this way. So that's where it's pulled from. We didn't make this. Okay, up. thank you. So, um, agricultural shade structure is an official definition now because the hoop house, you know, is actually a growing structure. It isn't just a shade, it's not a temporary shade structure. It can be, but basically, that's the way most berries are grown permanently. So, yeah. Mm. All right, everybody who needs to know knows what it is. So, Any questions on this part? No. Okay. We're up to 700 now. Yeah. And, and so and if we're done with this section, there's one change in chapter 1311 that we're proposing. And this, um, Commissioner Shepard speaks to some of the issues you brought up about what items should be heard at the Planning Commission. And in this section, um, it goes over. Um, 
it goes over that. And so what we are proposing is that um, we just add that for any project over 25 units, that that goes straight to the Planning Commission. Um, just a second. These are residential units, correct? Yes, yeah. I hope I got the page in code section correct. Yeah, it looks like it, yeah. Uh, can you can you move your um, your screen to that? Uh, yeah, I'd have to find out which one of these up here. Um, if you actually, okay, let me see. I can share my screen if that's helpful. For yeah, you. go ahead. Why don't you share your screen for, and we can take a look at that chart, and then we can just circle back to this when we want to take action. So thirteen eleven oh three seven. Insane. Page page nine, third, yeah. Page nine of the online. Form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. You all see that? <clears throat> uh, it's pretty small. Yeah. Can you make it bigger? Yeah. Thanks. That's good. So as proposed, you know, and this speaks to what Commissioner Shepard was talking about, as proposed, um, you know, I understand what, you know, staff is trying to lower the levels of, of review. From my perspective, this represents a, a really substantial change. And so what we proposed kind of as a middle ground is um, to, for large projects, residential projects, um, that they go to the Planning Commission. Well, right now, before these changes are proposed, residential projects, <laughs> including attached or detached single family, dwelling groups, multifamily, mobile home parks, of five units or greater come to the Planning Commission. And you're proposing to change it to 25? Um, because I... She's in the so, existing residential use chart. Because I'm I'm looking at this residential use chart here. More than 10 units is a CSP, which is a zoning administrator. Mm -hmm. So I'm suggesting that 25 units or more should be a CSP PC planning commission. Um I am confused because I what I just read you was my understanding. Right. What Commissioner okay. Shepard is saying is that that's what it is before this change. That's what it is currently. Is that correct, okay. Commissioner Shepard? And that not in, in that, like if we applied, oh, we applied yeah, for something like yeah. six months okay. ago, that's what it would be. I get it. Six months so from now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're, yeah. Okay. So I'm kind of in the middle then. <laughs> yeah. Also, just to clarify, there's the use charts and then there's the site development charts. So we're going to a two permit system now. Um, one is a permit approval in the use charts that we've uh, previously reviewed and uh, Commissioner Shepard, that's what you and I were talking about. This is when you're actually breaking ground and you have a site development um, permit as well. And between the two permits, and this is the way the code works all around, if you have a code process that requires you to go to a higher level, everything kind of goes together to that higher level. So um, Commissioner Shepard, but uh, you were looking at um, the old use chart that said, you know, greater than five units went to the planning commission. And, um, and when you're actually developing these, now you have a little bit more of a breakdown here in terms of um, the, the process. Well, I'm not sure I'm following all of you, but I was, I think 25 units, we have, we, we're going to have a lot more of them, obviously, because we're going to be building more housing. So I think definitely those should go to the planning commission just to get the larger community and deal with all the issues that comes along with them. But I think I feel strongly that having been on the planning commission for a long time, I think we serve 
a very vital role, role to give the community access to projects that affects them. So, and we have often, and staff has often heard uh, input from the community, which is very useful and helpful and has resulted with developers ending up with projects that are much more buildable. Um, so I, I was going to suggest that we keep the language that says residential projects uh, of five units or greater continue to go to the planning commission. I understand that on the whole, I'm not quite understanding this particular chart I'm looking at now, that they'll be appealable, but that that isn't a good answer for me because that means that you have to have probably two to four thousand dollars to appeal a zoning administrator hearing, and that's a lot of money. And I think the system works. I I honestly do not feel that just because something's zoned that it should be. I, I understand the simplification is based on the idea that if the zoning is appropriate, it should just go ahead. But I think that Santa Cruz is a place. Uh, that has a lot of community interest in what happens. And the Planning Commission has been very successful agency to hear uh, community concerns. And we've made a lot of changes to projects that ended up with there being very little controversy about them when they get built. Uh, and I don't see pushing all this on staff. You're going to have to have three zoning commissioners. So I don't think that you're going to save that much staff time uh, or money for that matter. So I don't think the change uh, to eliminate the planning commission is either viable or necessary. So I don't agree with 25 units and I want to go for five, which it was, which is in other words, as we have performed, I realize that we're having long hearings on this, but generally speaking, it's not a great burden. Our meetings are largely half a day and I think we do a good job. And I think it's a vital community process in Santa Cruz, which is a rapidly changing and um, community now, we want to have buy-in from the whole community. And I want to hear the voices of people who's, who, who these things affect. And I think if you, and again, I, I just think this is going to cause a huge burden on the zoning administrator. So that's what I, uh, so I, I, th I think we ought to reduce the number. So in you, and so what I'm hearing, just so I can reflect back, what I think I'm hearing is Commissioner Shepard is that you, are suggesting that we consider retaining the um, what's 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 currently the language. Exactly. Okay. And so, I mean, I'll just say I'm not inherently opposed to that by any means. I guess I'm in in um, making this suggestion. I was trying to, you know, reflect what I was reading in the code that staff was you know, driving towards and, um, and, you know, and which I understand what it is, is to, you know, try to make things a little bit more streamlined and um, have less PC hearings. Um, though I do agree in large part with what you're saying. Um, one, and so I'd like to hear from other commissioners and then I might have an idea of how to move this forward. So, but I'd like to hear what other commissioners think. I'll let Commissioner Violante or Lazenby go ahead if you'd like. Okay, well, um, I I agree with you, Commissioner Shepard. To a certain extent, I'm I, I'm a little bit confused here by the just when it says one to two units, but that could be one to two houses or <clears throat> excuse me or one to two smaller units. But I think keeping things similar to what they are now has a lot of merit in it because if you come to the planning commission and you don't like the decision, it's a great expense to go on to the board of supervisors if you can. And it's much, but it would be much more if you came in from the zoning administrator then came up to the planning commission and then still was dissatisfied and went on to the board of supervisors. So maybe what we have now is workable. I, and I, go ahead. No, go ahead, finish, I'm sorry. But I, I agree that it's it doesn't seem to overburden the planning commission, except 
you know, in projects like this, which take years, it, that's, uh, you know, that's an extra added burden, but that's not what we do every day or every month. I, I could be very happy never hearing another cell tower appeal. <laughs> well, and, I, and I'm hoping the new cell tower ordinance will, will X the planning commission out because we don't do anything useful in those. But I think in the other work we do, we are very useful. I don't think we're overburdened. I think it's very expensive. It's you could say, well, everybody can appeal everything from the ZA, but I, I think this is very discriminatory uh, on income, and I don't think it's appropriate. And I, I think people will not be satisfied with this. It just cuts off the public voice. Uh, Mr. Vilante, did you have anything to add? I'd like to hear your thoughts, Chair Gordon, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can see both sides of it. And um, from the perspective of the planning department, I feel that it is important to streamline a little more and, and help projects move a little faster and ultimately reduce costs for projects. I think that's a big uh, factor in today's market with getting anything completed, um, timing and, and of course cost. And you know, the cost of the planning commission hearing is cost projects more than a ZA. And so I see it from the project side that it'd be a benefit. Um, I like the idea of it moving a little faster. And then I, you know, I, I'm, I, from what I understand, the ZA hearing would still have public notice. It just wouldn't have us. Right? It's the same thing. It's just that we're not there. And so we're not, you know, limiting the public's ability to participate from what I understand. And correct me if I'm wrong on that, but. I think I, this would eliminate a great deal of what we hear now would now fall on the zoning administrator. So I'm not so sure about all the SAP time would be saved because you need another zoning administrator. So I, I, I mean, to me, a lot of what we hear are these divisions where people are going to build, you know, more than five units. And I think they, you know, I'm going to repeat myself. I don't think this is wise. I think there's a whole lot of streaming. We're spending, you know, hours on it. And there are really good ideas here. I really support a great deal of the streamlining, but not this. I think the planning commission serves a vital role and I don't, think it makes sense to reduce what the really pu important public voice we have in a very disparate community that needs place to uh, voice their concerns um, be before I, you know, uh, a board of their peers, frankly. I, I do agree with those points. And I, I, I was thinking also in reading through this chart that one result probably would be that we would hear more appeals at the planning commission um, because in the end um, for these types of projects, there is a lot of interest. And so I, I do think that that would be one of the consequences though I do respect what staff is trying to do here and was trying to kind of um, create a, a, a middle ground. Um, so, it, so I, I have an idea of maybe something we can do, but oh, I see Annie's hand is up. So I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, that's okay. Do you mind if I just, um, I just wanted to point out one big difference here from current, um, the existing chart versus what we're proposing here is not even so much the hearing body. Like I agree, you know, a public hearing, whether it's the planning commission or the, or the ZA is a similar process, but the big difference I think is that three to 10 units is an administrative permit and then more than 10 is a public hearing. Right now it's more than five. And I think that's an important difference to point out because we do hear from a lot of developers where, you know, once you get to that public hearing, it adds so much to the time and the cost and some developers just choose not to develop here and we need housing so desperately. So I would hate to see us making a change like that that would discourage people from wanting to develop in our county. So I 100% agree with that. I understand that concern, but I have to say that you're dismissing, well, they're still going to hurt at the planning commission. It's a big difference to hurt before a planning apartment official and in the planning uh, the planning commission, which are people from the community. It, 
we have a different perspective and we're more representative of the community at large. That's why we have a planning commission. So, I mean, to say, well, it doesn't really matter, they're gonna get heard by the ZA, then what do you need a planning commission for? I mean, a planning commission's really important for the community exactly because we are gonna grow a lot. Yes. And people should buy into it and feel like they're heard. And I just think this expense of getting people uh, right now, we know if anything happens in the houses along the beach at Rio Del Mar, it's a given that it's going to get appealed because they all have the money. But people in Live Oak and the San Lorenzo Valley and a lot of places might not have $4,000 to appeal it. Well, in the yeah. interest of finding a compromise, um, I, I think Commissioner Dan was about to propose something. She'd, she'd started to say she had a proposal um, and, I, and I trust in her experience on this commission to know that she probably has something we all might be willing to think about. So at least, because um, I know we still have other things. Um, so I'd like to hear what Commissioner Dan was about to propose because um, usually we we all, I don't know, I'd, I'd be interested in what she's going to propose. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know, I think you're giving me a little bit too much credit here. <laughs> Not that genius, really, but um, so because I think there's merit to what Commissioner Shepard is saying, yet I think that the direction that staff is going in also has merit. And especially Annie, I really appreciate you pointing out that three to 10 unit with an ASP, I think is, is really important there. Um, why I would propose that we send both options to the board. Well, if this motion passes, that is that um, we send what what we have proposed in our motion, but then also note that we also want the board to consider um, keeping the levels of review that are in the current plan and outline the reasons that Commissioner Shepard has just put forth. What is what is what you are proposing? So my proposing, my, what I'm proposing basically is to give the Board of Supervisors both no, options. No. Basically what I'm is, proposing to punt is what I'm doing. Uh, I don't think <laughs> that, I think that's a very weak position and will basically get ignored. I don't agree. You've, we've made a proposal. I, I just, I, what, what Tim has up on the screen now is not what your proposal is, right? What Tim has up is what the staff proposed. This is okay. like. Can we go back to what you are proposing? Uh, sure. Tim has to. Well, why? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the. It's really just a minor change, but it is significant. And that is that I'm just proposing that for residential projects over 25 units, that that goes straight to the PC. But, but that retains, you know, that projects three to 10 units, get an ASP, you know, and I'm not proposing to change other things in the chart, but just, so I'm just trying to capture the large projects that generate a lot of interest, go to the PC, because I think they would end up at the PC anyway. Is So I'm just, so the, the reasoning behind this suggestion is because in my experience, any project of this size would just get appealed up the up the up the chain anyway, and so I, um, so that's I why I agree with you that any project of more twenty five or more units would get appealed anyway. I would like to think that the planning director would figure that they should go to the planning commission as a discretionary matter. ASP. I'm standing here with my residential uses chart key and I don't see ASP on it. Is that? It's an administrative site permit and that was formerly a level four. So that is public notice, no public hearing. I just, most, a good deal of what the planning commission has done is see projects under 25. I don't, I think that's way too large. I mean, we get a lot of people who have a large remainder lot and they want to put five houses on it or seven houses on it. And we hear those and we get very large parts of the community. And I think the community relies on it. And um, I, th I think that's, I think that 25 is way too high. And I agree that over 25 units, I can't even imagine that 25 units or more wouldn't go to some public hearing. 
So I would, I would make it less. I, I, I know I think, well, what about seven? So that I think is not something that, well, I guess I'd like to hear what Commissioner Vialanti thinks. It seems like we're cutting the public out of everything. That's what the planning commission's for. Yeah, you know, I'm torn because I mean, I, I, I really, I hear what Mr. Shepard is saying, and I, and I agree that we've seen, you know, communities want to get engaged, and I, I think what what staff is trying to do is <clears throat> is change the way projects get heard. Um, and I don't think that that's trying to cut out the planning commission. It's it's just shifting for public hearings occur. It'll still be a public hearing. Um, and I and I you know the equity argument is is not one I take lightly because you know two thousand dollars is a huge amount of money to a lot of people. Two thousand um, dollars is is a minimum. Let let her finish, please. And you know I, but I also just I I really. Am, very, very cognizant of those same people who can't afford the $2,000 or the same people who are being priced out of housing right now in our community. Um, and we've seen developers not be able to complete projects because the length of time that it takes between finding a parcel and going through the significant amount of administrative and you know regulatory process, not just here at the county, but with the water agencies, with, with, with some of, depending on where the parcel is, um, you know, fire and all these things um, to get clearance to build, and our our county does take time, um, and I mean, and that includes actually the appeals process that that gets put on top of it. Um, and I do want to encourage development in Santa Cruz County because I want to provide housing for the breadth of people that need to live in our community in order to create a thriving community, and that includes people. Um, where two thousand dollars is 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 insignificant, and people where two thousand dollars is a struggle, um, because I think including all incomes um, is important in order to have a thriving community. Um, and I, so I absolutely hear what Commissioner Shepard is saying, um, but I but I also think that the reality of the housing crisis is is present, um, and I like Commissioner Dan's idea. I, I understand Commissioner Shepard's concern that if we often when we put up one proposal and 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 say the other, I understand your concern that that might be not be taken seriously. But I've, I've been there when the board has taken seriously the idea. They just actually did it with the tiny homes. Yes, reveals. that's right. You know, they they just we we put forward a proposal and we staff included the idea that there was a I'll call it a minority opinion. I don't know that that we didn't pass, but there was an alternative option and the board still adopted it. So I um I I think. I, I think I think I like Mr. Dan's proposal of we can add in here direction that says this proposal, which is projects of any PC hearing for any projects over 25 units, and, and then include a direction to staff to to say that there was strong discussion on this. In fact, this may be the one of the biggest discussions we've had um, uh, is around not just and I don't just mean this item, Commissioner Shepard. I just mean this idea of noticing and engagement in the public has been. A big discussion point today, and it, it, and you'll see in our next um, our, our, the proposal we hope to put forward is all surrounding this idea of noticing. And I would hope that staff, when they present the the board, uh, talks about the fact that our there is a concern from the planning commission about the the, the decrease um, in opportunities for public engagement. And I and I do think that hopefully the ZA will become. The body where people are able to have their voices heard, and they and and they'll start doing basically what the planning commission has done, which is take people's ideas into consideration, find compromise. And it's not that the planning commission, the planning commission might not be the body that hears um, these things anymore, but they will be the body that allows for compromise. Um, and and we, it'll just change who does what now. Um, so I I really hear you, Commissioner Shepard. I agree with you, but I I, I like the idea of. Of, of presenting both opinions because I think your, your point is so important um, that I think it's important that the board be the one who decides. And, and they may find a compromise. They may decide that it's one to two units and the MSP and it's three to, like you said, seven um, is something else. And I, I think that they should know that there was a, a robust discussion here today about that. Well, I just have to say that I think what SAP, what SAP is trying to do, as I understand what I was told, 
is simplify the code so if something is allowed, it can happen with a minimum of hearings. That's simplifying and having less hearings. And I don't think that makes any sense. I mean, the idea is that if it's allowed in a zone, you know, if you can have 20, you know, 15 units, you should be allowed to have 15 units without any further review because it, it the, but the zoning and what people have to live with and the circulation and the traffic and the shading and the, all the other issues we hear about because Santa Cruz is not a place like Santa Clara, Oklahoma, Ohio, or a great deal where it's flat and the zones are easy to deal with. And if it's zoned for that, then you can easily build what you need to or construct or configure things as you need because there's never, there things are not complicated. Everything in Santa Cruz is complicated because they have limited resources and the terrain is not uniform. And we have a lot of old neighborhoods that have particular ab, ab, you know, abnormalities. Where I live, the zoning change, where I live in the San Lorenzo Valley on my street, the zoning changes almost for every parcel. So what you're going to end up with is somebody who can do something essentially with a, a, a permitted by right or with a with a ministerial permit or with no overview, literally next to somebody who has to have a much larger review because the zoning has never been really particularly updated and it's not clear that it can. I live, I am on, you know, residential agricultural next to me is rural residential. I mean, it just, it's all over the place. So that's why I think, uh, you know, looking at, looking at smaller projects has been very, very appropriate. And I do think reducing the role of the planning commission um, is a mistake for this community. And I think most residents are going to feel very betrayed. And I don't think that most, most people, we all agree we need more housing that, and, and that we should uh, uh, allow it. But I, I, I've not, it's not my role to totally represent how much we can develop. It's my role to still pay attention to community involvement and community act acquiescence and understanding and accommodation. And that's what I think the planning, people feel like that's what the planning commission does. And I think it's different appearing before a zoning administrator um, who is basically going to apply. Is it, if it's zoned for that, it's in. Because that's their job and our job is different historically. So I, I don't know if this is gonna prevent me from voting for the whole thing. I hope not, but I don't agree. I think 25 units, is too high. If you, Rachel and Allison, if you can see your way to bringing it down so it'll involve more of what we have been hearing, um, then I can go along with it. But no, I've, this is the core issue for me. Well, you know, again, this is not the last stop on this train. And so ultimately, this is going to be decided at the board. And since this is such a critical component of this code update, um, I anticipate that this section will be paid attention to. Um, so I'm also thinking about that and how this will be move, moving forward. Um, and so that partly speaks to trying to create um, kind of a middle ground here. I, I want to say that I 100% agreed with what Commissioner Violanti said and how she characterized, you know, the tough decision um, that this is, because I also agree um, fundamentally with a lot of the points that Com Commissioner Shepard has said. On the other hand, I also understand the reality of building housing I mean, not, you know, certainly not to the extent that Commissioner Gordon does, but, you know, and that, you know, if you have a three unit project, you know, that, or a five unit project that has to go to the planning commission, but over in the jurisdiction, the city of Santa Cruz, you know, you have a much more streamlined process, you might not look at developing in the county. And so, you know, and then also we might get different housing types in the county that maybe aren't the priority housing types that we need. 
Um, and that's also what's happened a lot in the county as well. And, you know, we need all housing types in this county. Um, so let me just say that. So, I, I, you know, I don't know what the right answer is to this. Um, I really don't. I don't, um, I put something out here. Um, I can justify it, but in the end, I, I don't know if this is the right direction to do. I don't know what the exact right number is. I'm just basing this off of my experience as well. Um, well, would you consider a lower and get to 15? Um, I could consider that, Commissioner Violanti. I mean, yeah, yeah, I could consider that. I mean, I mean, as if the other, let's see, I, I don't have the chart right in front of me. So I'm, if we didn't change the other stuff. Yeah, so basically anything between 10 and 15 would go to the ZA and anything above 15 would go to the, the, the PC. And then the three to three to 10, 10 would stay the same. Yeah, I mean, unless we wanted to change anything else. No, no. But I just don't know why we would. Um, Are we going to get to non-residential hearing levels, by the way, in your document? I am not addressing those. I'm just okay. Just, just I, residential I, right now. Um, go ahead. Sorry, Allison. I was just going to say I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't know. If, or do you want it from staff or do you want to just I mean, I don't know. Commissioner Gordon, Chair Gordon? Yeah, I'll tell you my input is anything, I mean, there there is how I say this. Anything that can make it faster and easier would be probably what I would hope that we could achieve. And the reality is that as people other people have stated, it's hard to develop in the county. That's just the reality. It takes a really long time and there's a lot of process and there's a lot of cost. And I mean, if we want to make changes in this county to make, to actually produce housing, we got to make some changes. And I would say that, you know, the, this number is probably a little bit, you know, it could change one way or the other and still be fine. My anticipation is that if there's a big, you know, any size project that maybe has a bunch of variances or really impacts neighbor, they're going to figure out a way to appeal it. At the same time, there might be projects and there will be that meet all the codes and have no business coming to planning commission. Um, and so it's kind of a tough and fine balance. Um, but I would say that where we have what we have now is, is a good start and it's worth a try. And if we can't, if it doesn't work, there's always the ability to change again later. How about this? Um, how about, then this is just thinking off the top of my head. Um, we make it 15 and then we add a direction that one year after this code is implemented or um, yeah, or one year or two years after this code is implemented to give it time to projects to come through, that planning staff will return to the commission and evaluate whether or not this is the right permit review level. Like kind of speaking to what you were saying, Commissioner Garden, about yeah. coming back and tweaking things. Yeah, I'd be fine with that. And I, you know, I think a 15 unit is probably fine as well. You know, 15 isn't, I mean, that's a big project by standards. Our standards, yeah. You know, from what we see, hopefully we see a lot bigger stuff and then even the bigger stuff, 25 is a, the bigger, if they're gonna be much bigger, they're probably gonna be over 25, you know? So I would be fine with either number, you know, 15 or 25, whatever you both are good with. And then if we wanna, you know, address it again in a year. I think that's a, for me, that's a great solution because it's some, it's new territory for us. So. Commissioner Shepard, does that work for you? Well, you know what I would prefer, but I think it should be two years or something. A year's not going to tell us much. Right. I was thinking a year or enough 
staff, what do you think is the right time frame there to come back and evaluate the efficacy of this? I, I think a couple of years, maybe even like three years um, uh, to have enough different types of projects that we are able to look at each level. Um, so that's what I would suggest for report report backs take, you know, take time. They take data and a year in a year, we're going to be trying to get the housing element passed. So I, you know, I, I'd say let's give it a little bit more, uh, more time. So, so you are saying that we'll go with 15 and it'll come back in two years for review of how well it's working. Yes, essentially, I, I think I think it sounds like Ms. Hansen saying yes, two to three years, depending on how many projects come through, and maybe the fact that you know if we're seeing smaller projects, it's indicative of the fact that it's still an obstacle, but they'll come back with a report on whether or not this number is appropriate or if they still feel like yeah. So we'll what will, so this will result in anyone who has a project where they're going to take their property and subdivide it and build, let's say 12 units um, with ADUs and junior ADUs or tiny homes, they will have a ministerial review at, and the neighbors and the community really won't have any input or will that still go to the zoning administrator? 12 units would go to the ZA. the ZA. So it's three to 10 would be administrative permit with public notice. And, and it's appealable. And, and appealable, yeah. And then above that is uh, essentially ZA until we get to 15. So 15 and up would be planning commission. Um, how much does it cost to um, appeal the uh, three to 10? You said gave me a quote of 10 hours minimum for a planning commissioner here hearing. So what does it cost to want to appeal uh, an automatic, you know, a three to 10 unit who's gonna, for a neighbor who feels strongly that the ADU's windows are gonna, you know, shine right into their bedroom. Jocelyn had some corrections to what I was saying. The, the um, fee chart is a little funky. So Joss, can you, can you help with that? This would be, Basically appealing a level four yes. permit. Yeah, the fee the fee chart is strange, but um, but but yes, uh, an appeal if an appeal is filed by a member of the public, um, the fee is a flat fee. It's twelve hundred dollars. If an appeal is filed by the applicant, then we bill off of the existing deposit account and. Um, and, you know, they do typically take 10 or more hours um, so to process. Every, is that for an appeal of any kind? So if I was building, <laughs> let's say, seven units, I'm dividing my property, I'm going to, you know, create a new little mini development with seven homes on it. Um, I have, let's say I have four acres and uh, it's in the hills and it's all going to be you know, it's going to be complicated how to fit it in and so on. And my neighbors think that is the worst place in the world to put the driveway. Um, and I, or that really floods in that south section where you're thinking of putting a home mm -hmm. and to have their voice heard, how will they do it? I think you're saying they would need to appeal it because it's by right, essentially, or ministerial. No, if it's a land division, it gets a CSP. A CSP being I a ZA, mm -hmm. and and so if they want to appeal the ZAs, the CA goes said so that it hasn't flooded for ten years, so I don't think that's important. And he, then in the land owner, the person next door still wants to appeal it. Is that a flat fee of twelve hundred dollars? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, let's make. I still I want to vote for this whole motion, so I'll go along with the fifteen. Okay. And let me and make that change. But, so now um, I, I think people in Santa Cruz who who are current residents losing their voice is going to be a pretty big deal. So I think you'll hear, we'll hear from a lot of people beside people who want to develop. You, there's I understand the need for more, but I also have a lot of respect 
for the people who have built this community and, and live here and think that this is a community where their voice is heard. I feel like we're, we're really changing things, but okay. And I, I do have uh, something at some point before the afternoon's over that I wanna add about non-residential uh, projects. Is it, in, is it in chapter 1310? Yes. Or 11, we're on 11 now, right? Sorry, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, can I, yes. Can I, before we move on to that, I want to add one thought on this, last Please. thought on this, that Ms. Hansen, if it turns out where there are a lot of appeals, like it's just happening all the time within the three years, can we can we just put a note like, hey, let's revisit it sooner? Because I, you know, when on the flip side, if I'm a developer saying I'm gonna go build, you know, 10 units or nine units and and now I get appealed. Well, I've just not, I didn't streamline my process. I got, it just got extended by two or three or six more months. And so, you know, I think both sides of that coin are true. And we just want to be really conscious of that. So if there's like lots and lots of appeals, it's actually kind of hindering what the. Yes, the, that's right. That's I exactly understand. And, and then we, point. then we didn't meet the intent of the amendments okay. at all, which would, was to not only streamline the process, but also provide, you know, a, a definitive process that helps, you know, that helps things move forward. Appeals, as you know, um, take a lot of, not even, it's not even the money, it's all the time. And the, right. the fees don't even begin to cover the staff time or planning commissioner's time that goes into those. So yes, we can, we can revisit, Jocelyn and I keep a close eye on it, revisit if it looks like we really missed the mark. Um, on this or frankly anything else um, we'll be back and if I haven't said this before you know our intent is to um, have an annual housekeeping amendment cycle um, my my intent was to start that next year but um, the housing element might get in the way but have a regular cycle where we can bring things back um, uh, concerns back um, corrections that need to happen on a much more regular basis, and it, it could be a part of that as well. Great. Well, I changed some language in here to say it's up to you. Um, I just had a question. If someone appeals the zoning administrator um, decision and they pay their $1,200, but the zoning administrator is very busy, so it's going to be three months before their item can fit in, does that put a stop on the project, just as Tim is asking? I can, uh, do you mind if I weigh in on that? Okay, um, we have three zoning administrators right now um, working the circuit, so we have not had any issue with with delays in getting to the zoning administrator, and we don't have that many projects under fifteen units that come through our office, so I don't foresee this adding significantly to our zoning administrator workload to the extent that it would cause delays in processing. And when is the appropriate time uh, to talk about, well, if you're at, do you want to go all the way to the end of your suggestion? Yeah, so this is, this is it for us. This was the end of our, right, Allison? And this is the end of 1310 and 1311. Yeah. That is correct. So, we have a separate document that covers chapter 1810 and like two or three little cleanup items. Um, but if you have stuff for chapter 13, and if we're done with this part, um, that would, I think we should move on we, to that. Yeah, we could either take a vote on this and just no, pass it like and then do it one on. I would like to see if you would be interested in a friendly amendment or not, rather than make it a separate motion. Okay. So I would like to propose um, that residential, non-residential projects um, that require a conditional use permit, um, that, 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 sorry, I move that the use charts at 13.10 reflect a conditional use grant approved by the Planning Commission for the following types of projects in zones where a use permit is required animal shelters or hospitals, retail stores greater than 50,000 square feet we already took care of, parks, museums, resi um, visitor accommodations, 
of five units or greater and organized camps, um, skilled nursing facilities for the elderly, continuing care retirement communities, industrial public and community facility projects over 5,000 square feet. Uh, I can we yeah, so I her share her screen or something. Yeah, no. could you either go over those way slower or share share them because that was hard to track. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately don't have any screen to share because I don't have any screen. I mean, I have what I'm looking at, but I don't. I can't go share. My computer's dead. So I can. I think I could share my screen because I helped a little bit with this, although it is changed a bit because of the motions that commissioners Dan and Violante have made. Right. Ms. Hanley, um, can you just clarify as we get that ready that we're talking about the commercial use chart. So we're talking about 1310-332-1. It's mostly the commercial use charts at this point because okay. we've addressed residential um, in what um, we just did. Page, um, let me tell you the rationale here. Can before yeah. you do that, I want to find it so I can so now I can have it up. Can you tell me what what page Stephanie it is on the online version of three three one? We actually just looked at the uses. So um, wherever Seven. like a use for like a kennel um, was allowed with a conditional use permit instead of the just a conditional use permit, then it would be conditional use permit dash PC. So instead of just going to the zoning administrator, it would go to the planning commission. I, I want to amend the list that's so, Stephanie. Sorry, everyone, real quick, real quick. Let's get Commissioner Dan to where we need to be. We're at the use charts in the commercial zone back in 1310. Um, Page 11. page 11 on yeah thank you print out okay. size so i basically let me give Good. some One sec, commissioner shepherd sorry i just, just want to make sure fact, i want to get yeah. i want to understand what you're suggesting so i want to be able to look at it yeah okay thank okay. you i'm, I'm there giving you, uh, give you a little okay. context i was thinking back on the kinds of non you know non-residential uses where planning commission hearings have been useful and productive and make sure that they are still heard by the planning commission. And Stephanie generously made me a list. I want to modify that list slightly. So animal shelters, I do not need to include kennels or animal hospitals, just animal shelters. That was a very big complex hearing with an excellent result. And if we got another animal shelter, uh, I think it should be heard by the planning commission. Retail stores greater than 50,000 square feet, we've already addressed. Park general plans and uh, master plans, we've always heard. I think it's critical we continue to hear them. Museums, uh, you know, there's there's going to be one proposed actually. That would come to the Planning Commission. Um, we'll skip residential projects uh, of five units or greater because I already lost that battle, but we've got an accommodation there. Uh, visitor accommodations of five units or greater and organized camps. A lot of the hearings we've had are for the, and there are, I agree, mostly in my district, there are big organized camps that have residential development and large programs. And when they, Mount Hermon would be one, and I can't remember the other one off the end of uh, Lockhart Gulch, I think, the really big one. Um, what am I thinking of? Um, anyway, I'm drawing a blank. They are very big communities. And when they come in for changes to their master plans, or if ever everyone wanted that, we had a new one. I think that is a big enough project involving very large development with a lot of community impact. Those should continue to come to the Planning Commission. And then I was thinking congregate senior housing, a large one, not, not, I don't, I'm not worried about residential care facilities uh, except large ones. Um, and um, and then community, industrial, public, and community facility projects. So I need to modify this. Residential care homes of seven or more residents take that off. Um, skilled nursing facilities. I think continuing care communities. I, I'm not concerned about skilled nursing facilities or residential care facilities, but large 
continuing care retirement communities. That's something I think we should hear. So I would take so off. I'm trying, I was trying to follow and scroll down as quickly as I could as you were running through just to see what staff is proposing to remind myself and what you're proposing. It's well, I think like that would not be heard by the planning commission. So I'm saying these particular uses should be heard by the planning commission. I understand what I was getting at is what I, what I could see from having to quickly scroll through as you're running through the list is that most of them from what I could see are proposed to go to the ZA. Exactly. Right? Uh, to one more, um, I mean, one more. Can I finish my thought? Well, I, I want to get it list right, if you don't mind, first before we address it. Yeah, so go ahead. Um, visitor accommodations of five units or greater. No, I meant organized camps or visiting. I, I, and Stephanie and I had a little trouble identifying what I mean. What is Mount Hermon? Is it an organized camp? I don't think uh, it's a camp. I believe it would fit under the organized camp. Okay, so has the master plan. The large communities mostly uh, started out as religious based that have both many large programs and heavily are heavily visitor serving with a huge influx of people on the weekends, sometimes hundreds. And we have three of those in the county. I, if organized camps in, is inclusive, then that's what I meant. So what I'm saying is, I think these types of non-residential projects should continue to be heard by the planning commission, not the zoning administrator. I'm not sure if I meant mixed use projects, I would probably be okay with increasing the mixed use projects to make it over 10,000 square feet. And um, I'm not sure what I what we wrote down for industrial public and community facility projects. Um, I, I, I would make that, uh, you know, 10,000 square feet too, or 5,000. I'm not sure what, what that exactly means. But I meant larger ones that involve the community. So I'll make the size bigger. So for example, if you want to put a, this is happening in Scotts Valley now, so it wouldn't be under a jurisdiction. They're building a theater. And I think that has a lot of community impact and would be worth talking about at a planning commission hearing. So I'm, I'm narrowing this list to be the ones I think are critical. I don't think, I think you can take out group, group quarters. I don't even know what that means, but I know what I mean by large continuing care communities. We have heard most of those that exist. With can you scroll up the list? Cause I was trying to follow in the, okay. And so what's crossed out is what you don't want to include yeah. anymore. I don't, I don't think it's necessary and but animal shelters, retail stores bigger than, which we already included, parks. Um, I got it. Can I ask some questions for staff? Um, staff, so I was trying to look at what's proposed in the code and is it correct that for these right now is proposed to the ZA? It, it's a mix, but um, a, several of them would go to the ZA. I think a couple of them were administrative use permits as well. Um, Commissioner um, uh, Shepard was focused on uses that had been listed in the staff report. Um, and so regardless of the zone, like if animal shelters, for instance, also appeared in the industrial zone, let's say the same change would be, the same change would be made. I believe that's what she has in mind. And then could you scroll down so I can see the rest again? Of course, yes. Thank you. So what's large continuing care communities? Um, that would be, uh, oh. we don't have any currently in the county, I don't think, but I'm, I'm hoping we will, where you have senior living and then you have, um, what do you call it, assisted living, and then you actually have um, the next step after that. You know, there are come, Right. What is large though, I guess is my question. I don't know how quite to define large, but over something that would have over a hundred occupants. 
Well, and can, I'm sorry, I didn't Commissioner Dan, but can staff tell me, I mean, since I'm, I also am trying to follow along on the use chart, I'm trying to understand where, and I know Ms. Hansen, you, you said you kind of went along in the code, but I'm trying to understand where this, some of these exists, like even animal shelters, technically we have, like we have a shelter kennel and animal hospital, that one's easy to find, but continuing care retirement facilities, I'm just trying to figure out where that, um, that we probably appears to. in the residential code. I think um, Commissioner Shepard was focused more on the type of use that she's seen in front of the Planning Commission as opposed to the exact district that it's um, referenced in the code. And that's why it's a little hard to pinpoint exactly which use chart we're talking about because I think she was thinking that wherever it appeared in the use charts, it would then go to the planning commission. I yeah. think that staff could figure out where it was in the use chart. That was way beyond my capacity. So in the um, commercial use chart, it's in the housing section of that chart uh, on page 18 of that document. Um, and continuing care retirement communities are grouped with um, skilled nursing facilities and residential care facilities um, with a CUP required. So I think based on what Commissioner Shepard is proposing, we would then break out continuing care retirement communities as a separate line item requiring a CUP PC review in the commercial use chart as an example. Yeah. I That's actually the most obscure one because we don't have any continuing care um, facilities in this county now. I hope we will. We're going to need them. But the others are pretty, I mean, parks, museums, and retail stores bigger than an organized camps. Those are something we have now. And I think those projects need to come before the planning commission. And they are not happening three times a year. They're happening once every few years if that. So this is not going to add a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to change the basic structure of the reforms we're talking about. It's just being very specific of where, in my experience, planning commission review has been very useful to the larger public and much, and we ended up getting better projects. Um, I just had a couple of clarifying questions about this proposal. So for the continuing care retirement community, actually, it would be just the large ones that would be subject to the CUP PC. Is that correct? Yes. Based, okay. So that so that would be, we, so we would add it in that way. And we would need to define large. Um, I would say with over 100 occupants. Okay. And then the commercial, the last two line items that you have, the... Um, commercial projects over 10,000 square feet and industrial public community, public and community facility projects over 10,000 square feet. Is that then referring to site development permits? Um, the site development permit chart um, rather than the use permit chart? I, need, uh, I think I need help from Stephanie there. All right, yeah, Daisy, I think we probably would look at both of them. Okay for that. Uh, yeah, I'm just asking and clarifying questions since the if it if if it were referring to the use chart, it would need to be a lot more specific than that. But I, th I think it's yeah, it's more could, broad in the site the, development permit chart. Right. I, I just think that in other words, large impactful projects that involve a big section of the community and there are not that many, they should come to the planning commission. I think that's the very definition of what the planning commission does. And I think the non-residential ones are very important. So Can I ask a question on the commercial projects, including mixed use one? Um, can you correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm looking at the use permit required. And I'm not sure how this correlates to the section we were just talking about a minute ago, but um, I think it says, and this is this is the chart that we're on earlier for the commercial um, uses 13.3.33, one or two or something. Um, 
five plus units for commercial mixed, I think this is saying commercial mixed use and this is already CUPPC. It's already supposed to go to planning commission. So I know it's not a square footage, but it's saying anything five units or, or more in a mixed use would need to go to planning commission. Is it, am I reading that correctly? And how does that correlate if so with what we just talked about? Um, I will let staff answer that because if you're right, then that could be eliminated. If you're not right, then I'd keep it. Sorry, I'm taking a look over at the use charts. Um, I can clarify if, if it's useful. Um, Definitely. The, the um, mixed use uh, uh, threshold for the number of units is different um, from the like 100% residential project threshold number of units. Um, and the planning commission may wish to change that to make to make them the same. Um, that's that's something that staff has has noted is um, an inconsistency between the mixed use standards and the 100% uh, residential standards. Well, if we the commission may wish to keep them keep them as they are. If we were going to make them consistent, what would the language be? Well, the uh, the the threshold is five units for a PC review of a mixed use project. Well, that seems reasonable. So what has to change? Well, there was, you, you just had a discussion about the, the appropriate threshold for number of units for PC review on residential projects and yeah. decided okay. on 15 units. But we're talking about commercial projects here, not residential. Correct. It was just a clarifying question to understand how those two things applied. And it sounds like what we talked about in section 1311 refers to residential only. Right. Um, I yeah. would like them to apply to commercial mixed use as well. It seems to make sense to have them be consistent. Thank you, Daisy, for catching that. I don't see why they should be consistent between residential and commercial. They're apples and oranges. It's a, this, what I believe Daisy was talking about was residential mixed use, right? Uh, correct. Uh, the number of residential units in a mixed use project that would trigger planning commission review. Hey, so, I, I wasn't addressing residential units. I was, was addressing non-residential <clears throat> Your Your, uh, motion, your motion here use. refers to mixed use projects. Yes. That's why we're... Okay. Take that you mentioned it here, commercial projects, including mixed use projects. That's well, why I'm we're sorry. talking about it. I thought that meant mixed use commercial projects. Oh, so, so obviously, geez. you know, my, my lack, I am not a planner, I have no background in planning. So I'm not doing very well against all you experts. So let's change it to be more appropriate. So commercial projects over 10,000 square feet then. Is, well, is, I'm, if I'm understanding you correct, the term mixed use refers only to residential projects, right? No, let me let me help a little bit there. And I wouldn't I wouldn't say that, Commissioner Shepard. You've got you've been here on the, really? on the uh, commission for a very long time, and so you know I wouldn't discredit yourself that much. There's the the term mixed use is is essentially that it's mix of commercial and residential. Primarily, it applies in the commercial zones. Correct me if I'm wrong, Daisy. However. <clears throat> In the use chart that is in code section 1310, mixed use projects required with five units or more are required to go to planning commission already. That's what, that's no one's changed to that. So that's what it states. Well, that makes sense. I would prefer not to change that. And if that is already there, then I would take out this provision entirely. <clears throat> And, and what I'm hearing from Commissioner Dan is that she would like them to be the same, whether it's mixed use or strictly residential. And correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I, I just thought that that's why. No, I think that it makes a whole lot of sense to be consistent. Yeah. 
So we have two opposing views here, you know, again. And so yeah, yeah. We'll figure yeah. that out. Yep. But, uh, you know, let me also just say, um, you know, we don't have to have all the answers today because this is going to the board. And so like, staff has really done an excellent job with a bunch of different items of characterizing discussions where the commission didn't come to a consensus and presenting that to the board for a choice to make. And so, um, you know, I'm just assuming staff is gonna continue that excellent work to be able to do that in a lot of areas where we're either ended up being inconsistent or we had, you know, areas where there was some disagreement. Would you consider in your um, proposal omitting that change and put in a letter to the board that we did not come agree to agreement on this? In that case, because I would like to vote for the other aspects of everything. Yeah, else. I think that, that that's fine. And and let me, let me just say, I think that, um, and I want to hear from Commissioner Violanti too, that um, in general, I am willing to accept um, what you have here with the exception of the last two bullet points, the commercial and industrial, just because I'm, I'm just, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. So, but I would be amenable to um, the other bullets, if you can scroll well, up. Um, you know, I was thinking an industrial, which is, we really don't have that anymore, but when the whole area uh, along Mission Street was developed with a lot of semiconductor plants, which are now all converted to other uses, um, that was already zoned industrial. So what about just, if I limited that to <clears throat> industrial and pub, take out industrial and public, in community facilities, I'm and left to only communities facilities. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Violanti. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Dan. That was actually going to be the question I had. I was kind of let the conversation take place around mixed use first because I, um, Ms. Shepard had originally kind of started this by saying her questions were. I I, I know Ms. Hansen had said her concerns were across all zone districts, but she keeps. It seems to me her com comments keep focusing on the commercial zone districts primarily, um, and I. One of the my questions was is this this word industrial in this last bullet point because um, it seems that I'm not sure why we'd have this high level review because industrial seems consistent with the zoning of uh, commercial zone par par parcels. We do have. Um, uh, different levels of review depending on what the industrial use is. And I just, I wouldn't want to assume that all industrial uses require this high level of review necessarily. And I was going to ask some questions of staff about that. So I, I appreciate that she, it, it sounds like my comment almost sounds unnecessary at this point that maybe we're willing to get rid of the word industrial because. I am willing uh, to get rid of the word industrial and public and leave it at community projects. Okay. Um, and because I also share Commissioner Dan and I think Chair Gordon's concern about, well, it sounds like JC clarified that as well about mixed use projects, because I think there's already that, they already go to the PC. And so I I agree that I can support um, uh, most of what gonna, I'm If we're going to live, if we're going to leave it as it is and tell the board that we had a lot of discussion about it, then that's, this isn't necessary. <clears throat> well, I think what Commissioner Dan and I are trying to do is say that we're willing to incorporate actually what, what you've proposed. I'm, I'm letting you know the pieces I have concerns with that I would want to take out before we adopt, before we were willing to accept your friendly amendment, um, which is the industrial piece and then this mixed use piece because. Um, I'm, good, I'm good with that. Um, so that's, that, that's, what I, that's what I'm trying to clarify um, since I haven't weighed in yet, um, since it took me a while to kind of understand what we were, we were clarifying. Um, and so I just, I appreciate the conversation that led because that's, that was my points of concern. If you don't mind, um, Ms. Hansen, if you just scroll up again so I can see them again. Certainly. Um, thank you. I appreciate you kind of going back and forth. No problem. <laughs> um, Rachel had to do that for us earlier. <laughs> I, just, I just made the notes. Oh. You have to do both of those things. <laughs> um, so I, um, I just was trying to look. And it sounds like, I just want to, Ms. Shepard, if you don't mind just clarifying, you would like to see these changes in all zone districts, or could you just clarify for the record, are you hoping for these changes to be strictly in commercial zone districts so that if we accept the friendly amendment, we understand what it is your amendment is? Well, I'm not exactly sure I understand your what you're saying because you wouldn't put an animal shelter 
anywhere. I mean, these wouldn't be located in residential districts anyway. Well, I just want to understand for those for those uses that are allowed in both district in, in multiple zoned districts, because some of some of your recommended changes are allowed in multiple districts. Um, yes, I think the answer to your question is yes. If you parks, museums, large retail stores, animal shelters, and organized camps in any zone district, because they're very large institutional projects. Okay. Just want to make sure I understood. Thank you, thank you for that clarification. And I, I would, I would be, I, I think I've reduced this to the minimum uh, of what I think really needs looking at on the planning commission. And remember, these come up; they're sort of like hem yeah. they come up very often. So, I, just to move things along, I think both the maker of the motion and the seconder have accepted the friendly amendment. So. Um, so I think that maybe we should conclude the discussion on this item and take a vote if, if after everybody's questions have been answered and then take a break and then try to finish up. Okay. Have to, and have to just, chair just, the chair's discussion. Yeah. Just, I, go ahead, Commissioner Shepard. I just want to be clear on the, on the uh, hearing, the level of hearing going aside from this, going back for a minute to where we ended up with the friend with the the change to 15 units um in the in the residential zone area that's where we ended up right yes okay uh yes i would i'm ready to vote on this okay um two quick questions commissioner lazenby we haven't heard from you in a minute i just want to make sure we're not skipping over you or missing anything that you might have wanted to comment on Exactly. I've been kicked off the island a couple of times. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> so I'm back. It's hard to tell on the Zoom, so apologize. The um, no, I I think I'm in agreement with everything that I've heard lately. So okay, wonderful. Thank you. And so to be clear on what we're voting on, <clears throat> excuse me, we've gone through thirteen ten and thirteen eleven. Do you want me to bring back up what we had, or it doesn't matter? Um, just the final. Oh, I, you guys all have it. But yeah, yeah but I think I we've that? added. Can you? We should show what we've just added for Com Commissioner Shepard as far as the uses, so that it's on the screen. Hey, Gordon, are you hoping that? Ms. Hansen will put back up Ms. Shepard's changes or that ours will incorporate? Oh, no, that you, the ones that you are incorporating. That's what I'm hoping to see. Okay, really yeah, let me. Because that's wait. part of the right? Yeah, sorry. Let me. Um, <laughs> somebody else is sharing. Okay, now I'll share. Sorry. Uh, here we go. We don't yet have Ms. Shepard's, Commissioner Shepard's changes, so we'll, uh, Ms. Hansen has that language and I think she'll add it to the. Oh. Yeah, the final while, while, while we're looking at that, just I want to make sure that organized camps is the right descriptors to the institutions that have been here for many years and are very large, like, for example, Mount Hermon and the one I can't for life to remember that's even big above Scotts Valley. And there's several more in the organized right. camps are appropriate, but I mean, they're, they aren't just a bunch of little cabins, you know, they're right. No, I think we understand. Okay. Okay, and then you uh, so um, yeah. So this is, and so staff will add the friendly amendment. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I I'm good to go if everybody okay. else is. Okay, so um, we're voting. This is titles thirteen ten and thirteen eleven through twenty. Correct. We're we all on the same page on that. Okay. I, I'm sorry to throw a wrench in the works, but I'm still uneasy about this. Shouldn't we be calling them visitor serving camps? No. Mm -hmm. um, They're organized camps. The wording then is... they would also incorporate things like Girl Scout camp and my district and also there's all sorts of types of camps that aren't necessarily like visitor well, serving. Well, well, it could well, be like RV, RV camps and stuff like that. So I think staff is going to pull out 
organized camps from visitor accommodation camp or to, 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 to meet your request. You're gonna, okay. It's going to be its own then, category. But if I was walking into the planning committee, into this, the county planning department, what would I be told that, uh, you know, an organized camp is? Um, if I can, I, I do have, there is a definition of yep. 13 for 700 for organized yep. camp. Um, organized camp means a site having day and or overnight facilities for the purpose of conducting a supervised program, which provides educational, spiritual, social, or recreational elements subject to SCCC 1310-689 and 1310-692. Well, that would include facilities that have programs that you described plus residential development, et cetera, and have their own infrastructure. So for example, if Mount Hermon, uh, as they have, comes back and say, we want to put uh, a new water treatment facility in, uh, and, and we're gonna recharge, we're gonna start a new recharge program and so on and so forth, that would still apply. Well, I believe we need to look at whatever use they were proposing to add to the facility and if it needed a separate permit or not, but it, it would be, I mean, I think their camp would fall under the organized camp definition, certainly. They would They would want to, these large institutions want an amendment to their um, master plan. If they came in for an amendment to their master plan, because the master plans are very specific, uh, I want to make sure it comes to the planning commission. Does this, accomplish that? I would need to look at the, I don't, unless you're familiar with it, Stephanie, look at the master plan code section and see if it talks about amendments to these master plans. I, I think some of the most important work we've done is exactly the large master plans that affect hundreds of people. Steph will confirm that the master plans are, in, are, are included as we look at that work. All right, good. Thank you. Sorry, but I wanted to be sure. Okay, sounds good. Are we there? Are we ready? Yes. Uh, no. I'm Before ready. I get here. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I need to or could even clarify anything further. Uh, so Ms. Speak, let's just go with the roll call vote, please. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Okay, sorry. And Chair Gordon? No, as much as it pains me. I do want to say I really appreciate everyone's <laughs> work. There's 99% of the things that I agree with. There's just a couple that are tough for me. Um, but I overall, I really, I'm grateful for everyone's inclusivity and ability to work through that. That was really amazing. So, yeah, that was a great way to organize it. Um, I think we are due for a break, and my brain's a little fried, so I could use one. Um, so if that works, say, for, um, before we go break, ahead, I, I just want to thank. Um, I'm just going to use your first name because I'm too tired. Um, Rachel and Allison, thank you for all the very heavy duty lifting you've done with this. I really appreciate it. And I have a clear notion of how much work it took. So thank yeah. you. For that. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed. Okay. Um, 326. Um, it's okay. It's like a 14 minute break. I'm back around 3 about 40. 340. 340. Okay. Um, Commissioner Violante. Here. Commissioner Lazenby. Here. Commissioner Shepard. Here. Commissioner Dan. Here. And Chair Gordon. Thank you. Here. Appreciate it. Okay. Reconvening. And sorry to interrupt, Ms. Drake, what were you going to say? Um, I was going to say it looks like we have a stop at 515 for uh, CTP, they could look at trying to bring someone else in, taking a recess, but that sounds like that might be possibly a challenge. So if we could end by 5.15, okay. we'll see. Okay. 
So we have coming up next, just to push along pretty quickly, then we're at title uh, 18. Yes. Then we would have remaining as map amendments and then miscellaneous missed stuff, as well as any like bulk items. So Commissioner Dan. Yeah, thank you. So I'm sharing my screen now and up on the screen is a, a motion to accept the staff recommendations um, on chapter 18 and the uh, appendices listed below when I go through the document. Um, so I'm sorry, my brain is right. I, I, okay. To accept the staff recommendations with these um, modifications uh, contained in this document. Um, and they're mostly all on chapter 18 and there are, are a couple of added uh, appendices um, below. And do you have any seconds on that motion? I'm sorry, I agree. My brain is fried. I can second that. That's okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay and then so if we could send that out to Jocelyn and she can send it to the commissioner. I, that would be great. So to incorporate that, uh, and you mentioned this before and I misstated. So right now we are, just to be really clear, this is Title 18 in the general plan appendices. Are we, is that correct? So we cover both of those here? Yes, from our perspective, yeah, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just, so this actually shouldn't take much time. Um, most of what this is, is making some modifications regarding noticing. Um, so the first, the first uh, item here is actually just um, a suggestion that staff uh, come back to the commission within two years to um, do a study session on the efficacy of the noticing requirements. And I call out um, the A, especially for AUP and ASP and um, review the effect of eliminating noticing requirements for projects that are now MUP and MSP. And part of the thinking behind this was that, um, and this has changed slightly because we've we've made some modifications, um, um, but part of this was seeing that we are, well, we were, staff is proposing to uh, change the level of review for so many projects um, down from what was planning commission to the ZA, ZA to administrative um, permits that, um, as you'll see, the, we're proposing to increase noticing to kind of make up for that. <clears throat> so we've kind of made some modifications with what goes to the planning commission, but I think that, um, that what we're suggesting here still hold. And then secondly, that from my over a decade experience on the planning commission, um, what probably the most common thing that I hear from the public when they come in front of the commission is, well, I didn't get, I didn't get noticing about this. I only yeah. knew about this because um, this is the second time it's being heard at the planning commission or my neighbor told me, or I ran into Renee Shepard and she told me about it. Um, and so a lot of what um, is being proposed here is to just increase from 300 to 500 feet, the noticing requirements of who gets those blue cards. And so this first suggestion is then to just say, should this motion be accepted? Should those new noticing requirements go into effect? That uh, I think it would be great if staff would come back to the commission in a couple of years and just review how that's working and if they need to make any uh, modifications to that. So that's what, go ahead. So I'm really understanding you. On, uh, first of all, on that paragraph where it says previously level four that did require noticing, I would want to include that to look at as we discussed before the break, looking at, uh, you know, level five, our level as well. Yeah, and so that that's captured in the noticing requirements of the CUP and CSP. So basically like, you know, I could have just said, just come back and talk about, you know, if you need to make changes to noticing, 
So that's basically the intent of this paragraph is, but in, and as I understand it from listening to Stephanie, she plans to come back to this commission every year anyway. So it's a little bit redundant. But. So it doesn't have to say um, zoning administrator, whatever, I lost my sheet of paper now, the planning, zoning administrator, planning commission. The planning commission level had its own initial CP, I believe. Or PC, I'm sorry. Right. One but of those acronyms, something with three letters with dash CP in it. Right. Well, the noticing requirements are the same. So. Okay. Um, and then I would strongly support changing the no neighborhood notification to 500 feet for sure. I would even say okay. a little bit, but it might cost too much. Okay, so uh, there's, um, I'm going in order of 1810. So before I get to the neighborhood noticing, um, I wanted to, this next item is about um, items that are required to have a public hearing. And so this section 1810.112 on page 15, item C is about, um, is suggesting to add density bonus projects to this list of what would get a public hearing. And I added this because this makes this code consistent with what happens at the city of Santa Cruz. And so that's that. The next section, is there any, are there any questions about that? I did have a question on that one. Um, I do, I, yes, this is, that would be more consistent with the city of Santa Cruz code. Um, personally, I think that that code in the city is not the best use um, because projects, some projects don't necessarily need it. However, let me just, I, not discounting it, I want to figure out how this correlates with the things that we just mentioned. So density mm -hmm. bonus project has to have at least uh, five units or more. Um, and so we're saying that on residential projects, we need planning commission, or excuse me, we need ZA with public hearing um, at 10 units to 15, planning commission from 15 and up. So you're saying that if someone had, let's say a density bonus project that was six units and they got the bonus up to nine, you would want that one also included as a ZA or, or um, planning commission. I just wanna make sure that this is clear with, with that. It would get a CSP. Yes. C -S -P. I believe that. Yeah. Sorry. There's so all the letters. Gotta Sorry. And I'd have to look back at chapter 18 in the specific. I'm pretty sure that CSP. Um, yeah. And so, yes, that, that is correct. I think any project that is getting a density bonus should get a public hearing. Um, so the next one is the next three are on neighborhood notification and uh, it is uh, suggesting a change from, like I said before, 300 feet to 500 feet for the purposes of noticing a neighbor. This one is for neighborhood meetings. And then the next, and so over here, it's just replacing 300 with 500. The next one is for, <coughs> the A, AUP and ASP projects. The next one is for conditional permits and projects. And then I think I just wanted to make sure that um, for the next section, ensure consistency with noticing requirements of the above sections changing 300 feet to 500 feet. And then the next section here, 1810.140 is, um, is a section that's talking about that zoning code needs to be consistent with the general plan. And I just, I think I asked a question about this last week and the sentence to me at the very end didn't, didn't make sense. So um, I, um, and just rewording it. And so, um, yeah, if you want to read the whole section, um, you have to take a look at the actual code. But um, the sense I'm adding at the end 
is states substantial conformance as it's just defining because substantial conformance is used in that section. So I'm defining what that means based on what staff had included. Um, substantial conformance as used in this section means that the permits approvals must be in harmony with the policies objectives and land use programs of the general plan. And then the last items are on the design standards and uh, appendices. With Allison, if you want to talk about those. Yeah, so the, the last, these ones are kind of the ones that are for general statements, especially the first one that we kind of didn't want to put. So throughout our conversation, um, as a commission, we've discussed the fact that staff um, in the staff report had kind of said that when they did the pilot program for the, the Portola Road project, that it, the, the data didn't kind of bear out that the road diet had been a successful in terms of meeting the objectives of it. Um, and we are, you know, while we, we, we support the rezoning of Portola, we're concerned about whether or not the redesign of that road is appropriate, especially given um, the long range plan for that area. Um, again, rezoning that just area doesn't mean that redevelopment will happen. It means it can happen, but that the redesign would be something that would happen sooner rather than later for the, for the road. Um, and we aren't, staff had kind of said that we could recommend changes to the language and we didn't, instead of recommending specific language changes in either the appendix or the general plan, or even in the accessibility, uh, access and accessibility part of the general plan, we thought it was more appropriate to just kind of express um, a kind of displeasure and opposition to the road diet design in Portola, given the numerous comments we got um, and where and where that area is going. Um, so that's what that first one is about. And then the second one is specific to Appendix I, which was the TDM plans. Um, we were, were not supportive of reducing parking spaces as a TDM strategy. Um, and we, while we are in favor of unbundling parking as a strategy, um, we are only in support of it in larger developments, so 25 units or more, and, and when the developer offers a subsidized bus passes, which is consistent with what the board, um, the board, when they had done it, they had said that they wanted to do it when the developer had offered subsidized bus passes, which was not included in the language of um, Appendix I. Because um, at the time when the board considered this, that was actually in the draft, if I'm not mistaken. So we would like to restore the, the, the development size to be back to 25 instead of 10 units. Because I know that's something that staff had contemplated previously was um, 25 units. And so we'd like to restore that number. Okay. <laughs> For clarity, Mom, your, your, uh, this part of your motion is expressing this information to the Board of Supervisors as opposed to actually making a change. For Appendix I, it's, it's, it's making the change. Or for the first one, it is an expression. <clears throat> Can you be a little more explicit? Express opposition to road diet in Portatola and current road design proposals. Are there any current road design proposals? They try and the road, by the road diet, you mean when they they limited the number of lanes and tried a whole bunch of stuff, which nobody liked. Correct. So, in if you read the design standards, there there is an approved like Portola Road design in that area. And instead of, like I said, trying to find specific language because it the the road, the Portola area shows up in several areas throughout the general plan and the Appendix J and the road design, it shows up in multiple places. And instead of trying to find specific language um, and correct it individually, we felt it was better to leave the ultimate decision up to the Board of Supervisors, but express kind of the planning commission's opposition to the, the road diet design for the Portola um, area. Well, that, that's a little more explicit. So express opposition to the road diet design for Portola and, or, and, and ask for other design proposals. And because that's what you're really talking about, right? Correct, because we think the, the board and staff can make final language on where it needs to change. Because it's like I said, it's in several locations. And, and then on the removing parking spaces, the TM, TDM strategy, that means, as I remember, traffic, what, what? Command uh, management. 
Yeah, okay. And then allow on, only allow unbundled, remind me what unbundled is again, please. That's when a, um, a property owner or or landlord can charge separately for the parking space as they do for the unit itself. So we would only like to see this on larger developments. Um, while there are some strong equity arguments on why this can be a good thing, we also think it can be concerning that we're not that yet there as a community, and we would like to see it only offered when there are subsidized bus passes so that transportation as a whole doesn't become um, something that's only accessible to people who can afford it. So we'd like to see it on projects where, and the reason for larger projects is usually there's um, more involvement and engagement with the developer in terms of being able to offer that continued subsidized bus program. Um, well, I, I, I am in support of that as long as we all acknowledge that is our busism, our busism system does not really offer an alternative transportation system because it's not extensive enough. There aren't enough buses. I mean, it's not like the Muni or anything. So I think offering subsidized bus pass is a great idea, but it's no substitute. And, and that's why we don't want to support yet the idea of unbundled parking, because what ends up happening is the people who can't afford to have to pay for their parking separately end up not being able to um, they still, a lot of times they still need their vehicles and we want to ensure that they at least have access to some sort of transportation system. Because of what you just said, Renee, because our tra our public transportation system can't accommodate people's needs at this point. Well, should we, give, should we give that opinion since we are, I, I don't know how, uh, how the chair feels about it, but I feel strongly that that is the case. And I, my, it really stuck in my craw a little bit to have the bus system proposed as an alternative to parking. It, it just doesn't work that way, particularly um, in large parts of the county. As far as removing parking spaces, that I would say of the things that I've mentioned, the other people that we are considering, th that is the one that reads the most, you gotta be kidding, that's a bad idea. I hope they don't do that response. So I strongly support, I, I would support that. Um, but should we actually, what about adding a little language about the bus system, you know, acknowledging that our bus system is not a comprehensive transportation solution as of 2020 or, you know, in its current situation. I'm not saying it couldn't be, but it's gonna have to have a lot of public money. We, we we can certainly I include in our motion. We could. I'd like to, well, you know I'd like to say the emperor has no clothes on. I think we should say that. We could certainly add in our direction that um, included in our motion that staff relay that the reason for this change was a concern that the that um, alternative transportation, including the bus system, does not yet support. People. We're not there yet, basically on on things to get people out of the vehicles. We hope to be, and a lot of our changes are aspirational enough, but we're not there yet. So we could certainly include that in our motion that, that staff relay the reason for this change to be that. I'd be comfortable with that. I mean, Rachel's the maker of the motion, but I mean, if it's what I'm pointing out, we can do that. I'm trying to craft some language at the tail end of this right now. If I could chime in on my opinion, and I know it's gonna be opposite of what everyone here is talking about, but um, two things. Number one, reducing the Park, re reducing parking spaces a TDM strategy, I don't understand why you would eliminate that. It is a true TDM strategy where you have less cars, you have less people driving on the road at certain peak hours. It reduces, it's a traffic demand management strategy. So what would be the reason for removing that? Well, because of what Renee was just talking about. It has no public support, A, and if two people work and they have kids, uh, you know, and they have one parking space and one person goes to work, what's the, and then saying the other person can take the bus, it's just not practical yet. Maybe it will be. Well, I disagree. I have, I mean, coworkers that take the bus every day to work. So just because you don't do it or you well, don't know friends that do doesn't uh, mean uh, that. No, it has nothing, this has nothing to do with me. 
I don't even have a bus, even if I wanted to go to work. Well, my point, my point bus. is that just be, okay, two parts. Number one, parking reduction is a TDM strategy. Doesn't matter how you reduce it. Doesn't matter if you go from two spots to one or from 50 to 49, it is a reduction strategy. So that I think is inherent in what it, you know, that's separate of bus passes. You know, and then the unbundled parking is, what are you gonna do? Are you going to make it a, are you going to like deed restrict each parcel in each project to preclude them from charging extra for their parking spaces? You can, are you gonna manage option. it that way? Right, the other option is it does not allow unbundled parking if you prefer. Well, what I'm saying is that if I developed a project that had all the parking that was required by code, I could still then charge for that parking space, correct? Ms. Hansen, is that? You mean, if, are you talking about if you're the landlord or the yeah. owner of that project? Yeah, that, that's right. If you're the owner, manager of a project, you're not restricting it because that's essentially deed restricting every single parcel to manage how they manage their parking. There's nothing in the code now that would dictate that. <clears throat> Some of these things we count on um, what's best in the market, what the developer feels is good for the market um, that they are focused on. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I, our, while we may not, this change may not recognize that it's a TDM strategy anymore, I, I, I would still allow that, you know, for them to figure out their pricing. Um, as we discussed last time, um, unbundling may um, have equity issues, but so does bundling. It goes both ways. So um, I, would, I would suggest if you want to clarify that this happened in the future when bus passes and Metro is in um, better condition, fine, but I, I don't I do not think we should um, dictate in the code whether they how they um, structure their parking payment system. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know I just want the last thought is that this is a, a short-sighted change in my opinion that the reason that we don't have enough ridership is because people aren't riding. So we have to change that. So once we get more people on the bus, which is what the purpose of this was, is to provide subsidized parking parking passes for um, tenants in lieu of parking spaces, until we do something more drastic, we're gonna be at status quo. Same thing like I said before, unless we make some changes to what we're doing, we're gonna keep being the way we are. And what, the way we are with no bus ridership and, and car-centric, in major corridors is the problem with greenhouse gas emissions. It's the biggest problem with equity. It's all the things that you're saying you want to try to solve, and yet we're like not pushing for those things. Like, it just blows my I don't understand it. Okay, let me respond to that because um, I don't want to be lectured from by that. I'm not this is being green. Um, the reason why we don't have low ridership is because of a myriad of reasons. It's, it's very simplistic to say, we just need to get more people on the bus. Um, but the, but that, that has, uh, it's, a complex, uh, it's a complex dilemma because the way you get more people on the bus is the bus needs to go where people wanna go. The bus doesn't do that right now. The bus is funded by UCSC students and by Cabrillo College. Um, if we didn't have UCSC, the Metro would be bankrupt. So, um, so it's far more complex than that. And so we need, if we want more people to get on the bus, the bus system needs to go where we go places where people need to go. Um, so it's, it's not, it's just a very simplistic way to frame that. And there's funding issues that go along with that. And then also, I think that we also have to recognize we are a suburban community. This is not San Francisco. I grew up in San Francisco. I was taking the bus at eight years old. Um, so in San Francisco, you can get away with not having a car. 
You can't do that here very easily. People do, but it's very, very difficult. Um, I did that for a while when I had a, a young child, um, but I had to create my whole world had to be walking distance. And that's just not viable for people who live in other places in the county where the bus doesn't go because there's not enough ridership. Um, the Metro right now is cutting um, um, bus routes because they don't have enough ridership because we are a semi-rural suburban area. And it's very, very difficult to sustain a bus system uh, when you have a population base like Santa Cruz County does. So maybe in 10 or 20 years when, you know, all of this housing that we're planning for gets built and our population increases by 100,000 and the university grows to another 10,000 and Cabrillo grows, um, maybe the metro system will be subsidized to the extent that they can improve the bus system where there will be ridership um, that people will, it will be convenient for them to take the bus. But right now, um, you know, I agree with Commissioner Violanti that we're just not there yet, um, but, but we're getting there. Um, and, but right now, people still use their cars. Hmm. And when you use your car, you need to have places to park. And from my perspective, I don't see the car as the enemy. From my perspective, the fuel that is inside the car is the enemy. And so I kind of reject this whole notion of lecturing folks about cars and rather it's not about the car so much is about how the car is powered. So that's Perfect. my thought. That's, that's great. I, I appreciate that feedback. Um, you know, we can fundamentally disagree on how uh, communities should be built and that's fine. And in my opinion, they should be traffic list nodes of, of housing and mixed use commercial spaces. And that's the best way to solve greenhouse gas emissions and equity and all the other things, like I said. However, you know, we're not gonna come to that conclusion here together. So I don't have any further comments on this section. Does so Kimberly Basendee wanna lay, no. lay in or did she get kicked off the island? I know she's- No, <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Me, uh, we have a motion and a second, correct? Yes, we do. I'm ready to vote if uh, we want to. I, I am ready as well. Great, let's do that. Um, Ms. Drake, can we please have a roll call vote on this? Yes. And just as a quick reminder, this is Title 18 and General Plan Appendices, so that'll cross those off the list. Yes. Okay. All right, Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Dan. Yes. Commissioner Violante. Yes. Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. And Chair Gordon. No. Okay, thank you. And on to the next one. We've got about an hour until we have to be done done. So let's see where we at. The map amendments and then have any other and or missed and or bulk stuff that we need to sign off on, like general reduction. Um, Commissioner Dan and Violante, you've been leading the charge. Do you have anything for map amendments? I do not have anything further to share. Oh, okay. All right. So we... And then I'll open up to any other commissioners, Lazenby or, or Shepard. Do you have any other adjustments that you'd like to see? And if not, we can probably just bulk vote to accept the remaining chapters that we haven't discussed, the CEQA and all of the rest. Okay. Um, I had one question on the, um, the map amendments. <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, that was on the list of proposed map amendments. The third one down, thirty fifty one Portola Drive, and we heard from Oliver Carter this morning, who owns the surf shop. How does this change affect him? Is it the residential unit, or am I missing something? So if I may, the 
the change um, is is on the general plan and zoning designation. Okay. Um, it does not require redevelopment of the site. It just suggests that in the future, when the site is ready to redevelop, it could develop at the new RF um, zoning density. Um, and the commission will remember, I'm sure, that we recently added a provision for commercial to be allowed in the residential flex zoning. Um, so any of these properties could have some commercial um, not that they don't have to, but they could have some commercial included. Um, and uh, so it would be up to each property owner when they are ready to sell or redevelop their property. They would just need to be able to do it consistent with the new zoning um, district and its regulations. Um, there's, there's nothing that would uh, force this property or um, any other property to redevelop before they are ready. I will say that this particular property owner has been supportive of these uh, changes. We have been in contact with him long ago when we started uh, working on it, and he's checked in um, occasionally on it as well. So I'll just add that to the record. Okay. Was he, what was his issue then? Maybe he's not the property owner? Right, he's the store owner. He's a tenant. Oh, I misunderstood that. Right, as, a, as opposed to the property owner. What you're saying is, is the property owner wanted to redevelop this property and he chose to keep this tenant, it would be permitted? Sure. That, because now good. residential flex has that commercial component allowed. Okay. Well, too bad he's not probably not listening anymore. I hardly <laughs> think he is, but that's good to hear. But if he wanted to buy the property, it would probably have gone up considerably, right? You think? We have no indication on whether he's interested in buying the property. Oh, I know that. That is in the plan. I, I don't know. I think he was more afraid of getting kicked out. So it could be redeveloped. Yeah. Were there other questions on that, Commissioner Lee? Uh, no, I, I was wondering about at the SoCal Cemetery, though, and the Jewish Community Center, they're all together? Mm, yes, they're in neighboring parcels. Okay. And that's just a correction to bring all of the uh, general plan and zoning together into a public facilities designation. Okay. I, I had one more question. Commissioner Shepard. Go ahead. I want to I want to confirm something we talked about last time. Uh, it is at the planning director's purview that any project that he thinks needs to come at a higher level of review or public review, that is always his uh, discretion, correct? And many of these kinds of projects that we have changed the level of review on. I believe we're discussing the map amendments, but yes, there's a provision of the code that allows the planning director to increase the level of review for any particular project that they view may be um, controversial in the community. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. Do we need a motion to adopt the proposed um, map amendments, Chair Gordon? I'm sorry, Commissioner Villant. Can you say that again? My of course. I apologize. Do we need a motion to adopt the proposed map amendments? Uh, yes. And I was just thinking if we we're done with questions and um, would we want to just incorporate the remainder sure, okay. into one motion? And then, Ms. Hansen, we want to make sure we include everything, the CEQA adoption and all the rest. So do we need to formulate this in a specific way? You know, I, I've been kind of studying that along the way, and perhaps I can read this out. Um, I think it's fairly simple. We're just going to refer to the previous amendments that the 
um, planning commission is made. So adopt the whole thing, inclusive of the previous amendments. Um, so it would read as such. And this is basically following the um, recommended motion that was in the 824 staff report. Um, so the planning commission would be recommending uh, that the board of supervisors a certify the California Environmental Quality Act environmental impact report for the sustainability update based on the CEQA findings of fact and statement of overriding considerations attached to the resolution. B, adopt the proposed amendments as previously modified by the Planning Commission, um, including amendments to the general plan and LCP, the um, Santa Cruz County code, the general plan land use designation maps and zoning maps, as well as the mitigation monitoring and reporting plan attached to the resolution. C, adopt the new county of uh, Santa Cruz design guidelines and D, direct staff to submit amendments to the LCP and general plan and coastal implementing code amendments to the California Coastal Commission for certification. So that would uh, include the reference back to all the motions that the uh, commission has made in the past couple of meetings. Um, was that a motion? Ms. So uh, somebody could say so moved if they wanted to. Ms. Hansen, do you have it in a way you can share it at the screen so everyone can just see it or do you have it written? Uh, okay. I mean, I'm happy to say so, but I think it'd be helpful. Go ahead and I'll second. Form. And I just, I just want to make sure that. Yeah, hang on one second and let me oh. see. There. Bear with me here. I didn't have it up on the screen. Hang on. Ms. Lazenby, feel free to make the motion. I was just wanting to make sure it was up so we could see it. Okay. Uh, if you can see that, so it begins here, adopt the attached resolution recommending that the Board of Supervisors, and then here is the language. Um, the difference is right here, adopt the proposed amendments as um, amended by the Planning Commission, including the amendments of, so it would, that would be inclusive of all the motions you've made. Can I ask a clarifying question before we <clears throat> before a motion is made to make it a little easier? I, you know, didn't vote for all the things, and so I just want to make sure that I can vote yes to this without like negating other things that I voted on. So I, you know, I'm not sure if there's something to to adjust for that. Um, yes, you could do that, and we'll we'll note the motions in the. Um, staff report to the Board of Supervisor. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments um, or someone that would like to make a motion and close this out? Well, I thought that uh, Commissioner Violante did make the motion. Um, technically, not yet. No, I didn't, and I was letting you do it, Ms. Lazenby, because I felt like we kind of monopolized the meeting, so. Oh, you, you were going okay. To, I was going to let you close us out here. Okay, so moved, <laughs> as was read. And I will second it. Wonderful. We have a motion and a second, and any discussion before we make our final vote on the sustainability plan update? Okay, let's do that then, uh, Ms. Drake. Can we please have a roll call vote on this item? Yes. All right. Commissioner Dan? Yes. 
Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. All right. Motion passes. That it? <laughs> so that's it for that item. So now that this is concluded, I just, I've said this before, but I would like to really recognize Stephanie, you in particular, and all of your staff, Daisy, Annie, Anais, um, everybody. <laughs> um, it's just been phenomenal, um, both putting this document together, but then also the study sessions, the community outreach, um, and then of course the work that we've been doing, you know, we've had complicated in the weeds questions and you guys have gotten back to, to me, I can speak personally um, really quickly with um, really clear, excellent explanations. And I just really wanna appreciate um, the work that you've put into all of this and then also, um, the stuff that we're adding, I understand that our work is now concluded, but your work is not, and that you you and the rest of your staff have, are going to be continuing with this project. And so I want to make sure to acknowledge that that we know that and um, appreciate that and all the effort you're going to be putting forth from here on in. So thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'd like to echo that. And I'd also like to appreciate the CTV staff for hanging in there with us and all the planning staff who've done a marvelous job. Thank you. Of course, and no, I'm a second that, third that. <laughs> um, I just want, like, specifically want to point out how amazed I am that the, the whole staff, anyone we ask, it's like immediate rapid fire answers. You guys know this stuff so well, and you've done such a good job interpreting it for us and getting us through this and explaining. And, and it's, I was just really impressed and amazed at how, how easy that part has been to, uh, to get through. And so thank you. I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this, sincerely, for everyone involved. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, I'll just say it's a group effort and we have an amazing team and uh, thank you for recognizing them. Okay. Feels weird to say that that one's done, but I think. Um, <laughs> I did want to remind, remind the commission that I believe you wanted a quick review of the next, the timeline for the. Yes, the thank you, oh. Andy. Yes, yes it's thanks. actually not done. It's going off to the board now, so. Right. Yeah. Done for us, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, we are intending to go to the board on November 15th um, with a first um, uh, reading and um, we are anticipating that we will uh, have more than one first reading if they have changes. They have two other meetings. Um, I'm hesitating a little to like, kind of define that, you know, they will hear it on December 6th and December 13th. It'll be a little bit up to them on how they want to do it. Um, but the first, or totally up to them, uh, the first meeting would be on November 5th, uh, 15th. And um, while I'm still speaking, I wanted to say thank you to commissioners, uh, Dan and Violante for all the very detailed work. Cause you're right, we have more to do, but um, when you're so specific about it, it really helps us with moving it forward and not having to figure out the best way to do things. Um, I will say we'll we'll look out for some pitfalls if there's a problem with state law or um, uh, or an inconsistency that we find as we're trying to um, rectify ordinances. We'll we'll uh, note note those for for the board. But otherwise, thank you so much, and thank you to the whole commission for for your support and staying and meetings and um, and really sticking with it. Thank you. Yay. So we'll, we'll, we'll be back in a week, right? <laughs> yeah, well, let's, uh, we have the report on upcoming meetings to get through still. 
So um, are we done with the sustainability plan? Any final comments from anyone? Anything we missed? Okay, great. Um, then let's do, let's go to planning. Uh, we'll close that item and move on to the next scheduled agenda item, which is planning director's report. Do we have anything today? Um, I, I'm not seeing the, the CDI director with us at the moment. I don't know if Stephanie, you wanted to provide a report. Um, just um, I'll report on one thing and no, Matt had to move on to, to other things. Um, I just wanted to, we're, we're going to do a little outreach to board members on this, but I wanted to let the commissioners know that the board directed our co-compliance staff to, um, to start to do code enforcement on uh, vacation rental um, property owners who are um, advertising and renting out vacation rentals without benefit of permits. And um, so as directed by the board, that effort started late last week. We've had a lot of uh, interest as one can imagine and those coming forth and saying, oh, wait, oh, I didn't know, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so bear with us while we um, work to address the follow-up on that. I'll be sending an, uh, an email out to the staff of the board members later um, this evening to, to clarify some resources and, and how to um, address uh, any inquiries. Um, we realize for some people there may be some pain coming in the future as their rentals may um, run up against our maximums in the designated areas, uh, but we are uh, going to work diligently to to help those who are acting in good faith to get their permits and um, and we'll starting up kind of a whole new program. So I just wanted to let the commission know uh, about that. Otherwise, I think that's all I have today. So, uh, Commissioner Shepard, read. Uh, um, are we meeting next week? Oh, that's what we're on right now. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate that. Good luck with that. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so item nine then, report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. What do we have? Uh, yes, you're meeting next week. Um, and we just mailed out the Planning Commission packets today. Um, and there are three items on the agenda, a report back on the Olive Springs Quarry, a report back on the 375 Old Mount Appeal, and uh, the Seacliff Hotel project. Um, so shouldn't hopefully be as long of a meeting as it was today. Um, and then uh, moving forward, I think we only have one item so far, sort of potential item for October 12th, which is the, the water presentation. Um, so that's a, that's a tentative. And I think that's the only thing I have on the horizon at the moment for Planning Commission. Could I just ask you, Jocelyn, then did um, the County Attorney's Office approve your findings for the Old Mount? Denial? Are we just to approve them, or what? What's going on? Um, I think we should probably avoid discussion yeah, of that ahead. item. So it. Um, you'll... What is that item? Is that was that an the item heard in July where mm -hmm. I was absent? Oh, okay, I'll yeah. talk to my alternate about being there again. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> Are we, can I ask, are we hearing the appeal or are we hearing the findings? Um, I will, um, I will send out a, a quick um, email to the planning commissioners this evening with an update. Okay. And it'll be on the agenda, which is going to be posted tomorrow and the staff reports will be posted tomorrow on our planning department page. And the water hearing on the 12th, the topic is what? It's a presentation um, by our um, environmental health 
staff um, downstairs, and I think Matt Machado, the CDI director, is going to participate in that in addition to, I think, some representatives from the water districts. And um, it's just a, a presentation on this, you know, the state of things, um, as far as I understand it, as far as water goes. Yeah. So I don't have I don't have the reservation form, so I don't have really detailed information about that presentation yet. Uh, we're trying to put it on an agenda on an agenda that has other at least one other item, um, so that we can, you know stock the items and so we're just waiting to see if we have any other agenda items to put with it and um, I'll check in with Matt and see if he wants to move forward anyways or if we should move it to the next meeting. Is, is there any is that a study session or is it a public hearing or what is it? It's a it's a presentation just a presentation for the Planning Commission to receive information as far as I understand it. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, do we have an update or a county council's report today? Well, I'm sorry to have not said what I meant. Just one more thing. So if it's a presentation, is it open to the public? That's what I really wanted to know. Because if he's doing a presentation on water, then a lot of people would probably like to attend. Is it going to be noticed? Um. It, uh, that's a good question. If, if, I mean, we always post the agenda in the newspaper. Um, it won't be a mailed noticing because it's countywide. Um, so that re usually um, requires a, uh, a newspaper posting. So um, I will check and see what kind of outreach will be included with that presentation. I, I agree, Renee, I'm sure there will be quite a bit of interest from the public and and hearing that presentation. So um, thanks for that question. I'll check in with um, with the director and see what he'd like to do there. That's why I was asking probing questions because if it's going to, to get an idea of what, what the subject is, so that, because there's a lot of people interested in water and I, I you know, just say, well, we're going to have a presentation. I'd like to be able to ask a you know, there's a lot of people who'd like to know about it if it's going to be some kind of grand overview of something or another involving water. It's just, if you could probably let us know next week, that would be useful, even if it's not going to happen on the 12th. Just, you know, what are the topics he's going to be talking about? Is it open to the public, et cetera? Okay. Okay. And I have nothing to report. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. With that, then I think we've gone through all of our agenda items and um, we can close out today's planning commission hearing. And yeah, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. 435 okay. early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say to the chair that you're doing a great job too. And I want to congratulate you on getting through all this and staying calm on the whole. Oh no, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> Get passionate. I mean, being chair, being chair is, is difficult when everyone feels strongly about things, and I think you did a great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you, you all make it easy on me. So um, thank you.